Mark Winterbottom and Stephen Richards, car number six. Everything has to be in place by now. One man who is Craig Lowndes in the seat at Triple Eight. He'll defend his title from six on the grid. Now it's time to pause and reflect. So let's take a look at the Fuso start grid for the super cheap auto Bathurst 1000. The front row looks like this. Car number six and car number two. Richards will start. Mark Scaife will start the HRT Commodore. The second row of the grid, Rick Kelly and Garth Tander at Stephen Johnson and Will Davison. Lee Holdsworth and Dean Cando from Gary Rogers Motorsport. And there is Lowndes and Win Cup. That is where they won it from last year. Greg Murphy and Jason Richards and James Courtney and David Bernard. And making up the top 10, we've got Radisic and Baird and Ingle and Yulden. Looking further afield, and it's Greg Ritter, Cam McLean in the second Gary Rogers Motorsport entry from 11. Jason Bright, Adam Macro in the Fujitsu Ford. 13 and 14, Andrew Jones, Simon Wills, Richard Lyons, Alan Simonson. And we'll keep an eye out as we move towards the rear of the Fuso Trucks grid, because I'm expecting some of the runners towards the rear to even peel off at the end of this warm-up lap and come in and grab some extra fuel and top right back up to 120 litres. We started the week with 31 cars. We lost car number 14. Damien White and Christian Murchison after a big accident for Damien. So we're down to 30 cars. Owen Kelly and Matt Halliday, John Bow, Jonathan Webb, positions 21 and 22. 23 and 24, Perkins and Price and Paul Morris and Steve Ellery. Team Siramay Wines entry, there's the other one. In position 25, we've got Team Kiwi Racing. In 26, we find Grant Denyer and Michael Caruso in position 27 and Dumbrell and Wheel in 28th, and here is the final row of the grid. Glenn Seaton and Nathan Pretty and Steve Owen and Tony Dalberto. That is the makeup of the grid for 2007. The depth of the windscreen strips is going to be a little issue here later in the day if it's a day bathed in sunshine because traditionally the last half an hour, 45 minutes of the race, you're in glaring sunshine coming up this pit straight and also heading up to the cutting because the race is starting 30 minutes later this year, they'll spend another 30 minutes in that very difficult light at the back end of the day. So you'll fully expect to see people putting extra tape across the screen to try and cope with that. The 45th year celebrations taking place throughout the course of the morning. So the warm up lap, the final trundle around Mount Panorama before grid up time. And then we're off. And you see the bright green light illuminated behind the windshield of the cars. That's because the driver that's been nominated as the co-driver in the car is present in the driver's seat at that time. And it doesn't matter which way you nominate them, but both drivers have got to have one designation or the other for the purposes of timing and scoring. So if you see a couple of cars out here with the green light on and you're scratching your head thinking, what's all that about? It's because the fellow that's been nominated as the co-driver is at the helm. Jason Bargwana warming up the tyres in the WOW entry. Look, look at the shutter in it as the tyres vibrate across the road, so does the camera. So he's really working those tyres to try and get temperature into the tyre case and the tread face. Car number 50. That's the Jack Daniels car of uh, Shane Price behind the wheel. We'll also have cameras on board for Cam McConville and co. In fact, we've got 50 onboard cameras. <laughs> it's only just enough. <laughs> it's an amazing number of cameras, isn't it? Two fly cams, helicopters buzzing all around us. Oh, no, already. Cameron McConville, can you believe it? We have not even started the race. And this car is parked at the exit of turn two. Smoke in the cabin. Yeah, look, stay there, mate, and uh, I'll find out what the procedures from here. Yeah. This may well delay the start, so Cam McConville in the car. Difficult morning for Super Cheap. Paul Wheel down in the bunker. There was an engine change for his car together with Paul Dumbrell, and now this thing's expired without even seeing a racing lap at turn two. 
and see whether this tells us more about what's happened here. He's just, just had a major fail, hasn't it? Remember, we reported when he was on the grid that it uh, was making a, a bad sound and it had a misfire. Well, it only got another couple of hundred metres up the road from the start. It's packed it in. Looks like I'm getting out, mate. 10 4, mate. Sorry about that. Break it. It's almost impossible to imagine the heartbreak of Cam McConville. These guys are professional drivers. They've been around the laps a few times. They know what can come their way, but no matter what, the build-up to a Bathurst is so exhausting. It's so big, it does mean absolutely everything. You take it away before the race even starts, and you're taking a big chunk out of the emotion that is running through Cam McConville. Well, the question is now whether or not this delays the start and how easy it's going to be to grab that motor car. And uh, Cam tried to do the right thing and take it well off the race line and uh, tuck it up behind the wall. But I think one of the tilt tray trucks was actually in that gap there because they used that to intervene if required. So he can't really roll the car back. Guys, I'm with Keys Wheel. Keys, we've had some engine issues right across the weekend and various changes. It dropped on the seven, the team are telling you. Yeah, no, it dropped on seven just on the outlap and uh, we we're concerned about it. So uh, we thought we might be able to just do the uh, outlap and then come in. So you know, once you're out in the grid, you can't do much out there. So unfortunately, um, it's game over for uh, number 50. It's hard luck weekend. I mean, we've only not even got started. Can you just while we're talking about the engines dropping onto seven cylinders and misfires, it's it's been a bit of a feature uh, right across the, the last little while. Yeah, uh, mainly just this weekend, really. At, uh, there's some new products that we put in there and maybe they're not proven properly, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but I, I guess once we do a, an autopsy we'll, we'll find out the correct answer. So it's a bit early to tell and I don't want to make any brave statements now, so I, let's uh, let's hope, give the other boys in the other car a bit of good luck and let's see how they go. Thanks, Keith. Thank you. Cheers. So we're down to 29. 29 cars and here we go as expected a couple of these guys starting from pit lane grant daniel will start in there that you see the other super cheap auto car pulling off car 20. they're going to grab some extra fuel in those cars bring them right back up to 120 litres and then start from the lane so that was 20 and 10 was it just two of them two that we saw okay mate they're still forming up Still up. I think we're going to get a start here despite car number 50 being off to the side of the road. The question there is, is there oil on the edge of the exit of turn two? They are going to have to be very careful. The revs are building for the Super Cheap Auto Bathurst 1000. The mountain is calling again. It's been clean for the front runners. Around Hell Corner, here they all come. And up Mountain Straight, and the other guys out of pit lane come and join them. And it appears as though we got a problem for one of the cars halfway up Mountain Straight, pulling back and back and back. This is where the oil is on the exit of turn two. Steve Owen also started from pit lane. Cam McConville's car's off to the outside. That's so awkwardly parked there. I can't believe the race was started with that car there, frankly. They've done it. They've got past it once. Now through the cutting. An extraordinary amount of drama before the wheels even started turning in anger. No time to take a breath. Now the top of the mountain. Safety car is going to be deployed. So I think what race directors determined to do was get the race started and then bring the race under control. And now they'll grab that car. And I was holding my breath looking at it because I've seen plenty of people step to the wrong side of that ripple strip, especially given there's oil there. So fortunately, we got through the opening lap and this is a deliberate ploy to now bring the field under control and uh, get that car out of the way. 
bad start for Mark Scaife. It looked like I think he had a second punch in the clutch to get the thing away. But Stephen Richards looked good on cold tyres immediately. Scaife saved it. He pulled it together, though. But realistically, what did they get? Three quarters of a lap done before the safety car flags and the boards were displayed. No doubt, Neil, that they're going to have to remove that car before they get it underway. The Zinger replay will show you. Look at all the mess going on at the middle pack. But out in front, Stephen Richards just had a beautiful start and a good save by Scaife. Massive disappointment there for Cameron Conval. Also, his rookie teammate, David Reynolds. He won't get a start, just as Shane Price, the rookie last year, was deprived of a start. At least Shane Price this year gets a run. He starts the Jack Daniels Racing number seven Commodore. David Reynolds, Australian Formula Ford champion. Race this morning in Carrera Cup raced over the course of the weekend here at Mount Panorama. Cars behind the safety car now. So the first safety car of the day plays into the hands of those teams trying to conserve fuel. We saw three cars come to pit lane to top up fuel before the race got underway. That was the number 55 Steve Owen Commodore. The second of the super cheap auto Commodores, number 20 of the two Pauls, Paul Wheel and uh, his teammate, Paul Dumbrell. And the third car, just to top up on fuel, was number 10, WPS racing car of Grant Denyer and Michael Caruso. Fuel so critical at Bathurst. Cars trying to make the race on just four stops. They want to divide the race up into five segments. As we see cars heading up the mountain there, they're on their second lap. Only one racing lap, in fact, less than one racing lap under green before the safety car was called to retrieve the number 50 car. First car out of the race, Cameron McConville, David Reynolds. Over 60,000 people expected here to Mount Panorama today. Bathurst, the township of Bathurst, about 30,000 people. Swells to over 60,000 on race weekend. A total crowd in the vicinity of about 200,000 for the four-day meeting, a real festival. Top of the mountain there. A place where campers traditionally go. Uh, they're already seeing plenty of drama. lap and it's all because of car number 50 not being able to be removed from turn two. Cam McConville did absolutely everything he could. He knew it was all over. Check out this on board with Craig Lowndes how close he gets to that parked car. That is not only crazy it's dangerous. A bit surprised but uh, to reduce the risk the race directors then deployed the safety car and uh, brought the field under control so they can safely have people move onto the circuit. But uh, you wouldn't want much of a mistake on the exit of the turn two curbing to find yourself in the back of that car. We've seen that happen before. But it was all good news for Stephen Richards off the start. Good jump away. Mark Scaife was just a little slower off the line. And when you see those lights go out on the safety car, we'll be ready to race again. Scaife held his position. Craig Lowndes was actually uh, actually managed to find two spots before the safety car got called. So he moved up from sixth to fourth. Stephen Johnson drops back to fifth. James Courtney, who started eighth, is sixth. So a little bit of chopping and changing going on in the top ten. Yeah, mate, no problem. Loud clear. Jason Bright also made good ground. 
Yeah, Neil, looks like the, uh, as, as always, the safety car is going to change everyone's sort of strategy a little bit up and down pit lane. It's just interesting to note uh, every three laps behind the safety car, it actually adjusts each team's refuelling window by a lap. So they actually gain one lap for every three travel behind it. There's the telltale signs of the super cheap auto car. And you just see that little gap there where the truck is parked. That's where Camber Comple parked the car in the hope that uh, he got it out of the way in time and enough. In the end, they all got through there cleanly. 29 cars left. WPS Chrysler safety car has control. And up the front straight they go. Another lap safety car conditions ahead of us. Courtney, Lee Holdsworth, Paul Radisich, Russell Ingle, there's Greg Murphy and as Neil mentioned right behind Murph is Jason Bright in 11th position so he pushed up one. Alan Simonson there, the team Vodafone car in double eight. Now Pentax Cam can zero in to pit lane. Uh, these guys taking on some additional fuel. Is that uh, from the beginning of the race? Because those three cars came in at the beginning. Uh, they've actually come back in again, so that's yeah. interesting because the, what confused me there was 55, 20 and 10 came in to grab fuel at the beginning and they've yeah, done it again, so I wasn't 100% sure whether that was... Uh, okay, I was seeing double well, whether they've done it again, but they have. OK, that'll be the last time we need to do that, thanks. Now, Team Kiwi actually was the other car there, zero, two, one. So just grabbing a uh, whisper of fuel to help change their scenario. Big splash. They uh, take out the hoses from car number 20. And you know, these drivers, we try to keep everything in check. Such a big build up to the morning. As I mentioned, there was a lot of formalities to get through today. They finally get in the car. Something they've been thinking about for 12 months. They get fired off the start line and hauled back straight away. Stegbar Mountain Cam is a wonderful shot. You'll see it throughout the course of the race. Right across the dipper. We duck and weave our way through the trees. Now to Forest Elbow. likes to call it koala cam but then again you've had experience sitting in trees up here watching this race so you probably know that exactly. so the lights are off that's a good sign on the WPS safety car weaving their way through it will peel off we will have a race start the first lap in particular after safety car conditions is often the most dangerous the most wild uh, 100k through turn 21 and hold that speed 80k and then hold that speed until pit. Message from uh, FPR to Stephen Richards because the safety car will roll out of the throttle now, bunch them up at 80 kilometres an hour and then peel off. As you quite rightly point out, Matty, this is where everybody's got to be extra vigilant for the next lap or so with cool tyres and brakes. There she goes. Chrysler's out. Ford versus Holden back on. And just like you at home, the drivers and us are thinking, let's just go racing. Rick Kelly hovers on the rear of Mark Scape. Single file, they go into turn one. Flaring around they come. There's Mark Warner. Covering positions midfield. Lions and Simonson versus McLean and Ritter's car. Greg Ritter has control of 34. He gets the spot over Alan Simonson. Up to turn two, the Triple Eight car looked a bit taily there. Looking out the front of Mark Scaifes. Up to Stephen Richards. Just 
such amazing speed. Incredible control. A fascinating part of the circuit, and now it all starts to fall away. Down through the S's. Into the dipper. Look at the front of the car lift. Now to Forest Elbow. And the shoot that is onto Conrod straight. We know what's at the end of that. The chase. Up to 300 kilometres an hour. And everybody getting a feel for each other at the moment to see what sort of pace is in each other's cars as they weigh up moves or otherwise. Do they sit and wait? Do they have a nudge? And here's a pass down the inside, and I think that would have been Murphy. He got Ross. Ingle. He got Russell Ingle for that spot, and Russell wants it back. Has a look on the outside. Slots back in on the inside. The final turn. We'll get a clear indication now of one completed full lap at the time. That was a 2.12 from Stephen Richards. The order, Richards, Scaife, Rick Kelly, Craig Lowndes, Stephen Johnson, James Courtney, Lee Holdsworth, Paul Radisic, Greg Murphy, Russell Ingle. That's your top 10. Good move there for Murphy and Scaife. Reduced that margin to Stephen Richards on the approach to turn two. On board now with Mark on the left-hand side of the road right here is where Cameron Conville's car was. Briefly into fourth gear up to the cutting. Second gear here. Short shift into third which means you don't use all of the 7,500 available revs. strong out of the cutting and through Reed Park with Philippe. Scaife just eased away slightly from Rick in the last half lap and locked the brakes a little on the run to the dipper there in the right hander on the approach. See on the ticker on the bottom of your screen, the green dot indicates the driver of the car. So talking about tyre pressures coming up to the normalised temperature and pressure. So looking for about 30, 31 pounds in the old language all round. You've got to be a little careful when they're softer that you don't ask too much of the tyres or car generally. Or you'll lock a brake down here or have a moment mid-corner when you put the big lateral load on the car in the middle of the corner. That's the side force on the car. It's interesting, Neil, because uh, Stephen Richards, the uh, front section, the first sector, and the third sector. Good job, mate. Have a breathe. Get into a rhythm. Have a think about your bars and your bars. Really has Scaife's measure, but through the cutting, up towards the uh, top of the mountain, Scaife, that's where he pulled him back. Pentax Ham shoots him up mountain straight. Alan Simonson made a move in car 88 there as well. We saw as they came out of the chase area, it was starting to look racy on Greg Ritter, and he did get him. There he is in behind Jason Bright at the moment. Had a good tangle with Cam McLean. Now the honours are even. side in almost every single part of this circuit. One minute, correction, two minute 10.2 for Stephen Richards on that lap. Three quarters of a second margin at the end of it. Ingle's done the fastest split now to the end of the first sector as everybody begins to find their feet. Here's Simonson again in 88. Now starting to have a look on Bright. They probably didn't qualify where they may well have ended up had it not been for the little drama up against the wall at the cutting for car 88. It's a good car, quick. That first sector split that I make reference to is coming out of the cutting. The second one is just here. And the fastest man to the second split this time, Mark Scaife on a 127.96.
This is with Rick Kelly, Garth Kander watches on. Third place at the moment, not a bad start. They roll out of the throttle just before they get to the apex in the middle of the corner. Much heavier. The burning fuel down at the rate, let's call it roughly 3.6, 3.7 litres per lap at the moment. A little under three kilos. So the cars start to feel different pretty quickly as you take weight out as we look at Jamie Wincup. Courtney now the fastest to the end of the first sector, 52.4 for him. He's sixth behind Stephen Johnson and in front of Lee Holdsworth. I'll tell you what, Neil, Mark Scaife punched out the fastest first sector time and then Courtney a few spots back down the road. Beat the clock. Gel Webb Motorsport entry is in position six. That's Stephen Johnson in car 17 in front of him. By now, the drivers are beginning to feel a trend in their car. What's the balance like? Does it have understeer? That is, front tyres are not quite taking you where you're steering, where you want to be in the loaded part of the corner. Or conversely, does it have oversteer? Is the back sliding a bit too much? Puff of smoke there. Was it on a gear change for car 17? Not 100% sure. We'll keep an eye out on that just in front of James Courtney. Drivers, the vigilant drivers will be keeping an eye out on their car performance, making little corrections to the anti-roll bars inside, and also feeding back information to the engineering group about whether they repressure the incoming tyre set, but that's a long way off at this stage. A 209.67, that one for Stephen Richards, but a 209.63, fastest lap of the race for Mark Scaife. He made up a tenth of a second on the leader. Paul Radisich going to make some anti-roll bar adjustments on his car in eighth at the moment. Got too much understeer. Number turn two. Got him. And that's Radisich. So a little battle going on here between the Kiwis, Radisich and Murphy. Eight and nine, Ingalls tucked in behind, then Bright, Simonson, Ritter, Wills, Marshall, Barguana, Noski, Davison, that is Alex, Paul Morris and Owen Kelly, the 20. And Paul just making some anti-roll bar adjustments and also just having a little trim on the brake bias in car number 16 at the moment, just to maintain peak brake efficiency. Radisic started ninth on the grid. He's got it up to eight. Greg Murphy started seventh. He slotted back to ninth. Big mistake there for Radisich. He really locked up badly on the right-hander and the approach to the dipper. And Murphy's all over him at the moment. Saw the incentive. Has a look down the inside at Forest Elbow, but no space there. Hopefully for Radisich, no marks on those tyres. Two Kiwis trading punches in the early stages of this race. Paul Radisic admitted he'd be nervous, very nervous, coming down to this section of the track after what happened in 06. It put him out of play for a long, long time. His season has been hampered again. And here he finds himself in a super fast car battle with an old sparring partner. 
Shane Van Gisberg at car 021 Team Kiwi Race Controls keeping an eye. They've got the smoke emanating from the left rear of that car at the moment. And in fact, it's worse than that. I think he might have a flat tyre. He does, yep. Something was something weird going on. They're gonna, oh, it's broken the Watts link. It's a broken a bolt and shortly we'll try and bring up the Harrop computer aided design CAD drawings and we can show you exactly what's happened here and why the rear end of the car has come adrift. He must have touched the wall somewhere and if he's done that and just given it a rub then uh, it's very easy to fracture that bolt and they'll put it in the garage where more people on the inside of the garage are able to work on the car and get that problem sorted. Look what it's done to the rear left. Just chopped it up, chopped it up, spat it out. So let's have a look underneath the car electronically. Clayton Stearman, the engineering manager for Harrops, is with me in the commentary box. And we'll go, this is the rear end of the car and the diff housing you can see. If we go to the rear of that, we see that bracket there. And that's the Watts link bracket. And then in the middle of it, that grey device is the bell crank. And through the centre of that is the bolt that fixes and locates the Watts link. And when it's cracked, obviously the whole rear end drops away from the bodywork of the car. So it's had side impact. He's brushed up against the wall somewhere. Can we see the bolt if possible, Clay? And we'll show you exactly this thing. And it runs through the centre there. And there she be. And it shears off. Thank you very much. And that's the thing that's done the damage. So they'll replace that. Hopefully the bracket itself is not bent. And that'll mean that it's a relatively simple thing to sort out and get him back underway. Amazing, isn't it? What about the damage that it's created? What about the impact here on the top of the mountain? So whack. That's all it took. There you go. All it took to unsettle that car massively. Massive responsibility on Shane Van Gisbergen coming into this race only in his third V8 supercar event. And uh, it's, uh, he's the team leader now of Team Kiwi Racing. They switched over from Holden to Ford for the 2007 season. Uh, had some financial woes earlier in the year, switched uh, their alliance from one Ford team to another. So that was from uh, Ford Performance Racing to Stone Brothers Racing. And it was an opportunity for Stone Brothers Racing to give some racing miles to their prodigy, young New Zealander. Just a teenager, Shane Van Gisbergen, but unfortunately uh, in the opening laps on lap seven of the 2007 Super Cheap Auto Bathurst 1000. Uh, Shane has come a cropper at the top of the mountain, but we'll see that car back on the track in uh, the next, uh, probably within the hour, one would think, and uh, he'll be able to gain some experience, also give some time to John McIntyre, the reigning NZV8 champion. So two Kiwis there looking to gain experience and take Team Kiwi Racing to the next level. Meantime, up front, it's a battle of the big four coming into this event. It was a case most pundits suggesting that Stephen Richards' Ford Performance Racing, the Holden Racing Team of Mark Scaife there in second position, Toll HSV dealer team, Rick Kelly in third, and uh, also Craig Lowndes, the reigning champions for Triple Eight or Team Vodafone, as are also known. They're the big four teams, and they are they currently one, two, three, four in the race with our pole sitter, Stephen Richards, leading the field, a merry dance after 10 laps. While we were looking at the woes for Shane Van Gisbergen, Alan Simonson makes up one spot to 11th. He got around the Fujitsu-sponsored car of Jason Bright. So Alan Simonson, the day, the second of the Team Vodafone cars, now knocking on the door of the top 10. So the race order... Steve Richards, Mark Scaife, Rick Kelly, Craig Lowndes, Stephen Johnson in car 17 for Dick Johnson Racing. That's your top five. The James Courtney, Lee Holdsworth, Paul Radisic, Greg Murphy and Russell Ingall for Stone Brothers Racing rounds out your top ten. Then it's Simonson, the man we spoke about just a moment ago, up into 11 around Jason Bright. Then Greg Ritter, Simon Wills, 
Marcus Marshall in the first of the Jack Daniels Racing Commodores in 15th. Then it's Jason Barguana, Alex Davison, Paul Morris, Mark Noski, and Owen Kelly. That is your top 20. 11 laps now into the super cheap auto Bathurst 1000. Here is Stephen Richards. He leads the race from Mark Scaife, 0.8 of a second behind. Rick Kelly, Craig Lowndes, Stephen Johnson, James Courtney. Zinger replay at turn two. Contact, contact. Fabian Coulthard into the wall. And race controls just asked for officials to observe the back of that car to see how much dam damage there is to the bodywork. Little contact there with Glenn Seaton. Just tipped it up into the wall. That's the problem. Uh, when you've got a quick car and you're battling away through the back of the field, sometimes very awkward to not end up in those situations. Now they're bringing the car in for a look to see what's happening. Scaife's done a new fastest lap of the race. Meantime, a two minute 9.5 and just checked out the comparison to last year's times. And even though we're under safety car initially, Ironically for Mark Scaife because of the problem with the clutch last year, once they did go racing again, it was lots of mid to high 10. So they're probably still running a bit quicker at the moment. There's all that damage from the tyre bundles up at turn two. Okay, clear, go. Electronic pit lane speed limiters in the car, first gear, 40 kilometres an hour for safety. We didn't have that many years ago. The pit lane's a lot safer now as a result of it. Here's the gap, first to second. Last time through, it was 0.8 of a second. Kelly is, that is Rick, is 1.9 seconds off the lead of the race. Craig Lowndes is 2.5 seconds off the lead of the race. And Stevie Johnson is 3.1 seconds off the lead of the race. Top 10, covered by eight seconds. First, down to 10th. Another lap completed here for Stephen Richards. The start of this race for him has been exactly what he would have wanted. Shane, this mountain has been the best of them and it's got you in your first start. Yeah, no, it wasn't too good there. I was following Seaton and we had good speed and, you know, he just, he was really slow through there and I was trying to carry too much speed and got a bit loose coming out and had the wall there. The boys have attacked this car with some great vigour. You're going to get back out there, but you're going to be a long way behind. It's all about experience. Yeah, we'll get back out there and just carry on and do the best that we can and maybe try and get some, get further up the field. But uh, I'm a bit, bit gutted, but what can you do? Stephen Richards has now responded to Mark Scaife's fastest lap of the race with his own. A two minute 9.5571 in the margin, this time across the finish line was 0.98 of a second so he's just eased away slightly people are now starting to vigorously play with the anti-roll bar controls in their car to chase the balance Scaife staying in touch with the leader it's a little seesaw margin that one they have their own strengths and weaknesses in different parts of the racetrack Tim Edwards FPR team boss happy with the start from Stephen Richards yeah, very good. He's just settled into a nice rhythm. He's just 12 lap of the race and he's just set the fastest lap, so he's, he's quite comfortable in the car. He's just fine-tuned the brake balance a little bit. He's finding a bit of time in that. Noticed uh, the first couple of sectors, you had it all over Scaife. It was interesting, though, uh, he was getting you on the middle sector, which was the same one we dropped on the on the, uh, the shootout lap with Frosty. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit different. You know, Scaife's obviously got the advantage at the moment that he can... Uh, Richo's punching a hole through the air for him. Um, we'll see how, you know, later on in the race when we get into a bit of a tow, what sort of sector times we can do in those sectors. Things are looking good. Right? So far, it's a long way to go, mate. Thanks, no yeah, You'll hear that for quite a while, long way to go. But those four boxes down there pretty much tell the story that we're on the screen. One lap, it's Richo, the next it's Scaife. The next it's Richards, the next it's Scaife. So effectively, they're just doing a little bit of a song and dance routine, but not a lot has changed. 
It's a 0.9 of a second difference on the last lap. We'll see what it is this time around. He goes underneath the bridge, triggers the timing. It's now 0.6. And Scaife's time pretty handsome, 2 minute 9.35. They're running quite a bit quicker than this time last year. This pace is up a good three quarters of a second at the moment. So no one's blinking at this stage. They're all running. That's very quick with lots of fuel. Margin and Scaife looks in his mirror. Back to Rick is 1.7 seconds, and Rick is indeed 2.3 seconds away from the lead of the race. Lowndes is next, then Stephen Johnson, Courtney, Holdsworth, Radisich, Murphy 9th, Ingle 10, Bright 11, Simonson 12, also playing with the balance of his car and being urged to just smooth it up. And remember, it was only three weeks ago that Mark Scaife had his appendix removed, had to miss Sandown, first race he'd missed in over a decade. Well, Kevin McConville, nothing more heartbreaking than your race being over before it even starts here. Yeah, it's uh, hard, to, hard to believe, really. It uh, just had a misfire on the outlap to the grid, and uh, obviously we had to take off to, you know, if we were going to come into the pits, but it didn't make it. I think it's uh, dropped the valve or something mechanical in the engine. Tough on you, tough on the team. Yeah, it's very frustrating. The car was fantastic. I mean, our qualifying pace wasn't flash, but our race pace was very close to that, and I think we had a really strong car for the race today. I don't care next year. I hope so, mate. All right, mate. All the best. Cheers. All the effort, all the energy, all the investment that goes into the Super Cheap Auto 1000 to get out of that car before he even sees the starter is heart-wrenching for Cameron McConville. Here's a pretty good battle lining up. Craig Lowndes versus Rick Kelly. Keep an eye on the telemetry. The numbers tell the story down. The end of Conrad Strait, 297. Craig was really getting the benefit then of the draft being provided by the preceding car. It was so good and there wasn't much he could do about it on the other side of the chase. He rolled out of the throttle super early then. He was probably 50 metres away from the middle of the corner when he came out of the throttle. So that tells me that at the moment, whilst he wants to keep the pressure up, he's not in a super aggressive mode. He doesn't want to push too hard. 9.6 for Stephen Richards, 9.5 for Mark Scaife. Margin, 0.55 of a second. Two little groups, two there emerging now. Stephen Richards, Mark Scaife, and then the second group, Rick Kelly, Craig Lowndes, and almost another group then, Steve Johnson, James Courtney. Been a bit of a feature this year in the V8 Supercar Championship. They often pair up and race against each other. They do it in twos. See the gear changes up through the cutting. Fourth. Work for the driver. Campbell Little on the radio through Craig Lowndes, keeping him in check. Villainy. Blue skyline. Cars are already about 30 kilos lighter now on the fuel load. Rick didn't quite get the car tucked into the ideal apex in the dipper that time. Lowndes has got a good eye full of all that and he's just pinched the front left at a critical moment at Conrod, so he's getting hustled at the moment. Lowndes is really starting to apply pressure. That's when you've got too much brake pressure on, you're turning the steering wheel and because of the eight supercar is so heavy, 1,350 odd kilos, it rolls its weight to the right, the inside front locks, watch this. You'll have a look down the inside here. No, he came out of it again. He's just being patient at the moment, Lowndes. But it's enough to fill the mirrors of the number one car. That's a bit uncomfortable. These guys are three seconds behind our leader. And our leader, Stephen Richards, cannot shake Mark Scaife. In fact, Scaife is edging closer and closer. It was a faster lap for Scaife than it was for Richards, and Richards, the telltale signs into turn one. Scaife would have seen it, he knows. The lights are still on, on car number two. Up mountain straight, this is as close as he's been. Yeah, Mark definitely wants to have a crack at the moment, you can sense it. I'm surprised the two of them are running this hard, but now Richards has decided, well, will he argue or not? He makes some space side by side at two. 
Richards on the inside though as they get up to the cutting and it's on for the lead of this motor race very early in the piece. He had a big, big look and now Scape just monsters the back of Stephen Richards' car. That could have been our first lead change. It was so close. Looked as though Richards provided the room but then shut the door. Now he gathers it together. This is it. You're seeing a replay at turn two. Watch this. Richard goes wide, wide. Scape just doesn't have enough to zip it up the inside. Nice work from two professionals though. Stephen knew he was coming. He sighted him in the mirror. He just left him a bit of room. He knew that he'd be on the left-hand side of the road when they got back up to the cutting. Not much Mark can do there, but you can tell that he wants to press onward at the moment. Last lap for Mark was a couple of tenths faster than Stephen. This little stoush could draw third and fourth into them a bit as well. The readjust. The only time you can really have something of a break, a bit of a breather. Down Conrod straight through the chase. Early stages of the 2006 event with the lead Ford Performance Racing Falcon taking uh, an early lead, leading the first 15 laps last year before it ran into dramas. No dramas at this stage for the team with Stephen Richards behind the wheel, except for the pressure being applied by five-time race winner Mark Scaife. Scaife is uh, the most successful driver currently driving Bathurst 1000 and V8 Supercars, of course, uh, his former team partner Peter Brock, nine-time winner, another of his co-drivers, Jim Richards, a seven-time winner of Bathurst, Scaife, fourth on the list of uh, all-time winners, so it's Brock, Jim Richards, Larry Perkins and Mark Scaife, all Holden runners, of course, Bathurst all about traditional tribal rivalry between Ford and Holden. It's been uh, a Holden benefit for much of the last 10 years. In fact, uh, Ford had a real drought. Stephen Richards, the last winner of the Bathurst 1000 for Ford back in 1998 and in the ensuing uh, seven or eight years, Holden and consecutive victories. It was broken last year by Craig Lowndes and Jamie Winkup, and indeed that pairing for Triple Eight Car 888 in fourth position and ready to pounce on the three vehicles in front. A little bit of movement down the field. We saw Alan Simonson get around Jason Bright earlier in the event. Well, Jason Bright, who indeed was Ford Performance Racing driver last year and led those early stages, has got past Simonson. Both Ford drivers right now back into 11th position. On board with Mark Scaife, we look over his shoulder at the lead car, Stephen Richards behind the wheel. Stephen Richards, the only man to win the great race, as the Bathurst 1000 is called here in Australia in a Ford and a Holden. He switched camps a number of times, but has rejoined Ford to become the lead driver at Ford Performance Racing, with Jason Bright moving on to his own team, Bright Tech Motorsport. For Mark Scaife, for whatever happens now, it's an improvement over his uh, result from last year. Of course, he was the pole sitter, and he crashed uh, out of the event after one lap had clutch slippage dramas off the start last year, which meant put him down the pack and he was run into by Jack Perkins putting both cars out. So uh, whatever happens from here on in for Mark Scaife, as we look at the Team Kiwi car, that was the car that uh, was having its Watts linkage repaired. And they've got it back out on the circuit, but still not right quite clearly with the 021 Team Kiwi Falcon of uh, Shane Van Gisbergen. A shot now of the cars from the helicopter going down the mountain. Television uh, doesn't do justice to the steep climb and then decline, so it's lock break there. Get a 
bit of a lock up going into Forest Elbow. He had certainly a bit of a lock up in Forest Elbow, much more than he would have liked, and I'd be surprised if he hasn't put a little mark on the front left tyre. And uh, here it is in replay, looking rearward from Stephen Richards' car and uh, carted him well, car and a half wide of the mark. And that means you've got to come right yeah, out of the throttle, like which hurts right. you all the way down the straight. Look at the gap now, and it's out to 1.18 seconds. It brings Rick Kelly into much closer contact with Mark Scaife. Notice the time's drifting away a little bit for Greg Murphy. Just popped in. He's struggling with the rear tyres at the moment. This early race pace is pretty frenetic. They're just going to back off a little bit to conserve those. And Shane Van Gisbergen's car, TKR, back out. Just down at Team Vodafone here, they're going to split strategies on their two cars. Richard Lyons, the Irishman, is on standby for Alan Simonson. He's 12th on the road at the moment, but he's stuck behind Jason Bright. If you cast your mind back to the Sandown 500, it was Richard and Alan who lost out because they needed to pit for fuel, but the Lowndes and Wing Cup car was already in there. Cost themselves a top five. They won't have the same problem today. And it's a big issue if you've got two competitive cars in the one team because the single pit boom rule means that if you try and bring the cars into the same spot on the road on pit strategy, someone's going to get burnt. So you can't afford to do that. You've got to run split strategies or, in the event of a safety car, make them queue up. And that's not ideal, as you pointed out, Aaron. Thanks for that. 1.18 seconds, the margin. Stephen Richards, Mark Scaife. And uh, that front left tyre took a hammering one lap previous as Garth Tander puts the hands device on. Should we explain it? Yeah, I think we should. We've got ourselves a little bit of an um, emergency system there, but it's actually just coming out of the smoke, the uh, smoke down there in the pit lane area, and it's uh, triggered off the fire alarms. Jamie Winkup doing some stretching. Todd Kelly. Look at the tape. He's just... Uh, that, that's the uh, earplug that uh, enable him to hear the radio conversation, so he just tapes that up to make sure that in the scramble to get in and out of the car, it doesn't uh, unplug, and then all of a sudden you spend 90 minutes in the car with everybody frustrated with no comms. Also the tape all over the hands before he slides the gloves on. Remy go all the way back to round one at Adelaide where it was super hot. And Todd and the rest of the drivers will take off the gloves and have blisters all over their hands. Imagine trying to muscle one of these things around Mount Panorama for an entire day. Thankfully, there's two drivers to do it. There is car 51, Greg Murphy. That is position number nine. So there's Jason Bright in front of Alan Simonson. Then it's Greg Ritter. Simon Wills. There he goes there. Alex Davison in car 18, position 15. Jason Bargwana, that's position 16 in the WOW entry. Max Wilson standing by. Regular performer in the WPS car. He's jumped over to the wow car and Paul Morris goes through in 12th position. Then we've got a bit of a gap and a bit of a scramble too. As car triple one goes diving up the inside. Experience from John Bauer wants to have a lunge and does so. Glenn Seaton's all mixed up in that as well. Uh, the Jack Daniels car is backing up through the field. He is holding that traffic. Just be careful around there. Yeah, they've got the Marcus Marshall car 11 in front of this group. Now Seaton, Bow, Steve Owen and Paul Dumbrell make up that little battle group there and also car number five of Owen Kelly. So this is positions 18 down. You heard over the radio they were talking about the Jack Daniels car holding him up. Looking out the back of Shane Price. John Bauer has overtaken Owen for 22nd. Pretty vigorous battle, and when you look at where these fellas are in the field, it just goes to show how competitive it is all the way down the order. And if you give away track position at the start of the race, it hurts you for a long time. It'll take a long time for any quicker cars up the back here for them to be able to come effect, become effective and get to the mid-pack or beyond. Steg Bar Mountain Cam Ooh. shows a good view of Forest Elbow with Steve Owen and John Power getting a bit touchy. I don't think JB is too happy about Steve Owen at the moment. Looked like they made nose-to-tail contact on the run into Forest Elbow that time. So it's pretty aggressive and uh, Glenn's in there just with a watching brief at the moment, seeing whether he can pick up some benefit from the nonsense. 
often nonsense equals disaster at this place. Bow gets him. And Glenn will too, I think, because uh, Steve's exit through the chase might have been slowed slightly. Certainly looks a bit vulnerable. Here comes Cito down the inside, but not quite ready. So Shane Price gets around the other Jack Daniels car of Marcus Marshall, which has been struggling on that lap. Bow holds that position over Steve Owen. Nathan Pretty and uh, Glenn Seat would seat behind the wheel, tuck in there. And Paul Dumbrell goes along for the ride. One of the GRM cars in pit lane. That'll be 34 of Greg Ritter. Stephen Richards and Mark Scaper back in the nines and that gap is 1.28 seconds so things have calmed down a little bit there they've found their rhythm again there's still a margin between them and the gap back to Rick Kelly from the leader is 2.1 seconds and it's 0.8 of a second between Scape and Kelly. Zinger replay at the chase and this will explain why car 34 ended up in pit lane. Greg Ritter goes off on the grass shallow enough to rejoin on the circuit with effectively no problems. Aside from the fact that he wasn't on the track for a few seconds. And they did a driver change in the process there. So Cam Klein now on board car 34, replacing the tyres that were damaged. Paul Radisich is not entirely comfortable with his car at the moment either, but they're going to try and make sure they get him to at least lap 32. I don't think he's... Uh, currently thrilled with the, the brake retardation in that car. Car number 17 here, Stephen Johnson, fifth at the moment, two minute 9.9 .9 the last lap for him. That's only two tenths slower than his best lap of the race so far. And uh, looking at Stephen, he's just 4.2 seconds off the lead of the motor race with James Courtney in behind. He knows what it's like to be at the front of this race. He's been fourth here three times, 97, 99, 2000. A chopper shadow following him up Mountain Straight. And behind him is James Courtney. He's got the left door mirror folded in on Stephen's car as well. He's either given the wall a rub or been side by side with somebody. You may not think that's a big deal, but sometimes in a race, it's very handy to be able to see down the left side of the car when you're battling somebody, particularly with Bathurst predominantly left turns. If anybody does poke the nose, you just glimpse to the left and you can see it in there. Open the steering of Frag and it just gives you that space without making contact. Position six, James Courtney. David Bernard in waiting. For his stint in car number four, the Gel Gwen Motorsport. James has been super busy. Definitely a tougher stint than the first stint last year, this one. More people in quicker lap times for longer than for the same period in 2006. And uh, so what are the elements that we need to watch there? Fuel, number one. And two, what's it doing to the brakes? Everybody this year using the same brand and specification of brake rotor on the car. And it's a little different to some of the brake rotors that have been used here in years gone by. It doesn't process quite as much heat. He is 11th in the championship, James. This man has just been so impressive. 12th in the title race for 2007, but it's his achievements along the way. Massive setback at Winton when he had a big, big impact with the wall, Lee Holdsworth. He was uh, dizzy for quite a few days, to be honest, and a little bit tentative jumping back in the car. But when he did so, he got straight back into race mode, toughed it out for a couple of rounds, and then ended up with his first race win, first round win, in round eight at Oran Park. Been a good run so far from Lee Holdsworth, lapping in the low 10s at the moment. Best lap of the race for him so far has been a 9.7. I made mention before about the change in brake rotors this year to the Touring Car Entrance Group in Australia, the Tiger controlled brake provided by Alcon. This is a CAD drawing of the Harrop brake rotor. 
and there it is in all its normal glory. And to make a point, this year the maximum number of vanes inside the control rotor is 48. Now in years gone by, and we'll slice it down the middle for you, those vanes that you see process air through the middle of the brake rotor, in years gone by teams have run up to 72 of those. So quite a lot different in terms of the amount of thermal efficiency, the amount of air that you process through the middle of the rotor. And if I get plate to just section it through the middle, you can see what the brake rotor looks like again. There's the vanes when you reassemble half the disc. And this is something that all the teams are watching very carefully at the moment. Certainly nothing wrong with the Alcon rotor, I might mention. It's the same for everybody, and it takes a little bit of learning. It's easy to crack it if you abuse it. If you haven't got the cooling right, you can knock it around. You've got to get your brake pad combination right. And we're expecting not only the compulsory brake pad stop today, but also some people are expecting to do two or more pads and possibly one of these rotors. It's absolutely right, Neil, and we've seen it during practice as well. It's an amazing exercise. A lot of the cars, as you said earlier with the tech centre, have adapted a different hat so they can actually get these discs off as quickly as they can. FBR did it in practice at 59. You talked before about the discs matching up and not getting some heat shock, and you said to Toll are running an oven. Well, I've just popped down here to HRT. They've got their anvil oven, not party pies and everything else. I'll briefly just crack that open. We've got the discs in there ready and baking away so that there is no heat shock. They can get them on as quickly as possible and send the boys back up the lane. Incredible, isn't it? Just amazing. Toasty warm when they get out, a little bit hotter. One of the other things that you need to manage in the breaks around here is the big variation in temperature you get. And uh, as you wander over the top of the mountain, yes, you use the brakes on occasion, but uh, they cool out down Conrod straight to a lowly 400, 450 degrees C. Then you go for the big maximum pressure application at the bottom of the chase, they come back up to around 900 degrees. So there's that huge variation of those two numbers. And then there's a second crack at the brake pedal that's a big one, it's the final one into the last corner and it superheats them again. Whenever we've run cars here in the twilight, you see them glowing and it really knocks them around. I love it how you just think this is a wonder over the top of the mountain. Paul Radisic on screen now. He's just in front of uh, another Kiwi, Greg Murphy. Murphy, the last man to win the Bathurst 1000 from pole position back in the year 2003. The day before he won his great race, Greg Murphy set the fastest ever time around Mount Panorama. As we look at a move now, Craig Hounds in uh, the Dayglow Ford there with Vodafone on it, getting very racy looking for a way around reigning V8 supercar champion Rick Kelly in car number one. That is a battle for third position. Rick Kelly, not only the reigning champion, actually the points leader in the 2007 series coming into this event. So uh, lots of talk in the media before the event as to just how he and Garth Tander, his co-driver, Tander second in the championship, will approach this event. Yes, they want to win the biggest race of the year, but they don't want to do that to uh, charge for the victory and risk uh, crashing out or mechanical failure that will really dent their championship aspirations. Fastest car on the circuit at the moment is the vehicle that just flashed through the screen there ahead of uh, this battle for third. Mark Skay for 209.43. Still about uh, 2.5 seconds off pole position. The time set uh, for pole, a 2.7 even from Ford Performance Racing's Mark Winterbottom. Over the top of the mountain now, and uh, a bit of smoke there, a wheel catching of Rick Kelly. His mirror's full of uh, the reigning champion, Craig Lowndes. Lowndes and his teammate, Jamie Wincup, won the traditional curtain raiser to the Bathurst 1000, the Sandown 500. They are aiming to be the first team since Lowndes and Greg Murphy in 1996 to win the Sandown Bathurst double. Fastest second sector time. Fastest time to the end of the second sector now for our race leader, Steve Richards, car six, the Ford Performance Racing Falcon. A 127.3. And 
and uh, that was uh, half a second faster than the car behind him. As we have a look now, a real challenge there, and that is Rick Kelly, and he comes across the bow of Craig Lowndes, the man he was battling with. Car number one, significant damage on the front of that vehicle of Rick Kelly. A massive blow, not only to as we listen to uh, Rick Kelly go off to his team. Pulls into pit lane now, about uh, seven laps ahead of schedule. So uh, we were just talking about how this could really dent his championship aspirations. Extraordinary happening at the end of Conrod Strait. Garth Tander takes over the drive. And the voice in the background is Rob Crawford, no, no, team manager. And he wants them to tape up the gap where the headlight once was. And we'll explain in a moment how all this came about. Garth Tander in the car. Wheels and tyres. They'll have done fuel. Get the Rob runs a really disciplined show. It's him in the right-hand side of our screen. That's it. Serious taping. That's what they need. Trying to stay on the lead lap. And that's why he wants to hustle it out. And he does so. Garth Tander takes over control of a battered and bruised car number one. And as he gets back out onto Mountain Straight, changes the sequence for them in a big way. There's something hanging down under that car. Here's what happened. Lowndes got very close to the back of Kelly as they approached the chase at 300 k's. And when you're that close, it destabilises the car in front and it's had a bit of a shake. He couldn't grab it. He's got onto the bumpy stuff and then out there, it's dirty. Oh, here comes Lowndes. Whoa! And he missed him, obviously. So, amazing off. Here it is from the other angle. Lowndes was really hustling. And it just ran wide of the apex. And once you're onto that grubby stuff, and I reckon the tyres, it might have... You know what? There's enough tyre debris there. I reckon the tyres let go yep. in the middle of the corner. Yep. You can see it start flinging off. And watch this. Just watch the left-hand side. You saw it there go. And, and remember, earlier in the race, we saw him lock the front left up at the top of the hill. This was a very, very lucky situation for Rick Kelly because had that been a little bit different angle, the thing would have rolled over or he could have been T-boned by Craig Lowndes. But I'm absolutely 100% sure. Look, there's the tyre. OK, I thought he'd got onto the dirty stuff, but it wasn't. The tyre let go, and that was the reason why Rick was animated on the radio. I'm with Rick Kelly. Rick, it looked like the tyre let go there. It was an amazing save. Yeah, I tell you what, that is not fun at all. I've had a couple of tyres let go through the chase. They always seem to let go through the chase, and uh, I'm glad I'm out of the car. I need a bit of a drink and a sit-down after that. But I don't think we're a lap down. We may be, but uh, we're still in the race, I think. We're just... Um, Got to not have that thing, those sorts of things happen, I guess. He was catching you all the time, I tell you what, it was so close and so close to Lounsey too, we, we almost had another incident. <laughs> no incidents there, it's just a tyre. That, that is dead set dangerous, to be honest with you. We've had several tyres let go and um, I just hope it doesn't happen again because it can happen somewhere a little more awkward and uh, we could be in a lot of trouble. Thanks. Thanks. That's dangerous, all right. I mean, that would have just been the most hairy ride. It's just something yeah, hanging out under the front of that car as well. It's not right. Just to re relieve uh, Rick from the worry, he's not a lap down at the moment. Garth's on the start finish straight, as you can see, and the race leaders are just starting to enter pit straight. So he's almost a lap down, but not quite. Right about that take, okay, Rick. From me, I can't see any smoke, and it's nothing too heavy down the pit straight. It's, it's under the middle yeah. of the car, yeah, okay. underneath the, the worries me. I don't know what that is that's hanging down there. But uh, Rob Crawford's had a look, or his guys have had a look, and they confirmed no smoke, all looks okay. Got a bit of tape flapping, but no big deal. Meantime, Stephen Richards, that very last lap was a two minute 9.49. We've been seeing very good sector splits from Stephen. He's got a 1.86 second margin over Mark Skate, who himself was in the nines on this lap. Two minute 9.8 and that references their fastest laps of the race. Stevie's done a 9.4, Mark's done a 9.3. So they're within half a second 
of the good tyre pace that they showed early with the heavier fuel load. Craig Lowndes is now in third position. He's six seconds behind this man on the road. Stephen Richards, Castrol, Orcon, Ford. He's just been all business, straight faced, keeping the car straight, no damage, no troubles. And, and he holds onto the lead. Just done the fastest split to the end of the first sector in the 888 car, so his car looking good on empty tanks as well. And this is car number three, the second of the Tasman Motorsport entries, driven by Mark Noski and Jay Burdnick. Driver change and standard procedure there. Okay, we'll drop the car. Radio check, mate. Radio check, just nod for me. Radio check. Okay, we just want fuel. Waiting for fuel. It's always the limiting thing. Fuel runs in between about 4 Go. to 4.4 4 litres per second. Watch your pet lane speed. Make sure you've got a brake pedal. Oh, they did pads as well. Lift pumps off. Lift pumps off. Make sure you're on main. Make sure you're on main. Brake bias to 9.7. Brake bias to 9.7. Your bars are OK. So the anti-roll bar adjustment in the cockpit's right and they're asking to put more rear brake on the car now that it's got a heavy fuel load and they're running this car out of sequence so that it doesn't trip over the 51 car which is vying for position at the moment position eight greg murphy they don't want the two of them in together when one car is in a challenging position neil here's the tire i don't know whether you can see the pitches yet i've got both the dunlop technicians having a look at it I'll see if i can get a word here with kevin simmons kev what do we reckon mate i know it's only early to have a look it's right through to the cap fly it's still inflated though yeah it's still slightly inflated and everything but it's um yeah it's just obviously torn the tread away very similar to the gary rogers car i would imagine the um it, whether it's picking up some of the cord and having a, a a bit of a niggle could be some rubbish on the track hard to tell when uh, when there's that much damage um without the rest of the tread there it's a little bit hard to sort of uh, ascertain what it is but at this stage the case is still inflated but um, we'll just uh, keep a bit of an eye on the other tyres of the other cars when they come in and see if there's any cuts or abrasions on them and uh, see what we can come up with. Thanks Keith. This is the view out the rear of Rick Kelly's car when it let go right there the fastest point of the circuit. And listen to it you hear the tyre flailing on the inner guard and leapt across the road and uh, Rick just takes a deep breath and fires up grabs first and gets it into the pit lane scary stuff tell you what for that kind of ride the composure that he showed there was just incredible knowing also that craig lowndes was coming in i thought that chopper was coming into our lounge rips as well but craig lowndes is coming in and it's just shows you the level of professionalism they both managed to control their own situations which is what exactly this man is doing from pole he's kept the race lead it's a two second gap Back to Mark Scaife, who came into picture there at Forest Elbow. Down Conrod straight for Stephen. Approaching that point now, where it went for Rick. That was it there. Nice, gentle blips of the throttle for Stephen. Couple of lazy, gentle gear changes. Back to second. This car looks well balanced and well within rhythm at the moment. Nice little blip again. He's not free revving it up onto the rev limiter. Stroking the car along, keeping the pace up. This lap at 2 minute 9.9. .9. And Mark will cross the line now, 2 minute 10.2. And the margin goes out now to 2.4 seconds. Meantime, Lowndes has just done the fastest lap of the race, 2 minute 9.34. And Lowndes is 5.7 seconds off the lead attitude in the cockpit is exactly like his personality Stephen Richards very cool calm and collected that's how he's been driving this one here we go the triple eight car As Neil mentioned fastest lap of the race that last one he's pushing forward he's in third at the moment James Courtney and Stephen Johnson the fourth and fifth see the green dots there on your screen that indicates which man is behind the wheel. So Greg Murphy in position eight for car 51. Ingle and Bright make up our top ten. So it looked like uh, James was having a, a look up on the outside there of Stephen Johnson. This battle's been seesawing as well. These two fellas are mates right at the moment. That counts for nothing because Courtney wants to hustle along. 
and he's in the dirty hot air of the Jim Beam car at the moment. Brings up the water temperature on the engine, brings up the brake temps as well. And Lee Holdsworth very well positioned in behind them in sixth. Radishish seventh, then Murphy Ingle Bright in the ten. Simon Wills next in the Team BOC entry. Alex Davison, Jason Bagwana, Paul Morris, Owen Kelly, Shane Price, Marcus Marshall, Steve Owen, Glenn Seaton, Paul Dumbrell. That's the 20. So we're looking to listen to James at work. seconds off the race lead. James Courtney. He's got Johnson inside. Another lap done. Approaching the first round of stops here in the 2007 race. And uh, teams looking to stretch the first stint through to at least lap 32 or 33. They can do that. They can divide the race up into five equal sectors and uh, any team that has to stop more than four times immediately puts themselves behind the eight ball with uh, at least each stop taking 30 seconds and they're stationary and uh, costing teams about another uh, 38 seconds slowing down into pit lane and exiting Heading over the top of the mountain now, we're on board with James Courtney, the former Jaguar test driver. He, James Courtney is one of three Australians to win a FIA World Championship. His came in karting, the other two, of course, uh, Sir Jack Brabham and Alan Jones. First stop now for the re liveried, repainted second car from Ford Pullman performance racing Owen Kelly out of that vehicle now and he's handed over to the A1 GP Team New Zealand driver from a season ago Matthew Halliday so not quite getting to the uh, magical figure of lap 32 so I would suggest uh, at least five stops for car number five well, that's the bad news for Ford Performance Racing. The good news is that their lead car, number six, Stephen Richards, and Mark Winbottom, continues to lead. Lead now back to 1.6 seconds over Mark Scape with Craig Mount. Pit stop now for Greg Murphy. He will hand over the Tasman Motorsport Commodore to Stephen, sorry, Jason Richards, fellow Kiwi. So a number of Kiwis, a dozen Kiwis in this event. Okay, now pops you. Murphy, his younger teammate, Jason Richards, who's been with the Tasman Motorsport team now for uh, four years. He was with the team when it was the Lansdale Smash Repair team. It uh, morphed into a more Kiwi operation. Okay, mate, drop the car. Radio says, Jake, just nice for me. We're going to wait for fuel. Waiting for fuel. Away you go. Away you go. He stalls the car. Where to go? Where to go? Watch your pit lane speed. Make sure you got a pedal for me. Meantime, just a few seconds lost there. Only about three or four seconds for that Jason Richards car. Simon Wills climbs out of uh, the Team BOC car and hands that over to Andy Jones. Quite marginal for car 51 as to whether it can go through now on just four stops given that it pitted at the end of lap 31. Jason gets his first stint and now Mark Scaife, the 
Richard stalls on exit there in the Tasman car. Scape gets out, Todd Kelly in. So they've made it to lap 32. A nice, good, comfortable ride it was for Mark Scape. Held on to Stephen Richards. And now it's Todd Kelly's turn. Fuel goes in at four litres per second. Once it's out, he is gone. Because of the uh, safety car early in, in the uh, race, that one lap saved, if you like, in the total fuel burn. And uh, they've got to lap 32, so that means they've averaged 3.68 litres per lap. So that's on those numbers, that's a four-stop race. So Tom now settles in. When you first jump in after someone else has had the car, just it's a, it's a bit of a weird feeling. You get in, it's all hot. It's got nice new tyres on it, but a fat fuel load. And you've got to try and figure out the feel of where you're at with the brakes and the general behaviour of the car. And the track has changed since you were last on it. It's a, it's a long time ago, 7 o'clock this morning, when they did the warm-up. And it just takes the first, well, I was going to say half a lap in reality, it's probably more than that to really get in the groove and feel your way around there. This is the driver change coming up for our lead car. through for Stephen Richards. We'll track him with our Pentax cam right up to his garage where Mark Winterbottom and the crew are waiting. They've asked him to put more rear brake bias on the car. Don't touch the pedal. So are they going to have a look at brakes on this car as well? Driver standing by, four wheels and tyres, 120 litres of fuel. Oh, he's got snag there. It's so hard to get in and out of the things at the moment. Head first in for Frosty. Lap belts. Now the shoulder straps. They're on elastics. Just waiting now for fuel. And it doesn't look to me as though they're getting anything to do with brakes. He would have been stinging to get in that car. And up we go to car 16 of Radisich and Baird. They are doing pads on this car, but this is not inside the compulsory pad stop window. This is just a precaution. Pump the pedal, pump that pedal. Get that pedal pumped up. Go, 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 go. Get that pedal pumped up, mate. Confirm. The instructions are short and sweet. Russell Ingle. Moves himself from car nine. Luke Yildon jumps in. Kelly, confirm radio. Be that radio. He's made Check contact. your brake pedal. Check your brake pedal. Reset your fuel. Red button, two seconds. Turn your brake by. All right, good. Well done. Sorry for that. They both feel like come on the same time. The engineers were struggling to keep on top of it. Just one of those things. Well done. Good recovery. Now he's off the 29 year old. These guys finished fourth in 2006, the third year they've been together. Ingle and Yulden. Started from 10th. Russell got up to a back. Here we go, and we saw the light flick on. Got him up to about top six, and now. Like you said before, uh, Neil Luke has to find his find his feet, so to speak, in this car over this lap for him, and then he can start getting back into race mode. Car number 16 is reporting what we call a long brake pedal, and that doesn't mean it's physically long. It means that when the driver travels the pedal down to where you start to feel and find the pressure, uh, it travels too far. And the reason for that is we have a look at one of these six piston calipers. We'll undress it for you, take the bridge away, and we'll take the brake pads out. And there are six golden coloured pistons inside here. And as the pads wear down, these pistons come further and further out of the caliper. That's the gold thing that we're looking at 
there. We might even drill down and have a closer look at them. And as the pads wear away, they come further and further out. And so they have to be squeezed back by brake pad changing calipers in order to fit the full width pads back in. And then the drivers need to repressure the pads back up to the disc face. And that's why you're hearing team managers telling their drivers, pump the pedal, pump the pedal. But at the moment, Paul Radisich has got a long pedal in car number 16, and that could be an issue for him. Stephen Richards, congratulations. All going well for FPR at the moment. Let's start at the start. You got a good one. Yeah, got away well, which was which was handy and led up the gave me a bit of room on the exit of turn one, so I was able to get into it. But um, you know the car's the car's going great. Just trying to get into a bit of a rhythm at this early stage. And, yeah, so far so good. Scafey had a bit of a nip around your heels there at one stage. Yeah, yeah, just as the fuel load was coming off the changing brake balance, made a couple of little little errors, and that, that allowed him to get on the back of me. So um, it's just trying to keep your head down and get into a rhythm, and then the, the car was able to sort of ease away, which was good. Richo, first stint physically, how are you feeling? Yeah, I feel really good. Obviously, it's quite a cool day today, so, you know, it's not going to take its toll as, as much on the drivers, but it doesn't, doesn't change the, the, way, the way I'm going to try and recover for the next one. We'll just um, go and do the normal things, get a bit of a rub, make sure fully hydrated for the next one. OK, so from now, straight into the trailer, massage and get some fluid into you? Yeah, pretty well. Yeah. All right, well, well done. Great start. No worries. Thanks. I'll tell you something that is a headline item here. We're seeing great fuel economy from the Craig Lowndes car. I think he's in this lap in car 888 with 35 laps recorded. That's extremely good fuel consumption in that car. And burning 3.37 litres a lap, remembering that they did a couple of lazy laps at the start. Here we go. And then once you're done, you're going to clean that right here, right? Bring the wood screen, the rest you can do it. There must be some debris in the red. Kevin May's voice, Jamie McCuppy. Okay, now go to the screen. Hold, hold the fuel. Hold. Everybody away from the car. Hold. Hold. Jake's in boy. Hold. Okay, mate, where you go? Watch the screen. There's barely a breath of time. By the time they get the belts on and settle in, the fuel has gone in. And they have to take off. So Jamie Winkup gets his first stint in this race. Car Triple Eight, Craig Lowndes. Showed a great amount of speed. Remember, this is a brand new car for this weekend. It'll be the car that Jamie gets for the rest of the season. 22 of Seaton and Pretty. And a tough stint for those guys down the back of that pack and battling away there. Fuel couplings. Got... Yep, start the engine, mate. Keep that light on. Make sure you've got a brake pedal. Toppy up the water bottle as well. Two points on the fueling, one for the fuel, one for the vent. And stalled it. Real easy to do. You can ask for too much throttle percentage and they'll just stall against the electronic pit lane speed limiter. Craig Lowndes, I see some of these blokes hopping out of the car looking very, very tired. You look like you're just about to start the day. How was the run? Yeah, the car was really good. Uh, the run was pretty easy. We just sort of looked after the car early on and, uh, yeah, there's no pressure on us to be at the front. Just sort of kept, as long as we kept the leaders in, in sight, which we did. And, uh, yeah, the only, only exciting bit I had out of the whole lot was when uh, Rick had an excursion off the chase. Wasn't that amazing? Well, I was going down the road and I was sort of looking as far as I could left because I'm just trying to get the overlap right because I knew he was going to continue, but I just didn't want to be there when he came through and uh, we only just missed him. Is that what, it, that, what is the plan from here? I mean, it, it almost came so I'm stuck another dab on the brake to let him go. What's the plan from here? Any, any double stinging in the middle for Jamie? Uh, well, no, not at the moment. We've got, uh, we're pretty flexible, but uh, at Bathurst there's really no need to double sting because you can get drivers in and out in time. So. Uh, uh, really, the only time you want to do a double stint or a stint and a half is right at the end if you have to do a splash and dash. But uh, at the moment, yeah, the car's working good. Stayed out of trouble, which is up to my bit. Thanks, Craig. Thank you. <laughs> I've done my bit. Now your turn, Jamie. And he's got great history here. Tremendous run last year, obviously. And the year before also with Tasman Motorsport and Roland Dane hired Jamie Wincup on the strength of his great drives at both Sandown and Bathurst at Tasman Motorsport. Problem for Paul Morris and Steve Ellery's car. Stephen behind the wheel. He's gone way off. And a 
picked up a, quite a bit of dirt there in the front of the car. Here's another angle. And watch when it rejoins. Whew. Big dose of dirt. I think there's another one coming. Yulden versus Wilson. These guys are 17th and 18th on the road. But on corrected order, they'll be about five or six positions further up than that. Once again, the Zinger replay will track. Ah, oh, this a big, big lockup from Luke Yulden. He managed to hold on to his position. He yeah, started on the dirty side of the road and then carried that lock break for quite some time. Here's the other angle. Look at all the, see all the gravel and yep. dirt down there, and that's what set that tyre off. He got off it reasonably quickly, but then did the big motocross leap over the kerb. Look nastier from the inside view of the circuit than it did from the outside. Back up the mountain they go. Split times. Working your way through the field. Show the gaps, car to car. Mark Winterbottom is our race leader. Jamie Winkup in car triple eight. Crosses the control line while these guys are up the top of the mountain. Car five of Matt Halliday joins in this group. And that's also where we find Garth Tander. I've just been scratching my head for a minute here, Matthew, because uh, Tom Kelly went out in a better position than he's currently in. He's down in fourth at the moment in car number two, and uh, he's dropped a couple of spots. I think there's been a whoop somewhere for the Holden Racing Team car. Uh, Wink up and Will Davison. Gone up ahead. Remember, Scaife had held down second position from the word go. They did that driver change only a handful of laps ago, five laps ago. So somewhere along the line, Todd Kelly has dropped a couple of spots. Tander makes a move. And that brings him up into 17th position. Now he takes a look at Max Wilson. Here's the Zinger replay at turn two. This will explain what happened to Todd Kelly, will it? No, it's an overtaking move. So he's had to pick up a few places on his way back up to fourth position. It's a little bit of a dilemma here at Stone Brothers Racing, guys. You might have noticed in that stop that Russell Ingle had to stop and wait in behind the James Courtney car. Car number four, David Bernard, now behind the wheel. We've got a bit of a problem here. The cars are running pretty close in the race. James's fuel light came on, so he had to pit. Unfortunately, that's when Russell needed to come in. It's the problem of having two lead cars with the regular drivers in with co-drivers. They're going to have to spend the rest of the day trying to split them up. Jim Stone spoke to me about that last night, and it's a real problem for those guys. They end up... V8 Supercar Championship Series has 14 rounds. Bathurst 1000, round number 10 after this weekend. There is an off weekend break for two weeks before the cars go to the Surface Paradise circuit to share top billing with the champ cars for round 11. From there, the series moves to Bahrain to one of two offshore rounds for the yeah, Supercar Series. The series then goes to its penultimate round as we have a look at the toll car locks up. Car number one, Rick Kelly, and for the second time in this race, he finds himself in the grass and the sand in the chase. So absolute disaster there compounding problems so all that work getting around uh, I won't say back markers but uh, cars in the midfield for Rick Kelly and Garth Tander Tander behind the wheel so an off-track excursion now for both drivers in that toll HSV machine Garth Tander behind the wheel now just to finish the point I was making about the championship the 14 round championship an ultimate round in November Simmons Plains in Tasmania and it all wraps up at the magnificent Victorian seaside circuit, Phillip Island for the Dunlop Grand Finale.
Max Wilson heads this three car train. Car number eight, the Wow Sight and Sound Falcon. Behind him is Matthew Halliday in the second forward performance racing machine there, the Falcon, and Garth Tander. Tander in 16th place. So this battle, 14th, 15th, and 16th. Bit of smoke there coming from the right front from the Garth Tander car. So uh, as you would expect, all not quite well for Tander. At least uh, that car didn't drop a lap. And we'll uh, work over the course team will work over the course of uh, the ensuing 122 laps to uh, dial out any problems with set up on that car now to try and give him and Rick Kelly a car capable of fighting at the end of this affair. 39 laps down, so approaching one quarter distance. Only the one safety car period, and that was uh, for two laps off the start to remove the vehicle of uh, Cameron McCombe, which uh, broke down, getting up the mountain uh, on the warm-up lap before the start. Here's our race leader, Mark Winterbottom, the pole sitter, took over this car from Stephen Richards. He heads across Salmon Park now. Magical roller coaster ride on the 6.2 kilometre circuit goes through McPhilmy Park and starts the big descent down the mountain. Heads through the dipper and that's where he continues to lead this race. Watching the super cheap auto Bathurst 1000. These are the highlights from the first hour and a half or so. Well, poor old Cam McConville didn't even make it to the start line. That engine packed it in. That was on the warm up lap. Can you believe it? The race start was all Stephen Richards. He did a great job from pole position, and Mark Scaife held on to second position. It was all pretty clean, but then we had to go under safety car conditions because of McConville's car. Shane Van Gisberg in car 021 clipped the wall. The Watts linkage went on that. The rear of that car was uncontrollable. Here was a move by Glenn Seaton on Fabian Coulthard, who found the back of the wall at turn two. Scaife had a look at Richards. They were just trading amazing times. And you've got to remember, this was the opening stanza of this race. They came out with gloves on. Riccio shut the door and did not let Scaife pass at any stage. The lock up there at Forest Elbow from the five-time champ. And this was the scariest moment of all. Rick Kelly's tyre went on him. He went zipping through the chase the wrong way and inches, millimetres in it, as Craig Lowndes showed incredible poise to miss that car. Luke Yildon took over the car nine drive of Russell Ingall. And Max Wilson was in the chair of the Wow Falcon number eight. And Yildon managed to hold on to that position. By the way, that part of the circuit is causing a few dramas, but look at this. Mark Winterbottom is in the seat of car number six and he is going nuts at the top of the mountain. Takes over the race lead with Stephen Richards doing a fantastic job. The Steg Bar Mountain Camp showing you the attitude that Frosty is showing in his first stint. He's letting it all hang out. He's hustling, and, and then you saw him lock a break on the way to Forest Elbow. And uh, on the sector splits, he's either running even with or slightly slower than Jamie Wincup, but he's got margin. He's got 8.8 .8 seconds the last time through. But he's driving the car very hard. That bit of track you talk about is dirty on the left side, so people are making mistakes down here because they're getting onto the gravel and they can't stop the cars. And that's exactly what's happened to Garth Tanner there after he was able to pass a couple including Matt Halliday in car five, he lost those spots again. And it keeps on happening. The bizarre thing the about this is that that dirt was more than likely caused by what happened to that car when Rick yep. Kelly was behind the wheel. So that has become a bit of a trap. And that part of the circuit, by this time, Gartander had done an enormous amount of work to get past Halliday and close in on Max Wilson. And then you see there that Halliday goes shooting on past. So he certainly got the speed. 
But coming into that area of the circuit, we're going to have to watch. Here's Jamie Winker. He's trading some pretty good times with Mark Winterbottom, but the gap from first to second is 8.8 .8 seconds. So the triple eight car, look at that. Looking all the way down that mountain straight, Winterbottom's already gone by. So this is the order. Mark Winterbottom, Jamie Wincup, here comes Will Davison. He is in third position. Todd Kelly in fourth. Fifth is David Bernard. Sixth is Jason Richards. There is Dean Canto, who's slotted into car 33 after a good opening stint from Lee Holdsworth. Move behind those guys, Richard Lyons in eighth, car number 88. And uh, this is Garth Tander making up that ground that he lost previously on the gravel down in the braking area. This time he gets it done before he gets through the right-hander at the chase and is able to stop on the clean line. David Bernard, fifth. Remember his opening stint at Sandown was beautiful, nice and clean. He ran in clean air for his whole first stint. Didn't make a mistake. Nice job. It was bizarre. I was not only watching him on the track at Sandown, but also on our race tracking device, which basically represents dots around a screen. And he really had. He had nobody in front of him, nobody behind him. So his return to V8 Supercars in 07 for the Enduros was just a nice drive in the park, really. Quite a vigorous battle this one at the moment and uh, Jason Richards is beginning to put a fair amount of pressure on David Bernard. Tough for David, certainly got the benefit of a better car than he's had in recent years but still a little rusty on absolute V8 supercar race miles where Jason Richards has been in the saddle all year. Another car that's running quite well at the moment. Just at the back of this little group is Andrew Jones in car number 12, the Team BOC entry. Adam Macro in Jason Bright's car, 11th, and Andrew Thompson in Alex Davidson's car, and that's uh, 12th. Now this little battle here continues just to seesaw. A comfortable feeling for Bernard to have someone that close at the moment. That lap was a 2.10.5 for David Bernard, a 2.10.3 for Jason Richards. Not a good day for Brightech Motorsport, guys. The 26 car of Warren Luff, who started the Irwin Tools Falcon. It's out with a clutch problem. And looking on screen here, Jason Richards on board the 51 Tasman car. I spoke to Jeff Gretsch just before they made their stop. They did a pad stop on the number three car of Mark Noski. They did not do it on car number 51. But Jeff tells me that they're planning to do two pad stops on the Tasman car, with the last one right towards the end of the compulsory window, which, of course, is between laps 48 and 120. Thanks, mate. We're going to stick with this battle, I think, because... Bernard really has his hands full. Defending position five. In front of him, Will Davison's doing some good sector times. Behind them, Craig Baird in car 16 and Andrew Jones in team BOC. Single car for those guys now after the demise of the Damien White Christian Murchison car 14 on Friday. This car at the moment, car 12, is 10th. Bit of a margin over Adam Macro in car number 25. So this is fourth position at the moment. And uh, Andrew in behind Craig Baird and keeping him honest. They've actually had pretty good speed all weekend in the Team BOC car. They've been making a bit of progress in the recent past. It was to have been an announcement for this team over the weekend, but then it was subsequently cancelled. So we'll wait and see what that was about a little later in the season. History continues. He was uh, a top five performer when he paired up with Cam McConville in 2005, Andrew Jones. Currently 42 odd seconds off the lead of the race, these guys. So that's a reasonable chunk of time. But anytime you're in the top 10 here, it's good news. Craig Baird in front of him. His best also fourth, but that was 10 years ago. Back then he was in the uh, DJR Falcon with Stephen Johnson. Here's Adam Macro. He's just behind those guys, 11th at the moment. Giving away a fair old march, about another nine seconds, I think, back to Adam. But they're just slowly working their way up. We qualified in 13th. Jason Bright completing the first stint in the Fujitsu Ford. Heard from Aaron Nurnan before that uh, car 26, the Irwin Tools entry, the other one that 
It's operated out of Brightec Motorsport. Clutch problem. 18 is Andrew Thompson. And this is his uh, first main series run at Mount Panorama and doing a really good job too. The last lap for Andrew was a 10-7. Had great strength in the development series. And uh, he's just a little in front of Luke Yulden in the Russell Ingle car at the moment. And incidentally, Todd Kelly has found his rhythm. We still haven't totally got to the bottom of what happened. Perhaps it was just a little slower in the pit lane than the other cars around it. We've not been able to trace any incident for car number two. So Kelly has just done the fastest sector to the end of the first split, which is just out of the cutting for the Holden Racing Team combo. He's fourth at the moment, and uh, he's 3.3 seconds behind Will Davis in third. Back up the order we go. Now we look back towards Jason Richards from Bernard's car. So we're in fifth, looking back at sixth. Panto in seventh behind them. Further down the field in 14th position, Garth Tander. Also sending the time sheet flashing in the first sector with a quick time. He's by no means out of the race, Tander 14th. Faster split to the first sector. And uh, a correction to my earlier because he's about 71 seconds behind the leader of the race. I said 65 earlier on, there's a misinterpretation. But uh, if there's a safety car, that, that'll bring Tander totally back in contention. Just popped into the WPS garage. Uh, lunch of champions down here for the drivers who have done their first in. Jason Barguana, a, uh, a witchy <laughs> grub or something. Yeah, absolutely. A bit of sugar, get it back into the body. So, I mean, we're pretty happy with what's going on at the moment. Pretty simple start to the race, really casual. We'll just uh, cruise along for the first couple of hours. See how it all pans out, but uh, car's good. Feeling pretty comfortable. You're in the new car for the team that was debuted at Sandown. You've got out of the old girl into this one. It, it really does adapt well to change, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, look, the, the good thing about the new car is that, that when you do change a spring or a bit of shock or change the ride height in the car, it responds quite well, which is uh, what we've, in my car, we really don't get that. We've got to change four springs to get a difference. So. That's been good for us. We did lose that engine on Thursday, which has put us behind a bit, but the car seems pretty comfortable now. It's running in that sort of mid-10 range, which, look, it's not up there with that sort of first four or five cars, but, you know, come the end of the day, we could be in a good spot. It's good stuff. And Grant, Daniel, champ, yes. I've just got to say hello to Ben at home because he's watching. Hi. Yes, hi, Ben. Uh, hello, Grant. Good fuel economy in your cars today. You stopped on lap 38 much later than anyone else. Here comes the aeroplane. Oh, you. Uh, if fuel economy is fantastic. And you idiot. Um, we can go a long way in this car. Look, uh, to be honest, probably the biggest weakness would be me not experienced on full tanks. The car was moving around like Mark Brenner at the uh, Dancing with the Stars dance floor. So um, it takes me a bit to get used to it. We might try and tune it so it's better on full tanks and so we don't lose that earlier part of the stint and make the most of our fuel economy. But uh, she goes a long way, doesn't it? Good on you, mate. Tough. Right, Daniel, Jason Barguana, Daniel Gibson, all comfy and relaxed. The Caltex racing car actually has Luke Yulden behind the wheel. Currently 13th, but I tell you what, Neil, they have got somebody hot on their hammer further down the road. Garth Tan is 14th, but he's just posted the quickest time of the race. 209.287 on his 44th lap. On board now with Jason Richards, car 51 Tasman Motorsport as he heads down the hill and he's chasing the teammate of Yulden and Russell Ingall. That is David Bernard in the car, number four. Stone Brothers Racing sharing with James Courtney. Currently the star of uh, Dancing with Stars on Australian television. David Bernard used to be a full-time driver with Stone Brothers Racing. But uh, it didn't work out there for him as a full-time star. However, his relationship uh, with Ross and Jimmy Stone, the principals of uh, SBR, is such that... Uh, is back with the team in endurance mode. So another of the part-time drivers, and that creates uh, all sorts of havoc for SBR. We said uh, earlier, we talked earlier as we look at uh, the Surame Wines car number 39. New Zealanders Chris Pitha and Coulthard, a distant relative, Fabian Coulthard, distant relative of David Coulthard, the Red Bull Formula One driver. So the second team car, that was the car that uh, spun up in Griffin's Hello. Bend earlier in the race as we go back 
to our race leader, Mark Winterbottom. He's lapping in uh, two minute tens at the moment with uh, three quarters of a tank of fuel. And the fastest man on the circuit at the moment, fastest race lap, a 2.9 for Garth Panda. So despite that considerable off, two offs in fact for car number one, it uh, has retained its pace and no damage done. So while we're not going to see them uh, factoring in this race until at least after the next safety car, if there is indeed another safety car, at the end of the race, Rick Kelly and Garth Tander, there they are on screen, will still factor in this 161 lap race. Lap 46 at the moment. It's 40 years since the great rivalry between Ford and Holden was ignited, with uh, Ford winning the 1967 race here at Bathurst. And as he comes to the second sector split here, there's possibility of actually further improving it because his split to the end of the first sector was the fastest of the race. He might even get into the eights on this lap. So he is really pumping hard. So with someone hustling along this hard, it's probably a perfect opportunity to jump on board and have a listen and a look to what it's all about for a lap around here. position that was another 209 and if you tried that you would discover muscles in your body you never knew you had yeah. last three laps 9090 and then 93 just a safety tap of the pedal he's having to pump it up a bit though for turn two he pumped two or three times then to make sure that he had pedal pressure when he got to turn two the teams can now put a monitor a trace 
to measure the amount of brake master cylinder movement on the cars and that tells them what the pad conditions like and even the rotor condition to some extent because they get an idea of how much movement there is. I tell you what I was surprised with up at the top of the mountain going to Forest Elbow, Garth really hooking into the pedal and the brake pedal travelling quite a long way. Given that this is the 49th lap of 161, there's a lot ahead and a little bit of an unsettled move there from Mark Winterbottom. Wing Cup, the difference is 5.6 seconds. It's dropped. There's a few cars in between, the WPS car and also Glenford's racing car. So here comes second position. That's now dropped to 4.7 seconds, the difference. Third is Will Davison. Intercepted radio communication, guys, in car 16 between Craig Baird and Matt Teco Nielsen, who was telling Craig that his pace is very good. He's running low tens, but Craig simply wouldn't believe him. He said, you're joking me. But Matt certainly was not lying at all. He sits ninth on the road at the moment with pretty comparative pace. Richard Lyons is ahead, but of course he pitted earlier. So running some less fuel in the number 88 Vodafone car. Good pace here from Wind Cup. Last lap for him was a two minute 9.7 and that margin first to second is 4.7 seconds and Wind Cup again is showing this razor sharp concentration of just pounding away and continuing to gain pace and we're not seeing any mistakes, the car's straight on the road, no lock brakes, no issues and so for the third year in a row we're looking at great speed and there you can see on the boxes the graphic we've put to, up on screen you can see the sort of progress that he's been making relative to Mark Winterbottom in this Last four laps. He's just matured so much as the driver. Steck by Mountain Camp follows him down to Forest Elbow. Razor Sharp's probably the best description. I've heard of Jamie, he's such a relaxed team out of the car. Jamie and Craig, but when they're in, they are switched on intensely. If you flash the lights, and he's now got the lights on, and flash and really make your intentions clear, then uh, generally speaking, most blokes in these endurance races are pretty cooperative. But there's also some careful monitoring of the blue flags here this weekend. There were a couple of issues that arose from the last event at Sandown where there was a bit of aggravation about blue flags. Take a look at our own little race tracker here. Coming around the start and finish line, the green dot represents our lead car. That's Mark Winterbottom. The blue dot represents second. That's Jamie Wincup. The red dot is third of Will Davison. And the yellow dot is fourth of Todd Kelly. Just shows you the track position. So as the leader approaches turn two, and Jamie caught up now behind the triple one car. He's got past Michael Caruso. Jonathan Webb gives him room. And so that's good. He's clear of those. 4.6 seconds the margin. Winterbottom to Wind Cup last lap. 9.8 for Wind Cup. 10.0 for Winterbottom. And the other fellas that are quick at the moment are Davison and Kelly. Will Davison a, one, a 2 minute 9.5 and Todd Kelly a 2 minute 9.8 on the last lap. So as the fuel loads come down, quite a few people starting to show considerable pace. And the HRT crew all sitting there standing by, dressed and ready for action. Look like fighter pilots, ready for takeoff. Perhaps just a little bit bored. <laughs> you just cannot comprehend how long this weekend is, let alone this race day where they turn up at the circuit well before the sun comes up. Good news is they're not alone. Thousands of fans here. Drivers have to be on it early. The crews have to be on it early. And Wing Cup is right on it. Superb job getting past those guys. Head slides off, please. And uh, nice and smooth, mate. Great work. And you just see what the team there did for him. They just let him go. They gave him the instructions and then let him go. Go round them up, get past them. We'll speak to you when you've got the job done. And he did so. Car 16 of Craig Baird. And Andrew Jones, the BOC entry, are inside the top 10. Nine and 10 positions. Well, Steve Johnson, great start for you guys. You've been into the van, had your recovery. How are you holding up? Yeah, mate, I'm good. I've been in there and uh, had a bit of an adjustment, a little bit of an massage, shower, fresh set of overalls, and I'm right to go for the next stint. All right, do you know when that'll be yet, Steve? 
sure yet. We're probably looking at around uh, around lap 70, around 70, 72, somewhere around there. So, you know, you know, we're on track at the moment. I was just cruising along and just hanging in there behind Craig. Made one little mistake, which dropped dropped me back a little bit, but that was okay. I was talking to your dad before the race. He said your strategy is to be top three at around lap 132, and then just bring it home and go for it. You're on plan at the moment. Yeah, we're on plan, or uh, you know, with that little bit of luck that we had, um, you know, a little bit, a little bit ahead of plan. So, you know, Will's doing a great job. They're both gaining on uh, on winter bottom there, him and Wind Cup. So we'll just, um, mate, we'll just keep stroking it along the way it is, and uh, the car's in perfect condition, not a mark on it. So uh, apart from a little mirror up with Lounsey on the first lap, uh, but no, it's going good. Well, Steve, you've had your ups and downs this weekend, but when you've needed to, you've delivered, mate. Well done. Yeah, thanks, mate. Cheers. That explains the mirror that we raised early on, why it got folded back. Last lap for Winterbottom, he responded. It was a 9-4 wind cup because he's had to deal with traffic, lost a little bit of ground there. So there's the margin, 5.3 seconds between Mark Winterbottom and Jamie Wincup. Will Davison in third place. Dick Johnson racing the most successful, one of the most successful teams supercar history and Bathurst 1000 history. This team has been around longer than any other on the circuit. And uh, team principal and owner Dick Johnson came to fame here 27 years ago, hitting the rock at the top of the mountain that had uh, roll, rolled onto the circuit. And uh, he is now in his early 60s, handed the reins of uh, lead driver over to his son, Stephen. Uh, two drivers for this team over the course of the year as we see Will Davison the other driver in that team getting around uh, that lap traffic the WPS number 10 car that's now a lap down Will Davison and Stephen Johnson combining to uh, put together a fantastic race so far back with the championship leading car of Rick Kelly and Garth Tander Missing its headlight after the incident uh, in the early running. The spin-off on Conrad Strait entering the chase. There's two drivers, Rick Kelly and Garth Tander, have vastly different records here at Mount Panorama. They're both winners. Rick Kelly is uh, a twice winner, 2003 and 2004. But Garth Tander only has the one victory in the year. 2000 and since then he's had a run of disasters the last two years for Garth Tander. Haven't seen him go, go past lap number one so regardless of what happens from here on in he's got a much better race happening. Rick Kelly rarely out of the top ten and out of the top five over the last four or five years runner up last year. Looking at car number 34 from Gary Rogers Motorsport, that's the second team entry of Cameron McLean and Greg Ritter. The car now into the pits because of a trip over the sand earlier in the event. They are on a different strategy. They stopped on lap 20, so this is their uh, second stop and their first scheduled stop of the event. It's now lap 52, so they've gone 32 laps without a stop. That's pretty good fuel economy. As we see Cameron McLean getting out of the car and his teammate Greg Ritter hopping in. It's not what the team would like to have done to have the trip over the grass through the sand early in the race, but at least it's put their two cars on vastly different strategies, so we won't see the lead car being held up in the pits. Greg Ritter heading back out now, back into the race. Safety car will be deployed here. 
So uh, this was a great run from Andrew to that point. Here they are. And uh, he was in 10th position and pressuring Craig Baird in car 16. Great disappointment for Team BOC. Tough weekend. He started right up the top of the mountain and uh, Bradley Jones just can't believe it. Big, big damage to the other car. Very costly weekend. And especially when you're running so well. So. Andrew was doing a great job. We got word that he had trouble at the top of the mountain, so he's nursed it all the way down and take a look. That's a massive amount of fuel, as in petrol, powering this. And uh, I reckon that an injector's jumped out or a rail's broken or something and it's just ignited and it's, uh, it's just heaving oh. fuel in there. By now it's really got hold. And he, he won't be able to see. Look inside the car, just choked with smoke. He's gone down the left-hand side, tried to find a marshalling point. Ripped through the paintwork on the front of the car. It's still going. Yeah. Stone Brothers engine in this car. They're about a hundred thousand dollar device, and the fireys are on the job. And Andrew's in there pitching in. And I understand that on the line down in the pit lane at the moment, we've got Mark Scafie there. Scafie. Yeah, got your crumper. How's your day been so far? It was a vigorous opening stint. Actually, we might just come back to that. We'll keep an eye on this for the moment, MS. But uh, not a good situation when you see a car getting damaged like this expensive and the lead car is in. Yeah, Mark Winterbottom has taken the opportunity to bring car number six in. Sorry about that, Scafie. We just had to uh, make sure we got that car number 12 cleaned up. You still with us, mate? Yeah, I've got you, Matty. How was your first sector, your first segment? Uh, yeah, look, not too bad. Uh, I wasn't particularly happy in the slow speed stuff. Uh, the cutting and at Forest Elbow, the car was really ordinary, so uh, a lot too much understeer. And when the car's like that, it's too hard to drive. The consistency's not not good enough. And, uh, you know, based on uh, our, our overall speed, I thought our overall speed was probably a bit better than Steve's, but in a couple of sections, I struggled. Did you make any changes to the car between uh, stints there? Did you a little, little roll centre adjustment or a change to the incoming tyre pressures? Yeah, both. So uh, tyre pressures and uh, and rear roll centre. So uh, just try to sharpen it up, Crompo, because uh, it's just pushy pretty much everywhere. And, you know, it's just too easy to make a mistake. I mean, you could do a 9.3, but the next lap would be a 9.7 or 9.8, because if you miss the groove, yeah. you just can't get the front of the car in, mate. I saw you have a bit of a battle on your hands at Forest Elbow. At one point, you pinched the front left and couldn't get the nose down where you wanted it. Yeah, not good. I mean, uh, I had a bit of a dive at Steve there once and and then another lap. Uh, I tried 44 different lines and couldn't uh, <laughs> couldn't get the car in there properly. So uh, anyway, if we've got any trail break, it just pushes, uh, pushes wide. Scafie, can you just clarify for us, when you jumped out on lap 32 and Toddler jumped in, you guys were second. By the time we sort of looked down, look up, did the uh, once around the commentary box, Todd had dropped back a few spots and we couldn't get a grip on it. What happened there? Well, what we what actually went wrong is um, there's been a reaction in the fuel rig to the fuel and it's actually hurt the seal at the coupling and it's uh, decreased the diameter of the hose. So we've just picked up on the, f the flow rate of that fuel rig really being knocked around. I mean, it took us almost 10 seconds longer than it would normally. Really? So what, it was a 35, 40 second dump to get the fuel in? Yeah, exactly. Almost, almost exactly 10 seconds too long. Hell. All right, so that, that'll be the last time that one gets used, Crump. Exactly. I reckon you might be right. <laughs> I know you'll have your race face on. Thanks for talking to us, Mark, and good luck for the remainder of the day. Thanks, guys. Mark Scaife joining us there as uh, these guys take advantage of the safety car conditions with Team BOC's car number 12 at the end of the chase being put out. There it is. Andrew Jones out of the car. They've managed to... Uh, dampen the fire which is the best news Brad it's just been the worst weekend what's Andrew said on the radio um, well he was dropped on a seven cylinders and he was uh, he's trying pretty hard to um, to work out what exactly was going on obviously from the shots we could see that the, the team BOC car was on fire and she's very very disappointing he had a really good turn of speed I felt you know he called Beto and he was sort of sitting there but he had enough pace to run just at the back, maybe the back of the top five. So really, really disappointing for the team. I'd love to see you at Indy then. Well, yeah, you know, this is a tough race. You come here every year and you try and put your best foot forward. And, you know, we've got one laying in the corner of the shed already and to have another one out so early is, is pretty tough. I really thought that we were in a position where we could get into the top five today. Well, I'll go back to Aubrey. They will regroup, no doubt about that, because they're fighters at Team BOC. We'll take a break from the mountain, the super cheap auto. Bathurst 1000. Cars behind the safety car now, and race leader is the first car in that daisy chain there, Mark Whittabottom. 
having pitted, pitted. So Jamie Wincup assumes the race lead. And uh, is that bright uh, red Daglo car behind the black Chrysler safety car. Heading down Conrod Strait. A whisker over one kilometre. Then the cars enter Caltex, uh, what was called Caltex Chase, uh, built 20 years ago. Previously, Conrod Strait went, uh, was completely straight, but then in 1987, due to uh, the increased speeds, they introduced, uh, they built the chase section there, so the kink right instantly creating the fastest corner in Australian motorsport. So it's a right, left, right sequence for the chase. Then we head down to the corner, traditionally known as Murray's Corner. So it's the final, final corner before they head on to the pit straight. There's pit entry. Expect to see a couple of cars take advantage of this safety car indeed. Uh, there's one into the pits now to be able to uh, refuel. That's car 16, Craig Baird at the wheel. Car 16 last stopped on lap 33. Now lap completing lap 55. So he'll hand back to Paul Radisic, former World Cup touring car champion. And Toll HSV will take advantage of pitting without the pressure of the race uh, being on in anger in green flag conditions. Vision there from flight camp. Two flight camps being used during our telecast. One on pit straight, the other one heading down the mountain. So a full change now for car 16. Two Kiwis, Radisic and Baird in that car. Brake pad change. So they're completing the compulsory pad change for this car. Get it out of the way early on. Pump the pedal, pump the pedal. So clearly a problem there for car 16 with the pad change. Leading the brakes. Crew chief giving uh, some instructions on how to solve this problem. driver complaint was we're not getting a brake pedal so they're opening the bleed nipple on the caliper and what they do is squeeze the pedal get fluid to run through the hydraulic lines and then they look for aerated bubbles to come down those clear tubes and into the bottle and uh, once they don't see any bubbles they'll reseal the system and they have been in here, Neil, a monumental amount of time. Uh, the stop before that, Garth Tander, didn't go all that smoothly either. We missed the marks and almost the refuelling rig together. Yeah, yeah, no break. So uh, just went straight through and cleaned the boys up, which is a bit of a problem. But, um, you know, we're just going to try and battle through this stint and then we'll um, see what we can do in the next stop, whether we can bleed the brakes and uh, try and get a brake pedal back because, it's um, yeah, there's no real brakes out there at the moment. We saw the foot cam. The pedal looked really, really long. Both engineers, you know, Teco and also Eric Bent are looking at each other, just shaking heads. Yeah, maybe that's why we got quickest lap because it got no brakes. But, um, yeah, it was... Um, the pedal's really long and as long as you try and pump it a bit, you get a little bit of brakes, but... Um, you know, we can't go through the whole race like that, so we're going to have to uh, we're going to have to look at that. They've just done the 16 car and stayed on the lead lap, bleeding, bleeding the brakes, so uh, we'll probably do that next off for us. Well, we had a look at that tyre also. You had a little bit of chase before you got kicked up a little bit. The, the, uh, some, some rubbish there. Thought we might have flat-spotted it. It was amazing. A little bit of damage, and it lasted 20-odd laps. 
Yeah, that had a small flat spot on it, but certainly nothing that was going to be a problem. And um, I was more concerned about the tyre smoke and the guards rubbing than anything else. But, um, you know, we survived that stint and we'll, uh, we'll survive this one, next one, and we'll fix the car up. Still a long way to go. We'll get back in it. Thanks, Ken. Righto. The thing that they were manipulating on the car just a moment ago in that pit stop were what's described as the bleed nipples on the brake calibers. We've got those here, and I'll just highlight them for you. It's a little gold item. We can just highlight that. It's just threaded into the caliper and it's part of the oil way system in that caliper and they loosen that off and uh, they run the clear plastic hose over the top of it and there's a couple of them there and they pump the pedal until they can squeeze air out of the system and topping up brake fluid at the same time and uh, when they've got pressure they seal it and off they go again. Speaking of going again that's exactly what's about to happen. WPS Chrysler safety car will pull away because the lights are off. We'll get set for a restart. Here's something to consider, Neil. Still more than 100 laps to go. <laughs> That's right. And you have to always bear that in mind with racing here, that uh, it's a long, hard day. Off it goes. We're underway again. Jamie Winkup first on the road. Will Davison at second. There he is, car 17. The triple one car of Jonathan Webb is in there as well. Traffic all around these lead drivers. So this means we've got a split strategy here. Winkup and Lowndes, Davison, Todd Kelly, Mark Scaife, those guys running on, whereas Car number six, Richards Winterbottom, they chose to bring that car into the safety car. We'll see how that plays out. We'll explain it in further detail shortly. Green flags being waved at each corner marshal sector, signalling that they can get back on with racing after the safety car intervention for Andrew Jones down in the chase. In this period, a little bit of temperature and a little bit of pressure from the tyres. The brakes cool out a little bit. You've got to be just a bit careful when you get back on with it that you don't reset your mind back to full race performance and suddenly ask a little bit too much of the car. All of a sudden, you lock a brake, damage a tyre. Just vulnerable for that first half, three quarters of a lap until everything normalises again. There's Greg Murphy. 10th position as we track him. The Steg Bar Mountain Camp through the trees. Over the crowds that are perched high on the mountain. Luke Yildon is still in car number nine. Remember car six, winter bottom, came in again under safety car conditions on lap 54. On the road, they are sixth. But I'm corrected, they're high up, and here's a big moment at the end of the chase exactly for the Team Kiwi car. Exactly what I was talking about. Now, the interesting thing here is just what impact these varied strategies have on everybody. I think at this point in time, it puts up uh, Richards in Winterbottom in a pretty good position. Seeing a replay here will show, look how he gets caught on the right hand side of the track there, possibly a little bit of impact with the Jim Beam racing car and John McIntyre uh, rescues what could have been a pretty nasty situation given the speed of course. Todd Kelly now, he's in third position on the track. Lights are on, still on car number two. Jamie Wincup has control of this race on the road. There he goes. That's Will Davison. There's Todd Kelly. David Bernard up in the top four. Then it's Dean Canto. Then it's Mark Winterbottom. Inside the top ten. We also have Adam Macro, Luke Yulden, Greg Murphy and Andrew Thompson.
Mark Scaife explaining the situation for us as to what happened with the HRT Commodore. Extraordinary pro problem with the uh, amount of fuel being pumped into that car. And here's a good look of David Bernard. In pit lane, we've got uh, Jason Richards on the line. And Tasman Motorsport. You got us, Jace? I've got you loud and clear, Matty. How are you sitting? How are you feeling? Oh, look, uh, it's actually um, come quite good for us in the race. The car's uh, really working well. We had great speed out there in my stint, and, uh, you know, Murph's doing a fantastic job, as he always does around here. So, you know, you know it's a long way to go, though. <laughs> you know what? It's the most said thing up and down pit, pit lane at the moment. It's a long way to go. Look, at the start here, before you uh, guys got underway, you really had a debate over how to go with this car. What was the compromise? How did you sort it? Uh, look, I, I have to say, the, the, the guys left to me here were very nervous, and uh, but they've, they've turned it up and they've given us a fantastic car. It wasn't, didn't have very, any good, well, had no ride quality during qualifying and the shootout and uh, in all practice, and we managed to, to tune the dampers in at the last minute, so we, uh, we're we pretty happy how it's going. We had a tyre fail on me on this stint, so we've come in to uh, replace it a left rear. Jason, uh, you know what it takes to be competitive and, uh, and fast around here. Is this a car that you can now comfortably hustle all the way to the end and keep up the kind of intensity that you know that you had, say, for example, a couple of years ago? I think so, Neil. You know, I jumped in the car and, and instantly was doing nine, nine, mid nines uh, on a full tank, and uh, you know I think that's a, that's a fast race car. And unfortunately, I got held behind the David Bernard car. But uh, look, we've got great pace, and I think uh, between Murph and I, we should be able to get home in, in, a, in a good spot. Well, you took the opportunity to grab a stop there under safety car, and together with car number six, Richards and Winterbottom, who you've done the same thing. And on our pit smart. Uh, computer projections that looks as though it's going to put you in pretty good shape at the moment because we expect those that haven't stopped to come in anywhere between about laps, laps 64 and 68 people like Wind Cup Davis and Kelly Bernard and so on so the road should all open up in front of you shortly you know you have to reverse engineer this race as you know Cromley and uh, you know the boys have done a cool a good strategy I think uh, we're sitting in a, a good position and as you say you know as soon as the other guys dive into the pits we're, we're on track now to get home with no problems at all What's the plan for the rest, Jase? Mate, uh, I'd like to sit back and watch Murph uh, win <laughs> Bathurst again. What, what do you reckon? <laughs> <laughs> it's a happy ending, isn't it? You enjoy it, mate. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, and don't mention the rugby. OK, we won't. See you, mate. As long as you don't mention ours. The Kiwi connection, as you mentioned, on our PitSmart computer, Neil. It's crunched the numbers and it is predicting that when those uh, pit stops take place for the other lead cars, just keep my eyes there on uh, car number 25, which was in a spot of bother. When they pit in, what, 10 laps or so? Well, or no, I, even less. The fuel window closes based on the margin they got out of their car in the first stint for Jamie Whitcup at uh, lap 70. And uh, they're on their 60th lap now, so 10 laps to run for him. But remember, they had astonishing fuel economy. You look further afield, say, for example, car number 17, and uh, those blokes, their fuel window closes at lap 68. They're in the window now, incidentally. They can come in and stop green, but they probably want to play it longer. You know, 10 laps, 9 laps around here, still a long period of time. You might just wait and see what happens. But on the current strategy, I think that both cars 6 and 51, Richards Winterbottom and Murphy Richards, have uh, played a good card there in grabbing some fuel it also means later on in the day, there's a point in time where they need to stand still for less time to be able to put fuel in to get them to the end. It's a bit complicated, all this stuff. You just have to trust me on this one. You're on board with that, a macro. We're taking a look at Greg Murphy, and just before that saw a good shot of Jack Perkins putting a move, an easy move, in fact, on Paul Wheel. He goes from 13th up to 12th. This is 7th versus 8th. Oh. Car 10's copying a black flag and they've been hustling, asking Michael Caruso to get out of the way and let cars go by. The race director has decided he's had enough. Michael Caruso will get a pit lane drive through penalty for not observing the blue flag. And they clarified the race director's and race control interpretation of this at the driver's briefing and the... Uh, team manager's briefing, I should say, earlier in the week as well. And uh, there goes Russell. Ooh, that's a
it's tricky when you go side by side down there. And uh, there's going to be a much closer scrutiny this weekend. Once you get within, if you're about to be lapped. And, the car is one off into pit lane here, man. and if you're the next lap, it might go the next lap, he's got a black flag. And if you're within a two to three second tolerance, race control will concentrate very carefully on you. And if you do not observe that blue flag as shown by the volunteer marshals around the circuit, you will get gonged. So Caruso gives way. He's in the WPS entry. That was car number one shooting by of Rick Kelly. There he is, Michael Caruso. Luke Yildon is still behind the wheel of the Caltex Racing car number nine. That was him putting the pressure on Greg Murphy, who's in front of him. Up we come, double eight, Alan Simonson. Car number two, Todd Kelly, who's third at the moment. The word is they're going to run pretty aggressively on fuel strategy with that car, and they'll run it till it coughs, which means they'll be into the what's described as the fuel collector, where there's some reserve fuel. The maximum capacity for the collector in the boot of the car is eight litres, as mandated by the the rules what was that and michael caruso being told by his crew to pit this lap in the wps 10 car and uh, i haven't heard an acknowledgement yet maybe they've got a comms problem there but uh, that aggressively running to the end of the fuel window for car number two will be at lap number 67 on our computer and fastest second sector split for jamie wincup in the lead of the race at the moment All happens here at once, doesn't it? Always does. Uh, he's really coasting here at the moment, Michael. is just getting out of everyone's way, but uh, he can stay fully up the pace. He just needs to pull off the race line here and there and let the key cars go. But uh, a bit of a glitch there in communications, I'd say. Here's the race leader. This should be a pretty good time. Around at the completion of this lap. It's a 2.09 flat. That's the fastest lap of the race. 2.09.0009. Tell you what, that's very quick, Matthew. Cloud cover here today. Nice conditions to do good lap speed, but that is very quick. Michael Caruso not actually hearing the word. Neil spot on. A comms problem over the top of the hill. I'll have to try and get him down, Conrad. Yeah, however, uh, there is a flag which he should have seen, and he has because he's now in the pit lane, and uh, he'll do the drive through. I could see that his radio was connected on that shot from the front. You can see it was actually plugged in. But uh, maybe his earpieces have uncoupled under his helmet or there's some other drama with the radio, and that often happens here. Well, he followed the instructions, though. The flags around the course. They've got to confirm when he got into pit lane, so smart thinking from Michael Caruso. At the end of the day, everybody's come out of that. Unscathed. Stone Brothers Racing, Caltex Ford of Luke Yildon and Russell Ingle. Two main strategies playing out in the super cheap auto Bathurst 1000. There are the cars that pitted at the end or during the last safety car period, uh, approximately lap 54 and 55. Those cars include the pole sitter, Mark Winterbottom, Stephen Richards, the car of Greg Murphy and Jason Richards, that's car number 51, and both Toll HSV dealer team cars. Then the second strategy are those that will have to stop within the next uh, seven or eight laps. So two key strategies. We'll see how it all pans out at the end of the day as we see a move now around the Jason Bright car for Tasman Motorsports lead vehicle number 51. That's the shot from Greg Murphy. He moves now up into seventh position. He's got around the number 25 machine of Adam Macro and Jason Bright. Jason Bright, the team principal and lead driver of Brightec Motorsport, moved from Ford Performance Racing at the end of the 2006 season. Macro now coming under attack from Luke Gilden and car number nine. Stone Brothers Racing Machine and behind them 
is uh, Alan Simonson, car 88, the second of the team Vodafone Triple Eight machines. Cars heading up into the section of track uh, called the cutting for obvious reasons, uh, carved out of uh, the uh, Mount Panorama. Heading over Reed Park now. Big roller coaster ride starts at this point through Sulman Park over the rise into McPhilmy Park. And after the property owner who donated that parcel of land uh, over 70 years ago, in fact, the Mount Panorama Racing Circuit will celebrate its 70th birthday next year. So, all sorts of celebrations are currently being hatched that uh, monumental event. The circuit built during the Depression as an unemployment relief project and the uh, Mayor pulled a bit of a swifty over the uh, Australian Government uh, saying he wanted to build a tourist drive around Mount Panorama Bathurst uh, but all along, so the story goes, he had in mind to build uh, a race circuit and instructed the engineers to build the corners to uh, benefit the race cars. So fantastic story there, all part of the folklore of Mount Panorama as Luke Gilden brings in number nine Stone Brothers Racing Falcon about to hand over to lead driver in that car, Russell Ingle. So the first of the cars on that second strategy to pit. And uh, we'll see the charge of the light brigade for more, many more cars over the next few laps. Only got 29. instructions there to Russell. They only got 29 laps out of that last stint for these guys. They mustn't have got all their fuel last time. I'm not quite sure. It's a, it's a fairly short stint for them. And uh, 33, car number 33, Lee Holdsworth, Dean Canto, Canto at the wheel at the moment, being shown the bad sportsmanship flag for blocking Mark Winterbottom. Russell's going to need to flick that little light off there because it's now the A driver in. So Ingle is in, Yulden is out. Russell resets himself. Let's run you through some of the highlights of the race so far. Well, the low light for Cam McConville didn't even make it to the start line. Stephen Richards and Scaife. Terrific battle in the opening segment. Richards would win that battle right off to the driver change. An amazingly frightening moment for Rick Kelly and Craig Lowndes for that matter. By this stage, Rick Kelly's tyre had just given way and it was a great escape. Meanwhile, his partner would jump in the car, Garth Tander, they taped it all up and effectively found trouble at the same spot and probably because of the dirt that was put on there. And Team VOC copped another pounding, this one a fiery one. Andrew Jones inside the top 10 before the BOC Falcon caught on fire. He jumped out and parked the car at the end of the chase. They cannot believe it. They started here with two cars. They leave here without getting to the finish line of both of them. And Shane Van Gisbergen and John McIntyre with McIntyre behind the wheel had it off at the chase as well. Will Davison has posted a 2.0894, the fastest time of the race. He's in second position on the road. He's been trading some pretty sexy times with Jamie Wincup. I'll run you through the order at the moment. It is Wincup first on track. Davison second, then Todd Kelly. David Bernard is fourth. Dean Canto, we can see in car 33, and Mark Winterbottom. And Bernard will come in this lap as well, Matthew, and thinking more about strategy cars, 651 and one, taking advantage of fuel in that safety car period around lap 54. Everybody's got three stops to do to get to the end of the race. Those fellas are hedging. 
even though in the short term it's going to help their cause, that later in the day there may be some more yellow intervention because their third stop at the moment is going to come in the 150s period. Of course, that's not what you want in a 161 lap race. Chances are, though, we will get some more yellow. So look for Bernard to peel off here in car four. Bad sportsmanship flag has been shown to Dean Cando for holding up car number five and the two of them now come in so Bernard and Canto together Lee Holdsworth on standby here I just spoke to James Small the engineer for car number 33 they're going to do their brake pad change this is within the window and I coyly asked is this number one of one he said maybe 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 Canto peeling off now just from behind David Bernard who'll hand this car back to James Courtney you did make a note there Neil about Russell Ingalls car being in early that effectively now separates the two Stone Brothers cars from the problem that they had at that first pit stop when they came in together on the same lap. And that's probably the major reason, I think, Aaron, that they just don't want two cars in together as David now leaps out, James about to climb on board. Can't have them nose to tail or someone's going to get burnt. So they short stinted the other car. Caliber pliers being used to squeeze those pistons back into a Brembo brake caliber, caliber is the chosen one for Stone Brothers. A lot of meat burned off those brake pads that dropped out on the road there. Indicating they want him to pump up and pressure that pedal. Talking up the wheel, he's not ready. He's not ready. They dropped it too soon. Okay, blend in with this car, behind this car, you're all clear. Pump that pedal for James. Keep pumping and just let it know. Just keep pumping that pedal. It was hardly anything, wasn't it? But he just wasn't ready to drop the car. Yeah, I think he just lost a spot to 33 there, so Holdsworth actually gained a spot as a result of dropping the car a moment too early. We'll see it here, watch this. Yeah. Yep. yeah, and he hadn't raised his hand at that point, so the car controller thought that the car was done. It wasn't. They had to pick it back up again, and the uh, air hose coupling for that is on the B pillar on the left-hand side. That's the second pillar down the left side of the car. James Courtney takes it out over the top of the mountain. Another fastest lap time by Jamie Winkup at the other end. 208.738. Here comes Todd Kelly. And, uh, so they have run it right to the end of that fuel window that I spoke about before on the 67th lap. An 8.7 for Jamie Winkup. And it's Mark Scaife standing by to pop in. Caliper pliers and pads tell me that they're going to do a pad change inside that compulsory pit stop window. Look how slippery the concrete is by comparison to the asphalt. Releasing the bridge behind the caliper, squeezing back those pistons, hydraulically controlled. They use an AP racing brake caliper on their car. Out come the used pads. By getting the pistons back, there's plenty of space to get the full width brake pads back in. Wheel on, torqued up. Ask the driver to pressure the pedal. Get the pedal mate. Robbie Starr says pressure it. Driver assistant ooh, cops the door for his trouble. Get a pedal, mate. Get a pedal. Clear to go. Clear to go. He'll pump it all the way out. Lot to do, isn't there? About the unusual part of that stop was that uh, the drivers weren't in spot. Scafie was probably the last one in there by the, by the time they sort of dropped it. A lot of people have been throwing pads at these cars early to keep those pistons not as far out of the barrels in the caliper, boys. You would have noticed during the SBR stops, either at Ingle and Courtney, a long time to get those pistons back and tough work. That is one of the pads that's come off. They've lasted some 65-odd laps. It's the first pad change. Have a look at it. Yeah, this they're... is a brand newie. I was about to say, I reckon they've got through about half the pad. That's good stuff. Thanks, mate. Gives us a great idea of how much material is being used. And that'll give the engineers in there, they'll measure that up very accurately and that'll give them an idea as to how they want to deal with this back end of the race. And uh, we're only on lap 67. When I say back end, there's a lot of it to come. On board with Mark Winterbottom. Who has now been released from that battle that he was tangled up in and so he's free to get on and make some pace now. He was tangled up with four and 33. Then pitting has helped his cause. Remember, he came in lap 54. So, so Jamie he's Winkup. fueled to run. I'm sorry, Matthew, fueled to run now until lap 89. Winkup goes already through. Davison's already got through. Now Winterbottom goes back up to third position. But here is car 17. 
So Will Davison has pulled in. Stephen Johnson standing by. brake calipers for this car. So we're seeing lots of different approaches in the brakes of the cars. Next year that changes. It's an Alcon control yeah, caliper. As well as rotor. Fire it up again. Yeah. So Stephen Johnson rejoins the race. They're all looking very good in terms of pad changes, though, aren't they? And everybody I spoke to last night shrugged their shoulders at the notion of pad change. It doesn't really bother them. The one that's got them slightly concerned is having to change front rotors. And the rotors that I've seen so far don't look too bad. It's the 11 car of Kane Scott and Marcus Marshall. There was a problem with the Jim Beam 17 car, guys. I just spoke to Will Davison quickly as he stepped out. The car didn't go on the automatic switch to the reserve fuel tank. He had to flick the switch manually. So he cost himself two seconds at the top of the mountain. That's two seconds they've given away to Jamie Winker. Who's pulling away and pulling away while all this is going on. John Bow and Jonathan oh, Webb. Oh, oh dear. Door seals. And, then, and away it goes and you keep on tugging it. It goes all the way around the door frame. Finally got it clear. Be a bit breezy in there, but I don't think that's going to be a problem. Unless it rains. <laughs> well, they collected a snake along the way. You're on board with James Courtney. That's been done too up here. Wind Cup's got a 7.2 second lead as we take a breath and have a think about this car race now. Two minute 9.6 last lap for Wind Cup. Last lap for Winterbottom was a two minute 8.9, so he's been well and truly released. 14 and a half seconds, the corrected order now between Wind Cup and Winterbottom. Murphy up to third. So as we talked about earlier on, 10, 15 minutes ago, you're going to see car six and 51 easing up to the, uh, to the top of this field as others peel off. the Jim Beam racer of Alex Davison and Andrew Thompson. They go back on the wheel. Driver change complete. Fuel going in, going in, finished. It's just to refill the collector. They put the switch on just to bring fuel back into that swirl pot in the boot of the car. Changing the CPS light and resetting the fuel. There's a button on the steering wheel and that resets on the dash of the car and resets on the telemetry back in the pit bunker so they can see the number of litres burnt. But most people now are measuring their fuel by weight, not by litres. It's the most accurate way of determining. Now here is our race tracking. And it gives you an idea of where these two cars are relative to each other. The green dot of Jamie Winkup is about to complete another lap. And you'll see Winterbottom on our race tracker represented by the blue dot. I'll tell you what that represents in terms of time. He comes around in the last turn. Last time around it was 14 and a half seconds, the difference. This time around, it's 14 and a half seconds still. Greg Murphy in third position in car 51. Fourth now, Alan Simonson in car double eight. Fifth on the road, Nathan Pretty in car 22. Sixth is Paul Wheel in car 20. Seventh is Baird in 16. Eighth is Max Wilson. Then it's Rick Kelly and Owen Kelly making up our top 10. Team Vodafone look on with Craig Lowndes. Ready to go. So Jamie Winkup jumped in on lap 36. We're now up to lap 70. 
He's done a good job, hasn't he now? Yeah, he's rock solid in these endurance races. He really does a very, very good job. And uh, time and again, we see it just tremendous concentration, great accuracy. I was about to say his fuel to lap 70, so it's in. And car number 22 is coming in as well, so that's... Car number 4, this is car 888, driver, tyres and fuel. So Craig will now make his way out into the lane. Everybody positioned at the markings that they have out there. Jamie will peel off and confirm. They can see it on TV down there anyway. He'll hustle it across these curbs as quick as he can. And they've rehearsed this all week. And they get to the control line that starts about there. And they need to be doing 40 k's first gear. Pit lane speed limiter engaged. The car coughs and splutters. Very low throttle percentage in here. Too much throttle and it pops and bangs and you can actually get a spit back through the manifold and the butterflies and up through the trumpets and set fire to the air box. And that's happened in the past too. Lounge is there. It's an unceremonious departure for Wing Cup, especially after such a good job. So he grabs the crutch strap, grabs the waist belts, clips them up. Guys, car 22 coming in, not only for pads, it's for a rotor change as well. The first in pit lane to do it. Got to be Nathan Pretty. And part of that reasoning will be to just have a look for the benefit of car 2. And they'll just see what they're dealing with there. So we'll keep an eye on this as Triple Eight's processed and departs. It's the normal stop for the first part, but not this bit. There you go. That's that quick release mechanism that we focused on earlier in the day. They just cock it sideways, slide it into the caliper, then just locate it. There's a little lug to make sure it's positioned right. It was a little bit slow getting on. You've got to be a bit careful of the different temperature growth between steel and aluminium. But there's not a problem for them. How good's that? Yeah, that's very efficient. Now they'll have a look at those rotors and make sure they've got a brake pedal. 34 seconds and so that's a good 20 to 30 seconds quicker than those who've got to use the conventional method of uh, plucking the rotor out or at least releasing the caliper before they can do it. Just witnessed something pretty incredible. Yeah. And done effectively at the end with ease. And they just came uh, hot from the oven, fresh. <laughs> Nothing beats a bit of force down there though, does it? Had to give it a slam to get it in, <laughs> just in case. So Craig Lowndes is back. Car 22, the first of the vehicles in the race to make a brake loader change. And anyone uh, who's been charged two hours or more labour time at their local garage or mechanic to have that work done should have a chat to that mechanic and see if they can renegotiate the rate for a quicker job sole remaining super cheap auto number 20 car of Paul Dumbrell and Paul Wheel now makes its second stop. No rush in the pit there. Hits its marks perfectly. Paul Wheel gets out of the car. Paul Dumbrell, the full-time driver, gets back in for the third stint of the race for car number 20. Paul Wheel, the son of the team owner Keys Wheel. Wheel ran in the championship full time, elected to step out of full time driving two or three years ago to concentrate uh, on his business com commitments. And number 20 car gets back in the race, no fuss. Thankfully for that team, uh, this car running extremely well, pitted for fifth position back in the race after a swift stop.
when he pulled Umbrell after that stop, uh, merges back uh, behind the bulk of the field there, will slot in to position 18. So uh, a good launching pad for number 20 for the rest of the race. Paul Will, uh, part of the driving combination that last year uh, came up with a top six finish. So a man who knows how to get a car back home in the grueling Bathurst 1000. Here's the all international crew of Alan Simonson and Richard Lyons. That car now up to third position. Simonson, the day behind the wheel at the moment. Well travelled. Well travelled as Alan Simonson competed the Le Mans 24 hour race. So two classic endurance events on World Motorsports calendar for this driver in the course of the year. The top 10, Mark Winterbottom, Greg Murphy, Alan Simonson, Craig Baird, Max Wilson, Rick Kelly, Owen Kelly. No relation is Owen Kelly from Ford Performance Racing to uh, Rick Kelly of Toll HSV, Mark Noski, Tony Dalberto in the Autobahn car, and uh, Craig Lowndes, one of the big four. We saw that pit stop with Wind Cup handing over to Lowndes just uh, a minute or two ago. So Lowndes back uh, in the top 10 with a number of cars yet to pit. He's in 10th position. Just shows you what goes on throughout uh, the course of the day. <laughs> They're not going to get very far. What on earth is going on down there? I don't know. They mustn't be busy enough. It's a good question, what is going on down here? Neil, you showed us first the Toll Rotor Oven. I went to HRT and saw the wall oven with rotors sitting in it, trying to keep them warm to, to prevent some of that heat shock. Have a look what super cheap auto I've done. Not an oven, a fry pan with a lid that says caution hot. It's turned up to full ball, but it can only heat them to about 100 degrees. Well, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. Speaking of rotors, Ford Performance Racing are quite happy with the performance of the brake so far. In about 15 laps, they'll bring Mark Winterbottom in and put Stephen Richards into the car now. They won't be doing rotors at that point. They will be changing brake pads. All right, Mark, thank you. We might stay down in uh, pit lane while we take a look at Alan Simonson in car double eight. Now we go to the front of the pack with Mark Winterbottom back in control of the race in car six. I understand we've got Jamie Winkup on the line. You got us, Jamie? Hi, hi Matty, how are you? I'm sensational, mate. Probably feeling as good as you are because you did a really good segment there, mate. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. The, uh, the car's handling fantastic and uh, we've got no mechanical failures and everything's running smoothly at the moment. But as we all know, I'm looking at the clock with four and a half hours to go. So, uh, yeah, we've still got a long way. Jamie, Neil here, very quick uh, opening couple of stints in the race. Lots of people in nines and low tens, definitely quicker than last year. Yeah, hi Neil, uh, you're exactly right, the uh, the pace is pretty fast out there. Uh, personally, I think we're probably going a little too fast, but um, Mark Dutton, my engineer, he calls the shots and he, he tells me what time to do, so uh, yeah, he wants us to go quick at this stage for some reason. Uh, go. Sorry mate, do you feel that's at the expense of anything? Is it hurting tyres or in particular brakes and fuel consumption? Oh, of course a little bit. You know, I'm, uh, I'm fully confident in the car that's going to do the distance, but uh, the harder you push, the, the harder you use your brakes, which are a, a semi-issue for most of the teams, uh, tyres and all the rest of the gear. So, um, you know, so far so good, but uh, the, heat's, the heat is on. I wouldn't be surprised if some cars don't make it. I have to say, mate, you do an awesome job when it comes to these endurance races. The last couple of years at Bathurst, then again at Sandown the other day. You love this stuff, don't you? <laughs> Mate, I just do my best. Uh, I've still got another stint, so I'm not going to get too carried away. But uh, I love, uh, love Sandown. I, I love Bathurst. So I just get in and go as fast as I can. And a lot of what a lot of the viewers don't know at home is it's, a, it's an economy race as well. So we're uh, we're a couple of laps up on uh, on our opposition in economy. So 
That doesn't mean we're going to uh, have a, 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 a lesser stop. It just means that uh, if it comes crunch time at the end, uh, you know, we, we won't take as long in the pits in that final segment. We may be able to leapfrog a few people. Exactly, and our PitSmart computer represents that as well. We've got you in a very handy position when it all starts to shuffle down. Before I let you go, while Craig's in the car, and while you're in the car, you're very composed. How are you out of the car for this little moment sitting around? Uh, I'm very relaxed, uh, exactly like I was last year. I know Craig gives it 110% every time, and got full faith in him so uh, yeah very relaxed I'm going to uh, going to go change clothes and have a bit to eat and get ready for the next stint. Have a break Jamie thank you and well done. Thanks Matty thanks Neil. See you mate. He's a good operator isn't he Jamie Wincup and uh, he's right you don't want to get too keen too cocky too soon but gee his last couple of years up here have been very very good and uh, Clowns having a bit of trouble here rounding up Delberto who's had to end up on the dirty line to make some space in the 55 Autobahn entry in the end he gets by and uh, that gives Lowndes a, a clear run now. Incidentally the fastest second sector split of the day for Mark Winterbottom at 126.98 and so he looks like lowering the 2 minute 8.9 that he did earlier. We've been going since 7 o'clock local time this morning. You hungry Cromley? Uh, yes. What do you feel like? Rotors or sausage rolls <laughs> or pads? I'll go the sausage roll, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you learn it, Dicks. <laughs> make the most uh, yeah. of what you got. Stick bar, you, mountain camp. I, you get sharp on them. I, I tell you, make them leap to their feet down there. You go down there and scream and shout and tell them a car's coming in. They won't be playing with sausage rolls then. Two minute 8.7 for Mark Winterbottom that last lap. I tell you what, I'm so hungry. Even the rotors would have been nice. And uh, that's a very, very good time for uh -oh, Winterbottom. Uh oh, here's trouble for. Absolutely dangerous. Yeah, well, he's yeah, been we'll there before. Now, mate. Now. We'll the break. Yeah, so, same problem. Rick Kelly finds himself in trouble again. At the same part of the circuit, he is just about fed up to the eyeballs with this. The Zinger replay shows him shooting off into the grass. And by now, you would have heard it. This is absolutely dangerous, he said. Eric Pender straight onto the case, comes straight in. And then he had a big moment at pit lane entry as well because he's having to pump the brakes. He barely pulled it up down there. So that very quick stint early must have really punished the brakes. And maybe a little bit of... Extra bit of damage around the front's not helping the brake ducting either. What are we doing? You pumping? So Rick stays on board. See, they're just going to couple up the bleed bottles again and they're trying to pump the air out of the system. Close the bleed nipples and then pressure the pedal again and then they may release it again. Pedal down, squirt some oil through. I wonder how much air they're getting. Doing all four corners. What's that? Hold it down. Hold it down. Juicer up as well. Still got the incompressible jacks under it because people were working on it. They dropped it on top of the, they call them stubbies. Yeah, body blow after body blow for our championship leading car of Rick Kelly and Garth Tander. Here's the WPS entry of Caruso and Denya. They have got points margin in the championship, though, in uh, car number one. And uh, we'll keep an eye on this one in case they... Uh, this was the team that we looked at earlier today with the uh, fancy brake setup. And there you go, you just put a couple of spanners in there and pluck it off because basically you can cock the disc rotor sideways and sneak it out from the caliper. Slightly different way they've done it than the Holden Racing Team, but still very effective. A little cross-threaded there for the... Wheel nut. 
back on that point scenario that you mentioned. Rick Kelly, 443, Gartan to 434, and Jamie Winkup, 389. And the championship picture, if Rick and Garth finish out of the points, so from 16th position down. Car number 18 on screen. That is the second Dick Johnson racing forward of Alex Davison and Andrew Thompson. Andrew Thompson came to Bathurst last year, ran in the second division, Fujitsu series events, and uh, made a name for himself, won both races, and hence uh, has been picked up for enduro duty with Dick Johnson Racing. This pair showing in position to a timing screen test there for the moment and uh, this car just outside uh, the top 10 lead vehicle hovering in 10th position the davison brothers are the grandson of grandsons of lex davison the four-time australian grand prix winner in the days uh, before the australian grand prix being a part of uh, the formula one Car on screen, number 18, in 13th position. Alex Davison behind the wheel. He's the older brother of Will, Will being a full-time driver in the V8 Supercar Championship Series for Dick Johnson Race. Three victories on the mountain for Dick Johnson Racing, 1981, 1989, and the most recent victory for Dick Johnson and John Bow in 1994. So long time between drinks for this proud team as we go back on board. Triple Eight team Vodafone. Great lounge behind the wheel of the car. Immediately in front of him is uh, the second Tasman Motorsport car, number three, Mark Noski and Jay Verdnick. Verdnick, another of the rookies. In fact, uh, he's the leading rookie at uh, this stage of the race, approaching half distance. Craig Lowndes, one of the most popular drivers of the V8 Supercar Championship Series, known for his uh, fan friendliness. Picked that trade up from his mentor, Peter Brock, the late great Peter Brock. Lowndes known to uh, wait after the race meetings for many hours, signing as many autographs uh, as are requested of him. Just look at the distance, that gap between Lowndes, who we're riding on board with in car three, the Noski machine number three, it's really come down by over a second from the time we've been on board as we now are on Conrad Strait. A glimpse there of the new Mount Panorama resort was expected to, on the right hand side there, to be open ahead of this race, uh, but uh, perhaps for next year. Triple Eight Team Vodafone Falcon. It's a great shot. Shows you the sorts of loads that go through the Dunlop control tyre. The right hand of the climb at the top of the mountain. Look at the side wall deflection here. Reed Park, metal grate on the right. Just barely running the inside edge of the unloaded tyre through there. McPhillamy off the ground. And off the ground again and again. Big load at Skyline, 225k approach, and then huge crush pressure through the tyre. Kevin Fitzsimmons from Dunlop tells me he's got some data that says that on occasion as it flies through the dipper there, they've seen loads in excess of 1,000 kilograms on an individual tyre. Look at that. They pressured up around 30, 31, maybe 32 pounds in the old language. Now the run down Conrad Strait. And we've spoken before about a thing called negative camber, which means that you can see that there's more of the inside edge of the tyre on the road than the outside. That helps 
compensate for the deflection of that tyre in the corners, but in the straights, it heats the inside edge up. And if you have too much negative camber, it superheats it, and it'll blister and damage the tyre on the inside. Also, if you run too much negative camber, you're more prone to brake locking because you don't have as much tyre on the road under brakes. Coming into the final corner now. Again, big crush load on that front tyre for the second gear left-hander. Flies over the kerb. One thing Craig loves is a kerb, and these cars always seem to handle kerb hopping pretty well. Turn one. Spends half the time off the deck round here, the front left, which is the reason why we've got the camera there. And then coming up to the bump in Mountain Straight, and it's a yee-haw right over the top of that. Massive load through turn two. Because the, it's uphill and the positive camber, you can really hook the car in there hard and make that front left tyre do a little bit of turning and braking for you. You can really load it up. I was going to take you for a ride early in the week. Mr White ran here to try and remind you of what this place looked like. It is an amazing ride. Didn't happen. You got off this year. Probably why I'm, why I'm still sit, sitting here. <laughs> Get you one day. Yeah, I know. It's a great shot, and uh, around the world, tyre engineers, I know those interested in motorsport have looked at that and marvelled at the rise and fall of the track and the punishment that the tyre takes. Lance continues to have a good look at Mark Noski, who's driving the number three Tasman Motorsport entry, along with Jay Verdnick. Race leaders due in, Matthew, and... Uh, earlier than I would have predicted. So we're on lap 81. Yeah, we're halfway so there. So this is uh, one of the three remaining Rocket, stops. Down one turn if you've got time. Okay, so a little roll centre change. Well, one turn is two millimetres. You can do it with a speed brace on the side of the car, cable connected That's to the Watts link. Under the car. Oh. Well, huffing and puffing is the crew grunting through the through the job. They're all mic'd up. And away he goes. Another great stop. Uh, the tire was damaged. He said it's delaminated. Which one was yeah. it? That was a late fall on that one. So that's why he's in early, because I had their window closing at 89 and they're on lap 81 at the moment. So, so uh, Richo had a problem, had to bring it in. So remember we saw Rick Kelly with a problem earlier in the day with a tyre. So that's the second tyre that there's a question mark over. And now Stephen Richards inherits this car off Mark Winterbottom. The gap when they came in was 5.7 seconds back to second place of Greg Murphy. A Zinger replay will probably show us that Craig Lowndes gets past Mark Noski. Oof. That's out in the weeds out there. <laughs> What's this? Dives on the inside. Oh. Mentioned he loves a curve, he loves everything. Noski played it smart too. So Team Vodafone, car triple eight moves up to seventh. Their other one, car double eight, is in third. A race leader is Stephen Richards. Second is Greg Murphy. Fourth is Craig Baird in the toll HSV, car number 16. Neil, we've been watching those fantastic shots underneath the car and the side flicks and the workloads on these tyres. Here's a road tyre, which is quite thick. It's a uh, traditional road tyre. The sidewall that we're watching that flex on, the rubber itself, the actual tread on the sidewall is about four to five mil thick. And you can see with my little finger there moving it, it, actually, it, it is actually fairly stiff. Here's the race tyre, about four mil of actual tread depth. And the sidewall, you can see so thin, about two mils. Look at that. You can see why there's so much load movement, sideways movement lateral movement on these tyres. Thanks, Daniel. To uh, toll cars, car number one. With uh, Rick Kelly still in there. Behind him is Craig Baird, who's got a much better position on the timing sheets. He is in third position. 
the race lead now belongs to car number 51 of Greg Murphy. Their last pit stop on lap 54. We're now up to lap 82. So Murphy and Jason Richards have until 89 before their fuel window will close. Just been in having a look at that tyre that's come off the number six car of Mark Winterbottom. That's the fourth left rear tyre that's gone today, guys. We need to keep an eye on this. It's all on the inner shoulder and talking to Kevin Fitzsimmons from Dunlop a little bit earlier on. It's not actually ripping, ripping apart the tyre. You've seen so many times, like with the Shane Van Gisbergen car, where the tyre lets go and it wraps itself around inside the wheel well around the suspension. That's not what hap is happening with these tyres. They're actually breaking away and going across the surface of the tyre well, horizontally rather than vertically. So it's a trend that's developing. They're all left rears and they're all on the inside. It's a bit of a worry. Let's keep an eye. So Rick Kelly in car one is in 22nd position. Craig Baird behind him is actually in third on the road. As I mentioned, Greg Murphy has the race lead. Simonson is second. Lap 83 into the second half of this race. There's our leader with his lights on. Remember, of course, Stephen Richards and Mark Winterbottom have done their changeover. They did it on lap 81. Car 51, its last time in, it was on lap 54. Yeah, Matty, I've been down to talk to Jeff Greg Murphy. He's a machine over the mountain. There's near 2092 the last few laps. Jeff's a little worried about the race pace, though. He said he'd like it to be a little, a little slower, but what do you do? You lead the race, you've got to keep it up. He'd rather have a little bit more tyre um, tire usage late in the race for that last dash to the line. Four-time champion, Greg Murphy. And 2092. Done on lap 67 for him. He's been posting some good 209s over the course of the last 10 laps or so. In that last stop for Ford Performance Racing, we heard drivers call for a little rear roll centre change on the Castrol Ford number six. And they asked for one turn down in the rear roll centre. We'll have a look at that. We'll have a look at one of these Harrop Cad drawings of the rear end of the car for you as we watch car number six climb up the top of the hill to the cutting. The Watts linkage is located in the rear of the car. It's a system that guarantees that the axle moves up and down in a straight line and resists the side load on the diff housing and the suspension. And there's a little threaded rod here, which Clayton will just highlight for me. And the pitch on that is about two millimetres. So for one turn of that rod, you end up moving a thing called a Watts Link bell crank, which is located further down. There's the rod. We'll slide down, have a look further down. And they're moving it just a tiny amount, only two millimetres. We'll sneak in under here. It's this device here that we're highlighting. Now think about the size of one of these race cars, 1.3 tonnes of race car, and you're moving that thing. Let me flip around the other way and have a look at it. You're a good lad. Two millimetres in a thing that weighs so much, and it changes the characteristic and the behaviour of the car, and the drivers can taste it, read it, feel it, and it can make a huge difference. When you lower it, you're allowing the rear of the car to just roll a little more, be a little easier on its rear tyres, settle the hand, handling down so that it's not quite as pointy, doesn't rotate the rear of the car as quickly and slide the car across the road and damage the rear tyres. Thanks to Harrop Engineering for giving Neil a new toy to play with in 2007. We'll continue that for the rest of the year as much as we can. Greg Murphy has the race lead. Routine pit stop now for Mark Noski. He hops out Jay Burtnick, another of the Development Series drivers from V8 Supercar Racing, uh, finished uh, in the top five in the second division events, the Development the Series. Car, also, uh, okay, to mate. give its official Give'll name, the Fujitsu V8 can. Supercar Dodge Series. Burtnick now Heading goes the through the procedure. Field. All drivers need to carefully follow through to ensure the car is technically able to get back in the race and safely able to do so. Jason Bright on screen now in the car he shares with Adam Macro. Bright.
out. 15th position, head to Griffin's Bend. Third pit stop now for the Caltex car, Luke Gilden and Russell Ingle. So it'll be Ingle out of the car. Gilden, his younger teammate, behind the wheel now. Jason Bright starts his descent. Pushing very hard in the BA Falcon, BF Falcon in fact. A slight uh, fiddle with the rules this year in V8 supercar racing, so the move from the uh, BA model to the BF Falcon. The Falcons uh, being uh, almost on the market in Australia biggest selling Ford model in the country for almost 50 years. It's a Falcon that won uh, this race in 1967, kick-started the great rivalry between red and blue Ford and Holden. That 67 victory, Fred Gibson and Harry Firth spurred the General, General Motors, their Australian division Holden into action. Holden coming back the next year with uh, a Monaro taking the victory and the great rivalry was off and running. Lowndes and Wind Cups win in the curtain raiser of the Sandown 500 three weeks ago. Started a big rethink right through the V8 supercar paddock where a number of teams had planned to split their drivers for the Bathurst 1000. Uh, split them for that sand down event but when they saw the pace of that uh, number one combination from Team Vodafone of Lowndes and Wind Cup decided uh, to win the Bathurst 1000, the biggest prize in Australian motorsport, they needed to pair their lead drivers. Here comes the Murphy Richards car, car number 51. Murphy was leading this event this time last year. Brakes done there, they only did pads, not rotors. A few issues going on around town at the moment. We had a report that Jason Bright might have delaminated a tyre, but he's continued to circulate out there. He certainly raised the question mark. Russell Ingle had a drama flat spot at a tyre. Jason comes back onto the track behind car 17. Car number 16 with Craig Baird at the wheel at the moment also talking about brake problems and here's the damage to the tyre that I spoke about. See the inside edge of that front tyre, big flat spots on it. And so that was only 19 laps into that sequence, so nothing like a tank load. So that is uh, an awkward one for those guys. That'll bury them down the field in the Caltex entry. Mark Scope was also complaining that he was being held up on the road. He's down in ninth at the moment in car number two. I'm not sure who was holding up who or what was going on there, but he certainly wasn't happy. Yeah, Neil, this is the actual tyre. Russell's been lucky. He's uh, got a minus a flat spot on this tyre, but it's, uh, of course, as the nature of the flat spot is, every time you brake, it wants to pick up that same contact patch on the road. What it's done then is slowly started to rip away, and you can see this cap ply, and if I just grab that, that's the Kevlar protector. I'll rip that through. It just wants to rip away at the tyre. He's actually pretty good. Still inflated, and he carried this for 15 laps, but they have had an unscheduled stop. Kevin Fitzsimmons there from Dunlop, heads their uh, Dunlop racing program and uh, he's having a good look at these tyres, a few question marks being raised here and there. This car's been running very well today, they're on target for uh, a solid result, in fact our pit smart suggests they could be up for a third on current estimate and the race incidentally due to finish at about 20 to 5 Eastern Standard Time.
feel like going <laughs> myself just to help that process. Simonson out and Richard Lyons in. Spoke to Richard Lyons before he stepped into this car. He said when the fuel burns off, if you want to say that it was good, he just gave me a very, very cheeky smile. They're a big chance today. They're out of sequence with the rest of them. This, though, is the regular Craig Lowndes car. Usually it's car 888, but here in the Enduros, it's car 88. That's right. They're playing a very smart hand. They well, just got 33 laps out of that stint, so uh, good efficiency for them. Gary Rogers Motorsport, Valvoline Cummins, car number 34. Greg Ritter and Cameron McLean. And this is back up to Craig Lowndes at the top of the mountain in fifth spot. By the time it clicks over, he'll move up to fourth. And, uh, see Lowndes on screen there currently showing fifth and probably as you said about to be fourth and you look for where car number six is and it's sixth this is actual placings at the moment however in pit smart land where we're looking forward on a computer prediction that factors in current speed and what's likely to happen coming forward this is a seesaw battle between triple eight and car six there's nothing it shows 0.2 of a second between them at the moment and then with car uh, 51 third now this assumes a whole variety of different things that are yet to fully play out because the actual order at the moment is different to that but uh, very interesting situation in the motor race at this point so in terms of on track position Craig Lowndes will go underneath the bridge at the control line third on the road. Craig Baird and Max Wilson, the only cars in front of him. Owen Kelly behind him and then Stephen Richards. But on corrected, it'll be Triple Eight and car six of Stephen Richards fighting out the top two positions. Well, Jack Perkins just about to jump back into the Jack Daniels car. Jack, congratulations on your first full stint here at Mount Panorama. How was it? Yeah, thanks. It was good. Um, you know, the car's quite strong and uh, we just sort of held our own there for a bit, passed a few cars and kept out of trouble and brought it back and give it back to Shane. I had a quick chat to your dad. He's very happy with the way both of you guys are going. What's the aim? Where would you like to finish this? Where do you think you can finish this? Oh, look, we'd love to finish in the top 10. I think that'd be a good reward and even top 15 in the points would be good and have both cars in the top 15. A good, good sort of team reward because uh, we haven't really had the results that we wanted so far. All right, Jack, you're doing a great job. We'll let you get back to it, mate. All the best. Thank you. Cheers. First driver I've heard all weekend mention points. Jack Perkins and uh, Shane Price currently showing 17th and that's both corrected and on the track. We're going to see car number 16, Craig Baird, come in this lap, currently leading. 14.6 second gap over Max Wilson in the WOW number 8 entry. Craig Lowndes is next in the queue third at the moment, so he'll shuffle up. And uh, James Courtney here, currently 10th. Computer prediction at the moment sees them 8th and 33 seconds behind the lead money. Max Wilson won't be too far behind Craig Baird in pulling in. He's getting towards the very end of his window. Has a big look on the inside of Richard Lyons. Thank you very much. They know each other from Japanese GT racing. This car had a drive through earlier on. Steve Ellery was at the wheel. And uh, Ellery, I think, twists his ankle as he leaps out. Paul Morris getting in. Currently 22nd and opting not to have a driver assistance, so the two drivers take care of each other. Window net up and pinned. The two Team Serum cars only three places apart. 22nd for Paul Morris, 25th for Chris Pither. Right pedal, pump the 
Gus Tander, car 16 in the pits here. You're really treading water trying to stay on that lead lap, but if there's a long safety car, you'll, you'll try to solve this problem on car one. Yeah, we need a safety car like right now, because <laughs> uh, Lowndes has been coming not far behind us, and you know, there's no doubt we're struggling with the brakes, so um, you know, if we have one right now, we could duck in and we'll fix it over a couple of laps and um, try and stay on the lead laps, and then we can get back into it. Is the real problem rear brakes is putting all the force on the front, or is it a combination of both? Yes, yeah, so the rear brakes are going away, so um, you know we're having to use a lot of the front, so it's very got to be very careful. We don't lock a front tyre, which happened to be in my stint. So um, you know we're just trying to just keep a reasonable pace up without risking the car or um, or each other, so that we're ready to go into Indy. Keep trying. Yeah, we're trying. We're slowly sinking, but we're trying. Greg Murphy, rock star, Alpine star, superstar, leading the race for a while. Cheers, you're. You're a clever bloke, mate. You should write jingles. Yeah, I should. But I'm here talking to you. Yeah, no, it's um, it's going going okay. It was, it was a better better stint. The first one had a few few dramas with the car was a little bit um, off in a couple of areas. It was a little bit better then, so we were able to carry a bit better pace there. There's a couple of cars that are trucking around there a bit faster though, but um, we're, we're going along okay. The race pace is, is pretty quick though, isn't it? Yeah, it's fast and you know uh, very few interruptions so far too. So. You know, you, you can get into a good rhythm and, and, and press on. What have you done with the car over the last... I mean, you haven't totally been happy with the car and all of a sudden it's, it's come to, to, the, to the biggest race of the year and we seem to have got it sorted. Well, it's not sorted. It, you know, we're, it's not, we've been working on it all weekend, you know, big changes. And I know that uh, there's probably a few other cars in there that haven't been making as many changes as what we have to get their car going as good as what it is. So, and it's outright speed, it's not quite there. There's a few things to improve on, but it's certainly we've made a game with it, So, which is really encouraging for us. Any more of that drink, you'll be as high as Craig Lowndes. Good luck. No? Any more of that drink, you'll be as high as Craig Lowndes. Well, I think, <laughs> never. I couldn't drink enough of that to be as high as him. Sheer pace is making sure that 8886 and 51 are in this race, but they're achieving it in slightly different ways. 888 are there because they've got pace and very good fuel economy, whereas 6 and 51 have got good pace, but they played a smart strategic card, pitting during that safety car back at about lap 54. The interesting question is, if we continue to get all this green running, what happens with their final stop of the day, which will be the fifth stop for them? Do they have to pit in the lap 150s? That being the case, may well be that Triple Eight are well positioned to take advantage of that. I'll still work some numbers and think it through. Garth Tander mentioned the situation facing the number one car trying to stay on that lead lap. Triple Eight car of Craig Lowndes is right behind them on the track and catching fast. 51 of Jason Richards. Fifth. In front of him is Scaife. Further up is Johnson. Further up is Richards. And then Craig Lowndes. And that would be the ankle of Woodside. Stephen Ellery. And flying out of car 67 and just twisted it on the way down. Just what you need after pounding the pedals round and round and round. Back to the track action. It's uh, Stephen Johnson there in car 17. He's got Mark Scaife on him. You're looking at positions four and five. Car 10, the WPS entry. Oh, Grant Denyer and Michael Caruso. Well, Steve Ellery, we were a bit concerned you might have rolled your ankle getting out of the car, but it's more than that. Yeah, I think um, just on the side of my foot here, it's it's all swollen up from heel and toe in. Um, about the last 10 laps, I just couldn't feel anything in my foot. I couldn't feel the brake pedal or anything, so it was, um, it was pretty hard. We've been talking about how hot the race pace is today. You're working a little bit harder than normal out there. Yeah, I knew before the start of the day it was going to be one of the uh, fastest races we've had for a long time. Just the speed in all the practice sessions and qualifying, you know, suggested that. So we were ready for it, you know, and the car's not too bad. It's just a little bit disappointing that um, 
I flat spotted the front tyres early in the race, but you know I've only had half a lap since Friday, and um, you know I've only driven the car for half a lap on full full tanks, so I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do. So um, it was a little bit disappointing, but that's the way it goes. Steve, will the foot keep you out, or are you okay to get back in? Oh, I have to get back in. You know, I don't think Paul can do 80 laps, so um, 70 laps or whatever it is. So I'll get back in sometime. I just have to keep ice on it, get the feeling back, and I'll be right. All right, we'll order you some more ice. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> That'd be great. Thank you. Hey, Barretz, you know what it feels like. Your feet are like that up at dancing training, right? We might split the ice. Here's an incident for car 11, Marcus Marshall and Kane Scott. Marshall has found the wall. And that is up at the cutting. So he's facing the wrong way. Jack Daniels' car has been spun around. Remember, not too long ago, Tander and Co said, we need a safety car. Safety car, Shane, safety car. They've got it. A real rush in the Toll HSV dealer team garage. This is the safety car that Garth Tander and number one needed. Car two is in. Mark Scaife and Todd Kelly. Garth wasn't ready to get in the car, so he's hurriedly gone and run, throwing the hands device on, throwing the helmet on, throwing the balaclava on. They're getting ready on standby here. His wife, Leanne's ready to try to help him out here to get him ready for car number one. The safety car is being called as the HRT2 car now rolls in. Just a quick point, too. Just had a quick word to Craig Wilson from Walk Chalk Performance, of course. They are common suppliers between this team and the Holden Racing Team. No problems in terms of the brakes with the Holden Racing Team, and they are running pretty much the same equipment, so a very, very strange puzzle unfolding today. <laughs> They've just done rotors on that car, and obviously uh, pads. Go, go, go! Only 24 laps into that stint, so it's an opportunistic pit stop for them when the safety car's out there. Ideally, position just came straight in. <laughs> The remaining super cheap auto car of Dumbrell and Wheel. Very timely safety car for some of the field. And the strategic complexion of this race will now change. hops out. Glenn Seaton's got a problem at the moment with uh, fluid, perhaps oil, in the cockpit of the car making his feet slippery. He's in 12th at the moment in car number 22. Not what you want. So the safety car rounds them up. Russell Ingall makes way for Luke Yulden. The seat insert in. Special mould that they just throw in before they jump into the cockpit. And this will show us exactly what's happened to car 11 at the cutting, backs into it, glass everywhere. Check your brake pedal, bring the rear bar back up to full step. Marcus Marshall. Same spot as where Stephen Johnson went awry. Before the top 10 shootout. A few years ago, his boss Larry Perkins found the wall up there too. A couple of very big bumps. The last one is, is very large and it sort of descends out from underneath the car. And uh, if you've got a little bit too much speed, it's easy to end up backing up into that wall. So there is the rear of the JD car. Just making sure that structurally it's okay. Need to make sure the incompressible jacks beneath it if they do go under the car. Without those in there, they will be penalised, but they've done that job. So we need to see what all this means now, and how the field compresses, and what the sort order looks like. The other Jack Daniels car, Cromley of uh, Shane Price and Jack Perkins. Shane out there in 13th. Their last stop was on lap 66. 
was a uh, bulletin issued a couple of days ago, just a small rewrite of the way the safety car will intervene and uh, grab the leader, and if the leader pits, how they'll treat the subsequent cars that needed to be waved by, because again, there was a little bit of discussion after Sandown, but the lights are out and we're ready to go again. Garth still waits. Craig Lowndes heads up the field. Stephen Richards is second. Stephen Johnson third. Jason Richards is fourth. Then it's James Courtney. It's a mad scramble to turn one. A lap after the safety car. It's nervous. The drivers, team owners, everybody. Johnson goes roaring up alongside Richards and Johnson gets him. Pure speed out of turn one, up to turn two along Mountain Straight. The Jim Beam racer has grabbed hold of second position off the restart. Jason Richards also has a look at Stephen. So the Castrol Orcon FPR car is under pressure. Lowndes has pulled away a little bit. Johnson has gone with him. It's Richards versus Richards. Stephen versus Jason. Just looking at that shot before of Garth Tan, we saw him suit up, pull the helmet on, and thought he was going to get in. But just crunch the numbers here and because there's maximum minimums for both drivers then uh, it wasn't the correct time to change drivers that's why they've left rick in that car they were so aggressive off the restart once they got clear running all the lead cars back together they cut loose and we'll get a corrected order at the completion of this lap through the chase. Johnson, the big winner of the restart. Mid-pack. All going through cleanly. So it is Craig Lout, Stephen Johnson, Stephen Richards and Jason Richards. Sorry. Then James Courtney, that's the Gel Gwen Motorsport Falcon. The yellow and blue car four. That's position five. Richard Lyon sixth. Davison in seventh. Then it's Bright, Seaton, Kelly, Price. Todd Kelly in tenth. Just had a word with Marcus Marshall. It's very upset, Marcus Marshall. It's been a problem with the number 11 car. They made a gearbox change yesterday. They've been having to hold it into second gear. So in the run up to the cutting, which is a fourth back to second slot, tried to grind it in there and hang on to it in second gear which he's been doing all day but that time it just didn't hang on a bit of a compression lock and around it went there they're attacking this car they're pretty keen to get it back out there now and it doesn't look like it's actually crushed into the fuel filler so they should be okay to rejoin once it's been repaired yeah the other jack daniels car of shane price is attacking too he's just on the edge of the top 10. he had to deal with some back marker traffic coming up the mountain straight he did it well. Scratch that remark about uh, Tander and Kelly and the number of laps. It's irrelevant, so I'm not 100% sure why they decided not to swap the drivers over at this point. But obviously, Rick's comfortable and he knows what he's dealing with with, with the car. This has uh, reinvigorated things, hasn't it? Yep. A bit of debris on the top of the mountain up there. It's managed to uh, push its own way over to the right hand side and off the track. Now to Forest Elbow. That's Fabian Coulthard and the other team, Sirame Entry. In front of him is Grant Denyer. They're down on positions. The team Kiwi racer pulls over and gives the quick guys some room. In the mouth, it's an opportunity for drivers to make some easy pickings, make up some points. It's also a time when, uh, when cars can suddenly find themselves getting loose on cold tyres, 
Safety cars permit safety cars, is the old saying. Often you'll have uh, an incident like we saw with Marcus Marshall. The cars are bunched up, and then just after a lap or two of uh, green flag running with this, the restart, we're back under safety car again. However, we're now uh, a lap and a half into uh, green flag running. So the further we go, the less chance of uh, having a repeat safety car period. Three safety cars for a total of five laps so far in this race. Uh, well down on the average, given that we're halfway uh, over the halfway mark. The average for this race in terms of the number of safety cars uh, is uh, between eight and nine, so only three so far, and we're almost at two-thirds distance. Stephen Richards, second car on screen there. He's making his 15th Bathurst 1000 start this weekend. It's the first without his father in the field as either a teammate or rival. Steve the son, Jim the father, paired together on a number of occasions. They have a podium result that finished second in 1997. They also uh, struck a kangaroo two or three times, oh, sorry, two or three years ago when they last paired together. But uh, Jim now hanging up the helmet from Bathurst 1000 competition after 35 years. He made his debut, Jim Richards. 1974. Now he's left it all to his son, Stephen Richards, in the car number six at Ford Performance Racing, the Castrol Falcon. Car 17 immediately in front of Richards there. That's the Stephen Johnson, Will Davison machine, Dick Johnson Racing. Johnson second on the road now. Fantastic effort. This car found the wall practice yesterday in the cutting and came back out after repairs were made in the top 10 shootout and uh, finished well up in the top half of the shootout of the field. Holden Racing Team car number two briefly on the screen there. There's our race leader Craig Lowndes. Two time winner of the Bathurst 1000 last year his current co-driver, Jamie Winkup, and uh, then 10 years previously with Greg Murphy, 1996, with Holden. Holden racing team, long time, long time uh, driver was Craig Lowndes for that team. Anytime you let him go, they'll take advantage of it. And that's exactly what's happened after the restart. Craig Lowndes has the on-track lead over Stephen Johnson. The gap last time around was 2.7 seconds. But importantly, he needs to keep stretching this margin because he's got to take another stop by no later than lap 105. So he needs margin because he's done two stops in the race. Everybody that he's racing, Greg Murphy, car number six and car number 88 they've done their third stop and just strategically in perhaps a slightly better position at the moment so he needs this fresh air to make it work nearly asked the question as to why toll have left rick in the car garth was getting ready but they left him in the car because they can now under the new safety car rules gain their lap back that's why they've done it Mark Scafe and Todd Kelly very frustrated and the Holden Racing Team at the moment. They feel they get themselves into the right position to try and make a move, but they just haven't got the power in the car. They just can't find the right amount of grunt at the moment to drive forward. So they're down on straight line speed and that's causing them all sorts of headaches. Now talk about straight line. It was in a straight line where Stephen Richards got swamped by Stephen Johnson. We understand that Stephen's partner Mark Winterbottom is down in pit lane. I'm going to get to you in a second, Frosty, because we do have safety car conditions. We'll find out what's going on around the circuit, but the yellow flags are out. The SC boards are being shown. 
car number 17 is going to have to stop shortly too. They've only done two stops. Their fuel window closes at 102. It's now lap 97. They may take advantage of this safety car. And that compresses the lead that Lowndes had. Here's the reason for the problem. Someone shot straight ahead, Toll HSV car. And it is car number one with all the brake drama. Now, does he pop out the other side? He does. Somebody else is down on their luck though because they've got a problem and that's triggered the safety car oh, and here it is it's noski and verdict stuck in the sand at the same spot and the tow truck is now what have to do its job there the tractor will get in and uh, remove that car but so both of those cars have gone shooting off on the right hand side and deep into the sand kelly went straight through it now car three jay verdick is stuck in it Uh, here we go. Now, it's interesting. So they're using this opportunity because the window is open for them to do this, but only just. It opened on lap 33 tactically. They would have run out of fuel on uh, lap 105. We're on lap 97. In fact, 98. The pit lane gets really busy now. A little more piling in. This is the third stop for car 888. Got to be on your game. Ready to go. And they are. Disc rotor doesn't look too bad. Car 17 taking advantage of it as well, like I suggested before. This is the third stop for this car. Fourth stop of the race for car number six. Changes again. time though for the leaders of the race to come in and uh, now most of the teams at the front of the field having stopped on lap 97 will only need to make one more stop it will be a bit marginal for one or two of them if we go green flag racing to the end of the race however uh, good fuel economy out of the bulk of the field should uh, see 64 laps knocked off with just one more stop. Jamie Wincup there, first car in the daisy chain, car 888 race leader. Had uh, a fraught first season of V8 supercar racing four years ago when he joined uh, Gary Rogers Motorsport and unfortunately wasn't able to get the best out of that car, but he was thrown a lifeline by Triple Eight and uh, he's bloomed under the Queensland team. Fourth 
restart of this race. Let him get settled in. Team Sirame car gets squeezed out on the exit of turn one. Still got Mark Winterbottom standing by down there in pit lane. Frosty, you got me? Yeah, mate, I got you. Sorry about that, mate. All hell broke loose as soon as we're about to talk to you. That's cool, mate. You've been in, you've been out. What's your read on it? Um, yeah, it, it seems good. The car's very strong, but, um, you know, that the tyre blowing definitely hurt us because we uh, were making really good time. But we, um, I think we've got back on it with that strategy. We're in front of Lowndes and, and um, you know, we're, we're on the same strategy again. So um, looking all right. Mark, do you have any theories as to what the tyre problem is? Um, we found out that there's quite a few theories and uh, we don't really know what, which one it is. So um, we're, uh, we're still, you know, having a look at it. But, um, you know, we're probably going to have a, a little bit of caution just to get round and then, uh, you know, and then, then we'll push hard at the end. But we were doing pretty quick times there. And to do 208.7s in, you know, stint, stint number one or two, it's pretty quick. Yeah, awesome pace today throughout the entire race. And everybody pushing very hard. They are. It's, um, it's a sprint race now. It's a 1,000-kilometre sprint race. And to do 208.7... And that's your quickest lap. You know that would put you in the top ten not many years ago. So uh, you know it's really quick and and uh, it's, a, it's a quick pace. But there's a lot of guys and good cars now that that can do the time. So you know later today it's going to be interesting to see where we end up. If you're full green from here on in, you'll get through to about lap 132. So one stop would get you then to the end of the race, but only just. Yeah, it would. Our, our economy is very good. We were on a four-stop strategy there, and um, you know the tire the tire hurt, but. Um, We'll do one more stop and, and I'll jump in and go to the end. So, um, you know, really looking forward to that last battle and, and getting to that last stint and, and um, really having a good crack. All right, mate, it's all happening out there, so we'll curtail the chat. Good luck for the remainder of the afternoon. Thanks, mate. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Mike Winterbottom. There's his partner in crime this weekend, Stephen Richards. We're all jumping over each other here off the restart. First full lap there completed. Todd Kelly has on track position. Paul Radisic second, Barguana third. Then it's Dean Canto. Our Pentax cam brings him up again. Stephen Richards in fifth on the road. Well, Matty Paul Radisic might be second on the road, but he's still got second-hand brakes at the moment. In fact, both Toll HSV cars have had to bleed the brakes. What's the problem, Rod Crawford? Uh, we've had a drama since lap 10 with air in the system, and um, we just can't seem to get it out. So we just have to see how we go. We thought the brakes might have been an issue here, but pads and rotors, I mean, not air in the system. We didn't sort of anticipate that. Nah, neither did we. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> yeah, the interesting question is why. And, uh, and clearly that's something that's got him puzzled at the moment as well. It seems to be unique to both their cars. Things you learn along the way. The things you get presented with. It's going to be a salvage job. For them now they're currently 18th in car number one so uh, they need to be inside the first 15 to score any points uh, maybe that's doable if they can keep on trotting around but it's not going to be a day that gives them a big points yield good effort from car 25 fujitsu forward of adam macro and jason bright macro steering they are 12th on track our pit smart predictor has them inside the top 10. Currently looking at about sixth position. Yeah, the, the people that are going to end up fighting this motor race out, uh, Richards Winterbottom in six, Murphy Richards in 51, Johnson Davison in 17, Lowndes and Wincup in triple eight, possibly also Courtney and Bernard in four, kind of, and then there were five. And look at this little battle down here. They're the fellas that are in the game at the moment, which is not reflected in the current order on the computer. That's because people are now on quite different strategies here and there. Todd Kelly leading from Paul Radisic, Jason Barguana, Dean Cando, Stephen Richards, Matt Halliday, Will Davison, Jason Richards, Jamie Wincup, David Bernard. the 100 lap mark. Stephen Richards behind Dean Cando of car 33. <laughs> He's 
Craig Lowndes doing the count as they go past. He needs an abacus down there. He's going one, two, three. And, you know, there'd be, there'd be a couple of hundred thousand dollars worth of computers three metres behind him. All the science in the world. And he's going one, two. Still can't work out why he was counting. Down the front straight, they were halfway up. But that's Lowndes. Here's Jason Barguana in the Wow Falcon. Of car number eight. Right up inside the top three, but effective position at the lower end of the top 20. The red V blue leaderboard show that Todd Kelly is on the road first. Two stints to go to cover 61 laps to find out who is the 2007 Bathurst 1000 champion. Here we go cars on pit straight now underneath the super cheap auto bridge. This is where the bulk of the crowd is down the bottom of the mountain. As they weave through Sanyo Corner, its traditional name, Hill Corner, they head up the mountain straight. There's a period uh, of about uh, two kilometres of the track where there are no spectators. About 20 residences, be it uh, homes, farms, there's even a vineyard or two around the Mount Panorama circuit. So minimal spectators, mostly uh, residents and their friends uh, hanging over the wall there as we see a move there for car number one around number nine. That's uh, the Russell Dingle Caltex machine. So, uh, despite four trips over the sand trap, all at the same point of the circuit, that number one car, Garth Tander and Rick Kelly, remain incredibly on the lead lap. That team able to take advantage of uh, the long lap around Mount Panorama under the safety car period. It takes about uh, five minutes or so for the cars at the, the reduced speed to do a lap behind the safety car, enabling the crews to carry out uh, quite significant repairs in the case of both Toll HSV dealer team cars. That's car one and car 16. Uh, it's uh, bleeding the brake lines to get that uh, those air bubbles out of those lines. So incredibly, car number one remains in the hunt for this race, remaining on the lead lap. Machine there, number seven leads uh, this gaggle of cars. Uh, he's behind the Tanda machine, 16th position. Points paid from first to 15th in each uh, race of the V8 Supercar Championship Series. And Jack Perkins, in his first full year in the series, hasn't yet uh, got much of a haul of points. So he and Shane Price looking uh, to get amongst the top 10. And a uh, nice bag full of points to please team owner Larry. Jack Perkins' father has given him the opportunity to race uh, for the family team. A nudge there from one of the Gary Rogers cars, the silver, red and uh, black machine into the back of Owen Kelly. There's the car we were talking about, Jack Perkins, just a moment ago, knocking on the door of uh, the top 15, but unfortunately he's come into the pits and a major incident there, fire. So, uh, the second car that we've seen uh, drop out of the race due to fire, of course, Andy Jones, Team VOC, uh, bringing out the safety car, the second safety car of the day with a fire and into the sand trap there. running ahead of his crew, pushing the car. I'll push it straight into the garage. Perhaps they won't actually just to clear the smoke and to determine the problem before they push it into the garage to start working on it. 
Jack Daniels racing. Two rookies in that team, quite an unusual move. Larry Perkins, team principal there, copped a bit of flack from uh, the motorsport press uh, for putting two rookies in the team uh, and debuting them in the same year. Most people thinking uh, it would have been better to uh, keep an experienced driver while uh, bloody either Price or Perkins. picture look at this it's his cockpit full of smoke it looks as though he's already got a problem that you're right jack perkins has made it back to the pits the car was on fire he stepped out he's okay what he said was there was a fire behind the unique part of the larry perkins car the tower of power we call it it's the big panel to the driver's left where all the switches are to turn various pumps and ignition systems on he said it caught on fire he bowed out of this thing very very quickly it made it into the lane Hats off to the Bright Tech Motorsport boys who helped the guys put the fire out and then the Jack Daniels crew came down to collect the car and bring it down to the pit bay. But that's two Jack Daniels cars out of this race. Yeah, they were forced to push it too. So they... <laughs> Reminiscent of some of the old famous shots. This is Todd Kelly. And... Uh... It's touch and go at the moment, but this car, I gave you a little short list before of those that I thought were really going to be factors in the race, but Todd's doing a good job at the moment. He's got clear air and hammering out good times. That last lap was a 2 minute 9.8. He's got a 10.9 second lead over Stephen Richards at the moment. But the question is, if they can get through in one stop, not two, and it'll be really marginal, they play themselves in. And that's a ditto for that remark. For car number 55, Steve Owen, Tony Delberto as well. Even though at the moment they're showing in 11th, and you'll see them as Stevie Richards further back in second place. On corrected terms, based on the strategy there on at the moment, Oscar's car would be six. So there's, there's still a good half dozen cars here. Here's car 55 here. You know, it's still in quite reasonable shape. And the other bloke that's playing himself in, although he's complaining about the brakes once again, is Tander on corrected order at the moment would score some points in um, car number one. We would see him in about seventh on corrected order. And of course, that's a swag of points, although on the racetrack at the moment, he's currently 12th. But he's going to have to nurse the brakes and ease the pace a little bit. At one stage, he was back to being the second quickest car on the road after they'd bled the brakes. But it's obviously not taking the punishment. But this car here is actually doing quite a sterling job at the moment, although you can see it's quite a an oil trace on the back of that car. It'll be a diff oil, some transmission oil on the back. So he's hoping that's not a drama for them, but it's rocking along quite well. And strategy wise, they don't look too bad. Jack Perkins, we've been talking about keeping rotors hot and brake pads hot today, but you took things to new extremes there. What happened? Yeah, just coming up the cutting, out of the cutting there, a bit of a smoke come from behind our switch towers there, and I could smell straight away that it was electrical, and uh, by the time I got onto the onto the Conrod uh, straight there, there was a big flame there, so I wanted to press on, make sure we get it back in case we get back out in the race. There's no point parking it just for a little barbie. No injuries here. You, you, the face is a little bit black like the car. Yeah, no, I'm fine, mate. I, I was, as I said, I wanted to make sure it came back so we could uh, at least have a crack at trying to get back out in the race, because the car's really good. Shane did a good job in his two stints, and no, we're looking forward to a top ten. It's just a shame, but it uh, looks like I can't take a trick around this place. Good help, though, from the Bright Tech boys who helped you out there. Yeah, you know, I think when there's a fire, we'd all help everyone else, and it did start to be a serious flame there for a second, and uh, just had to get out of it, and then uh, we'll give the guys a hand pushing it back. We'll see you at Indy in two weeks. Cheers. Thanks. He's an impressive young man, Jack Perkins. Let's go across to the Stone Brothers Racing garage and I understand that James Courtney can have a chat to us. You got us James? I have. How are you guys doing? We're going okay. David Bernard's out there ninth on the road but our pit smart 
corrected order has you guys in the top four, so things are looking pretty handy. Yeah, the car's been running real good all day. It's, um, I've said all week it's a better race car than, than a qualifying car, and it's, it's proving that today. It uh, hasn't missed a beat so far. Very intense pace, James. Give me a snapshot on tyres, on brakes, on fuel economy. Yeah, our, our brakes are wearing really quite well. We've um, started to change the pads each, each time we've jumped in. Tyres are working well. We haven't locked any or lost any tyres, so it's, uh, it's been really good. Both David and myself have been just coaxing the car a little bit. As you boys know, it's all about those uh, last run after the last pit stop. So uh, until then, we're just cruising around and making sure we're in, in the hunt. OK, mate, thanks for having a chat to us. We're going to get back to the track because there was an incident just there while we were talking to you. Oh, look at, look thanks, at that, Barrett. Look at that bloke behind. By the way, <laughs> by the way, Barrett wants to know if you got sore feet after your stint. <laughs> no, no, the feet are good. They're ready for the salsa this weekend. So it's 1919 James, 77 James, <laughs> not, not Mark. Thank you, mate. Thanks, guys. We're on board with David Bernard. Yeah co-driver for our international audience but James Courtney and our Mark Beretta have been going head to head and dancing with the stars here on seven but probably I just noticed uh, one of the Jim Beam cars and I'm pretty sure it was car 17. Just glimpsed the wall. Yeah glimpsed the wall bounced back okay but it didn't look as though it uh, did too much damage but enough on the way up the mountain to catch my eye while we were talking to James. You're right intense pace it's just when it's on it is really on. Yeah I mean Last year we saw the race early on, sort of in the tens, later in the day when the, there was more rubber. Here we go, here's this replay. Just watch the left-hand side of this car and see whether in fact we, yes, we were right. I thought that's what I saw. So did that shift anything? Well, that's the kind of impact that took the Watts linkage out of uh, car 021. Right on that kind of spot, you can do all sorts of damage, but we're hearing no reports of problems for Will Davis and he's holding down fifth position. Here he comes. So it's on the left-hand side. Mostly the rear was what touch. We'll probably get a good view of it as he comes up towards turn two. We'll have a little sneak peek, but the car doesn't look as though it's behaving badly. In car 16 is Paul Radisic. And uh, does uh, no dramas at all. He's given it a good fend and off he went. And he's. Uh under a bit of pressure at the moment, Paul Radisic. He's battling with that brake issue and uh, he's been told by the team that he is racing for position. He said, I'm having enough trouble racing this car, let alone worry about everybody else. Works to that effect. And that's the message from the car following car 17, saying, I think the toll car's got brake problems and that's exactly right. And it's Will Davison, that voice that you can hear in the background. Interesting motor race this one. There are lots of different little strategies at play. Lots of racing to come. Still plenty of people in the hunt. Lots of guys on the lead lap in good cars and well positioned to the end. Who's got the pace? Well, at the moment, Todd Kelly's showing good pace. Still got that margin. We know that Richards and Winterbottom do. We know that Lowndes and Wincup do. Johnson and Davison. the Wow Falcon. And here's the move. And Will gets down the inside of car number one. Uh, 16, I should say. Jason Barguana is giving you this drive. Just can't stop it, can he? Not effectively, anyway. He's just braking early. Another two minute nine even then for Todd Kelly. Takes the lead out to 10.5 seconds. Neil Tolich, as we have actually told Paul Radisic to uh, the way that Craig managed his stint was to back right off into the chase and just get into there as easily on the brakes as you can, but to back right out of the throttle. It's production car style, trying to nurse the brakes, and normally you can really hammer the brakes around this track. And of course, uh, that, will, that might get you through to the end, but it means that you're going to be eaten alive by those around you. Been coming here a long time, probably. This is probably a straightforward a race over the last couple of years. The, the gods haven't had a say. 
something you know bizarre hasn't fallen out of the sky. Not as many uh, safety car trip wires as we've seen in the past, which is good. Although there have been four of them, but uh, yeah, wheels shooting out of stars and kangaroos and all the rest of it. Still got 50 odd laps to yeah, make sure that something could happen. Shows us time and time again. With Garth Tander this time behind the wheel. He just couldn't get the speed off the car to effectively get it round the corner. And the little glimpse that I had of the brake rotors there before it looked like it might have had some high spots on that uh, disc. Mm, I'm not convinced now. Yeah, but they're uh, pumping the system again. And uh, Daniel went down there before and asked a question and. Uh, Rob wasn't prepared to speculate, but they've put the stubbies of the incompressible jacks in there now to make sure that they can get in under the car legally and uh, they'll have a long, hard look at what the problem is and try and sort it. Well, there's always someone going under the radar at Mount Panorama in the thousand, and Steve Owen and Tony Delberto, the Autobahn Commodore, it's one of the older cars in the field, but it's chipping away. Yeah, we're keeping it going pretty good. As Steve's out there now, I'm not finished for the day, I double stint in the middle there, but the car's really good, no problems with it, so we're looking forward to a good finish. I guess one of the different things that a lot of other teams haven't done here is double 
double stint. Steve's going to double stint through to the end. It's not a hot day, so he can get away with it. Yeah, that's right. It's pretty good in the car. It's not too hot, and uh, conditions really suit that sort of style. What can you do here? Top 10? Well, we'd like to think so. Last year we finished seventh, so we'd like to go maybe one better than that. But for me, I'd like to finish one this year. You know, I've, I've had two starts here and haven't finished, so I'd just like to finish. Fingers crossed. Thank you. Tony Galberto out of the Autobahn Racing entry. Sparks fly on Luke Yildon's car behind him. I just want to sum up something about the championship picture involving this man and what's going on in the Toll HSB garage. The way things are going, they're going to finish without any points. And the way things are going for Triple Eight, car Triple Eight of Jamie Wincup and Craig Lowndes, if they finish second or above, then Jamie Wincup will overtake Rick Kelly and, for that matter, Garth Tander on the championship table. A win would put them both. Wincup and Lowndes ahead of Kelly and Tander. So there's a lot at stake here. That's what's happening in the championship. One man who isn't part of the championship, but is always part of this event, Glenn Seaton. How are you, Glenn? Hi, uh, Manny. Good, thank you. That's good. Nathan Pretty's sitting out there in 15th position on the road. Yeah, You've sort did. of been up and down and back and forth. You've had the whole experience again. <laughs> it's been it's been fantastic. The car's been great so far. Um, we've only got one stop and go right through to the end now, so um, we're, in, we're in pretty good shape. On that basis, Cito, I reckon that... Uh, you'll be just inside the top 10 on the corrected prediction that we're looking at here. We've got a report before that you had a bit of slime in the cockpit on your feet. What was all that about? Yeah, I'm not sure. Under the accelerator pedal, I had a little bit of, uh, I don't know, fluid that was just um, making my pedal a bit slippery. It might have come from the drink bottle as a, at some stage when you got on the, on the brake and I've had a suck and it's come out and gone onto the pedal, but uh, there's nothing coming out around the cylinders or anything that I can see, so... Um, wasn't one of your old Ford mates getting in there and <laughs> giving you a blast of sauce underneath there, was it? <laughs> Probably, but it, does, it isn't stopping us. It's just, um, it's just one of those things that you just feel it under, under your feet and you go, well, just got to be careful here. You said to me this morning that the car was awesome in the, the warm-up and you've thoroughly enjoyed the experience in the car. It's been a fantastic uh, experience, I've got to say, Neil. Um, probably one of the best that uh, experience I've had coming to balance with the team, and I uh, have enjoyed the being a part of the team, and also um, and the experience I've had throughout the week with the car. It's it's an awesome car. They are great cars, and I can see why they are so competitive. You punched out that uh, eight one at one point there, and I thought, oh, that's going to be good enough to get you in the top ten. You probably thought that as well, but it wasn't able to be repeated in that critical qualifying session. Yeah, the, sec the, the qualifying session was actually the grip had gone down and it sort of lost the balance a little bit. Um, so over the, the rest of the time, up until the start of the race, uh, we tried to chase that balance because it wasn't there um, even after um, the qualifying sessions as well. So, um, And then this morning, the car was fantastic. And we had a little bit of a pushing problem early in the race, but um, we've been massaging that as the race goes on to, to make it better. And the car's pretty good now. Cito, we've still got 50 or so laps to go. Just in case we don't get a chance to speak to you again, what is the deal for next year? Do we see you back in red again for the Enduros? Well, naturally, Mark and I haven't sat down and spoke about that yet, but um, I'd love to come back with this team for sure and uh, have the opportunity to have another go, that's for sure. Glenn, you, um, you said to me earlier in the weekend that uh, you, know, you couldn't believe how hard everybody's driving over the top of the hill. You've done a lot of these races now over a long period of time. The intensity, it's quite extraordinary, isn't it? It's amazing now, like you're absolutely on the edge every single lap where uh, in the past years you could actually have a breath, where now you can't. You actually uh, feel like you're doing a qualifying lap every lap you're doing. And it's, um, some, some areas you can get a little bit, get the car can get a little bit away on you and you start to go, oh, Jesus, but um, that's the way you've got to drive it now. No, it's just lucky you're a fit young man, Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Matty. Thanks, mate. See you later. See you, Thanks, mate. guys. So, Todd Kelly... In car number two, he's already gone past the control line. So are Steve Richards and Jamie Winkup, Will Davison. And if you needed to, you know, prove what we just said, have a look at this freight train because, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of people. I think at last count it was 16 people on the lead lap and uh, anything's possible at this point in the motor race. Lots of fast cars and a couple of different strategies, but uh, the, the race is poised in an interesting tilt right at the moment. It could go any which way funny race like that you can feel it brewing we often say when we're just sitting here something's brewing it'll settle down for a while but it never settles down for too long the 
corrected order and the actual order don't look too much different at the moment. And the, the question mark that we have is, can they get the number two HRT car through now on just one stop? And if that's the case, they play themselves into the game as well. David Bernard inside the top 10. Super cheap auto racer of Dumbrell and Wheel. Just outside and in 14th. Just while we were talking to Glenn Seaton there, Nathan Pretty is in 15th position. It's dropped a bit down to 16 degrees. Still pretty warm in the cabin, but nowhere near as bad as what it could be. Probably a bit hotter for Jack Perkins and Andrew Jones though at times. This is Luke Yildon here in 11th. Forget this is round 10 of the V8 Supercar Championship. The next round is on the Gold Coast. Lexmark Indy 300. Doubles up as round 13 of the champ cars as well. Guys, the brake issue, we, we talked about it. We talked about it ourselves amongst us before the thing. We talked about this with the rotor changes and the possible heat affection. Now, 48 cooling vanes. What can happen with these is you get cool near the top but dense into the middle of the rotor here it doesn't get as much cool air and what can happen just as this one it's very hard to see but it scallops out right through the middle and it's hard then once you've got an uneven surface for the pad to mate nice and cleanly and to get that retardation they've had to change them hopefully that'll fix the problem for the number one car there are a few people up and down the pit lane that were uh concerned about rotors but as the weekend wore on it was becoming less of a problem for other teams and, uh, everybody was geared to change them if need be some are obviously speedier than others but, uh, high spots on the rotor uh, was an issue that people were talking about and then the high spot rattles the pad back into the caliper and then the rear brakes too effective and you don't have nearly enough efficiency still in the picture. Well, according to our PitSmart computer, car six, car triple eight, defending champ there that we just saw of Craig Lowndes, Jamie Winkup steering, car 17 of Johnson and Davison, car four of Courtney Bernard, Steve Owen and Tony Dalberto right in the picture as well. So are Engel and Yulden. Currently the computer's suggesting that uh, the number two car's got to do two stops, but the the trick is, if they can sneak through on just one, ooh, Russell pinching a front left at, uh, sorry, Luke Yield in that car at the moment up at Forest Elbow, and uh, didn't quite get the nose where he want. That This is the interesting question at the moment, making pace without burning fuel. Another 209 lap for Todd Kelly. Keep pushing, mate, keep pushing. He's really under the orders now. Has been for quite a few laps. 9 4 for Todd, 9 2 for Stephen Richards, and a 9 flat for Jamie Wincup. This little race tracker here helps remove the cars that are out of the positional picture, put you back in the spot. So the green dot represents Todd Kelly, who last stopped on lap 92. The blue dot is Stephen Richards, not too far behind him. Who last stopped on 98. 7.9 seconds, in fact. The red dot is Jamie Wincup who last stopped on 98. It's like doing bingo in the fourth. But the yellow spot is Will Davison. Who last stopped on 98. And we're currently on lap 115. So it's the number two car that's out of sequence. Do we win a prize for that? <laughs> it's an ordinary act between the two of us, isn't it? <laughs> what a play from the, uh, from the Autobahn entry. Just under eight seconds between Todd Kelly and Stephen Richards. This is an intense group. Sometimes very uncomfortable to be in a group like this. Cars all around you. Raises the cockpit temperatures. Hard to sight the bit of road that you want to be on. Makes it difficult to pick the ideal brake point. Position the car as you'd like. 
Look at Panard on the inside. Oh, he locked it up all the way down there and just slid it into turn one. Car number 67's going to get the blue flag. Paul Morris currently in 18th, so he's got to yield. And if he doesn't, there could be a problem for him. Hundred and fifteen laps down of the super cheap auto Bathurst 1000. Let's just run through the cars completely out of contention as we look at uh, one of the cars that will fight out the win, number six, winner bottom, and Steve Richards. Cars uh, completely out of the race. So the only two, and that's uh, the number fifty super cheap auto McConville Reynolds car that uh, stopped at this very point on the warm-up lap, so before the race began. And the number 12, Team BOC, Andrew Jones and Simon Wells Ford. So just two cars completely out of the race. Others delayed significantly in the pits. So of the cars that are more than uh, two laps down, as we see uh, the Team Surumay number 67 car just uh, almost brush the wall, if not uh, brushing it. We have uh, the sister car to number 67 machine, number 39 from Team Surumay, Fabian Coulthard, many laps down, and Chris Piffer. Both Jack Daniels Racing's machines, number seven, Jack Perkins and Shane Price. It's the car filling with smoke there about uh, just 20 minutes ago. And the sister car, number 11, Marcus Marshall and Kane Scott. Alan Gurr for Brightec with Warren Luff car, number 26. Many laps down after a litany of problems over the course of uh, the race thus far. And finally, after five off-track excursions, all at the same corner, Tom HSV, one of the big four heading into the event today. Number one, Garth Tander, Rick Kelly, leading the championship up until this point, uh, now slipping two or three laps down. Observing Stephen Richards, car number six, going around. So look for a pit stop around lap 130 or thereabouts, where Mark Winterbottom, the pole sitter for this great race, will get behind the wheel of the number six Castrol walk on machine. So the order is. Todd Kelly, Stephen Richards, Jamie Wincup, Will Davison, Paul Radisic. That's your top five. Then it's Jason Bargwana, Dean Canto, Matt Halliday, the Giant Killers, Steve Owen, Car 55 for Autobahn. And rounding out the top ten is Jason Richards uh, and his teammate, Greg Murphy, Car number 51, Tasman Motorsport. Big gaggle of cars there heading up the mountain. The big climb starts with Mountain Straight. So about 12 or 15 cars there heading up the mountain. There's the number one machine back on the track after losing a couple of laps in pit lane. Now it's uh, Garth Tander still at the wheel. is in fifth. This is car number one with Garth Tander behind the wheel trying, trying to salvage what has been a pretty disastrous day. Matty frustrating for FPR team boss Tim Edwards right through earlier on in the day. Blue flags being waved for, uh, for Jamie Wincup and then the cars letting Jamie through. Not so for the FPR car of Steve Richards. They've just had another problem and conversely because of that held up behind Paul Morris in car 67. He's now serving a drive through. He was given a uh, blue flag warning via race control and that goes out on the radio on uh, also via email on the local area network to the teams. And uh, there he goes completing the uh, drive through. And the range that they were, they were going to look at drivers who were lapped down when a lead car got to within three seconds. Once it got to two seconds, if you hadn't reacted, then 
race control was going to issue a warning, and then any subsequent uh, lack of reaction meant that you'd get a, a, a drive through. Matthew Halliday there in car five. Started coming to the range now where car number two, someone really locking up on the run up to the cutting. Where car number two, which is currently enjoying an 8.3 second lead, is uh, going to start thinking about fuel. They can run to lap 126. We're on lap 118. So we'll watch that. And uh, pretty much trading punches with Stephen Richards at the moment, Todd Kelly, for lap speed. Of the top three cars on the leaderboard at the moment, Jamie Wincup is the fastest of them. Pit smart prediction, it's car six and car triple eight that are going to fight this race out at the end. Is there space there? Only just. Gets it done. A little kiss on the exit. Tap on the way through. It's not over yet either. Yeah, because uh, he's on the wrong side of the road when they get to the chase. I don't know that uh, oh dear. he's going to get any favours from Matt Halliday. Three wide, maybe four wide. Something went flying off the back of somebody's car. Thankfully, sanity prevailed. They go through in single file. Jason Richards. He went through. Luke Yulden behind him. Stephen Owen. Caught in a bit of a jam. Now Bernard wants a piece of it. Steve Owen. Side by side at turn one. Bernard, Halliday on the outside. He gets a hip and shoulder and he'll drop a couple of spots for his trouble. Andrew Thompson's in the Jim Bean car. He's side by side with David Bernard. They all lined up and took pot shots at car five. There goes Thompson past Bernard. go again for another ride across the top of the mountain. Ross and Jimmy Stone watching on and we've got... There's trouble up here. Yeah. Someone's had uh, big wall contact and it's car number 33 in the wall at the top and this will trigger a safety car I'd imagine and I reckon look for car number two to come straight into the pits for fuel. Mm. Now, having said that, that could blow their strategy. Dean Cando is behind the wheel of this car. Dino, are you okay? So do they take the stop in the HRT car or not? Yes, they do. So that they'll need another stop at this rate. The little one. And let's hope that everything's okay at the top of the mountain as Scaife prepares to leap in. So Dean Cando at the wheel of the Valvoline entry at the top of the hill. He's done a super job in there. He really was pushed to the limit. Can you hear me, Dean? He's on the car. I don't think you'll see any of the other key runners come in with their current fuel state, but we'll wait and see on their track position. There's a whole bunch of them coming out of the chase at the moment. Triple Eight's already halfway up Mountain Street, so 17 and 6. They're up near turn 2 now. GRM car of Ritter and McLean. They're in as well. Trying to make contact with Dean Canto up the top of the mountain. Car 8. Wilson and Barguana. And as Matt Halliday comes in, car number 2, Mark Scaife will go out and he'll join on the end of the train that includes a bunch of people queued up behind Paul Radis issues at turn two. So in terms of track position and having to do okay, a wee stop at the end just to get a bit of extra fuel, it probably doesn't look too good for two at this point. 
the, the Jesus blank is almost, it's a bit tossed out. All this was triggered because of car 33. You're on board with Dean Canto at the top of the mountain. Wow. He hit the wall on the left. Oh. He hit the wall on the left and then uh, cannoned into the wall on the right side at Reed. That's the, that was the view from Jason Richards. This will be the view at the end of all that. So the impact goes much further back. By now, it's just a matter of the dirt and co stopping the car. A little bit earlier. Here it is again in replay. Look up. There he is, whack. He just picked up the wall right at the very end of the exit there. And it immediately fired the car to the right side of the road. Lee Holdsworth, the team, hadn't been able to get radio communication. He's on screen there, he's OK, but the car's out of the road. Yeah, it's really disappointing. We were running in quite a good spot there, but um, it looked like he had a bit of a, a moment coming out of that corner and, um, and just, just clipped the wall. But, yeah, really disappointing for the guys because we were, we were running a really consistent, uh, good race. Looked like the fuel mileage was pretty good there. You were, you were buying that ticket, as Neil Crompton says, you were lined up and ready to go. Yeah, the fuel economy was, was quite good, and we were hoping for another safety car just to get us through to the end uh, with one more stop. But um, it didn't happen, and, you know, like uh, like Jack said not long ago, there's always next year. Looks like there's a bit of damage. The boys have got a little bit of work to do before Indy. Doesn't look too bad. I mean, he, he just clipped that inside wall and, and went out to the outside and, and hit that maybe a little bit harder, but... Um, yeah, the boys will get it back for the next round. They were having a good run too. Lee Holdsworth and Dean Canto. He's a fit young man, Canto, but he's copped a pretty sizeable whack. Lee Holdsworth and Gary Rogers Motorsport, the Holden team, won uh, the Oran Park race meeting uh, two months ago. It's Oran Park in Sydney, about uh, two and a half hours uh, east of the Bathurst 1000 circuit in New South Wales. But uh, their luck uh, out today. Gary Rogers Motorsport, the 2000 winners of uh, the great race with Garth Tander and Jason Barguana, both those drivers uh, moving on to other teams. So under safety car conditions, there is our new race leader, car number six, Stephen Richards and Mark Winterbottom for Ford Performance Racing. Stephen Richards Sorry. behind the wheel at the moment and behind him, the second place car of Jamie Wincup, car 888, for 888 rebadge this year as Team Vodafone. So just going down the leaderboard now. So it's uh, Richards from Win Cup, Will Davison in third, Paul Radisic now the best of the Toll HSV dealer team cars in fourth position. Jason Richards in the car, he's sharing with Greg Murphy in fifth position, then Luke Gulden, Steve Owen, Jason Barguana and Andrew Thompson David Bernard, car number four, rounds out our top ten. Do you want to go past the team? Do you want me to queue behind them? Never mind. Plenty of drinking. Uh, they haven't come in yet, mate. We'll, we'll just go past and keep going. Okay. Fifth safety car period for the race so far in four and a half hours. There's a good view of the brand spanking new Mount Panorama Resort that uh, is set to open in the coming months. Driver change there for the Radisic bed car. So Paul Radisic gets out of the vehicle, the number 16 machine, a pad change on that car. Craig Baird will climb behind the wheel. Good points haul on offer. Also doing the rotor change on that car with a quick release system the teams have developed over the last couple of months. time under safety car conditions takes about five minutes for the field to do a lap so uh, little danger of that Radisic bed car going a lap down the field still got uh, virtually a full lap before it comes round and that car would go down a lap so that's not going to happen
Stephen? Yeah, I am. G'day, mate. We're just going to have a quick chat to you. You've had pace. You've been very consistent with 40 laps to go. How is that car number six feeling? Car feels fantastic. We haven't got any complaints at all. Richo Cromley here. Massive pace today. And uh, how are your brakes and everything holding up? No, mate, really good. I've sort of been stroking along a bit, so um, Frosty, you have something good to finish the race with. All right. I can hear you've got a bit of feedback. We'll get out of your ears and let you concentrate. Good luck for the balance, mate. Thanks. Straight down to business, even behind the safety car. Look at the focus in his eyes. That has been a consistent answer from that garage and those two drivers pretty much from Thursday right through. The car's been fine, nothing to chase, no tail to chase. And that is why they're right up at the top of the queue. And also we've got Grant Denyer down in the uh, WPS garage. Hello, mate. Hello, boys. How are you doing? We're doing OK. <laughs> this uh, race likes to throw up a few things, doesn't it? It sure does. At the moment, we just feel like a constant moving uh, hurdle for everyone. Um, we've got a fantastic fuel economy in our car and we're running low 11s in our times pretty consistently. But we're expecting far more safety cars at the start of the morning, and that's kind of thrown us completely out. So. With a new rule of blue flags, they're really aggressive on them. Uh, the moment a, a car uh, from the front pack comes anywhere near, you have to yield. So all we're doing now is constantly yielding. So anyway, you absorb all this information, you come back and you learn every year and have a solid one next year. Yeah, Grant, we've only had five safety car interventions and uh, by comparison to races in the recent, recent past, that's uh, quite different. And after the hullabaloo at Sandown with blue flags, I guess we, we needed to expect what happened. Yeah, look, absolutely. I think, look, it's probably a good idea that they are a bit more aggressive on uh, on the blue flags because it doesn't interrupt the race for those that uh, that really matter at the, at the front five or ten. And uh, But at the moment, it doesn't allow, allow us to have much of a race either, um, considering we've got great pace in the car and we went till 38 laps and before we had to actually come in and fuel. So uh, the boys have been working very hard on, on that kind of thing, but uh, we're just forced to yield, otherwise they give us another black flag like they did earlier on. So uh, we're out of the game, but, uh, you know, this place is like Neil. Every lap is a lesson. Every time you come here is a lesson and JB told me a little earlier on that it took him 10 years to master one section of the track, so that's frightening news. <laughs> exactly. You got that right. Grab your homework, go home and study up again for the next 12 months. Thanks, mate. I'm on banana duties. No worries. <laughs> See you later. Grant Denyer there. He's going to be piloting around in car 10 with his mate Michael Caruso. The other car in that garage, car number 8, Jason Barguana and Max Wilson, currently 15th. Three-quarter race distance now, 120 laps complete. Soon to be 120 laps under our belt of the 161-lap marathon here. Fastest time for the race's completion uh, is uh, a whisker under six and a half hours. Actually, six hours, 19, way back in uh, 1991 when there were no safety cars. And Mark Skay from Jim Richards were victorious that day. So uh, we're not going to break the race record, but nor will we have the longest ever race. As we see, the number 33 car loaded back. Sad sight that on the tilt tray. That uh, team uh, certainly one of ten contenders for a podium here this weekend. Dean Canto uh, getting it all wrong there, going across the top of the mountain, and that's the day done for that car. So our leaderboard is Stephen Richards, Jamie Wincup, Will Davison. Truck pulls off now, so we'll be uh, under racing conditions uh, in a uh, minute's time or so. The glass uh, on the right-hand side of that car uh, being uh, blown out of the window socket there. Truck pulls off uh, at the top of the mountain, so racing to get underway in uh, a minute or two time. In fact, uh, the cars now behind the safety car will complete one more full lap before we go back racing again. The giant killers of V8 Supercar racing in the pits now. That's Steve Owen. We'll do a double stint to the end of the race, doing a pad change there. Inside the top 10 at the point of pitting. Worrying sign there with that Autobahn uh, signage on the back of the car partly obscured by uh, oil leaking from the rear of that Commodore. The smallest team in the field, number 55, Autobahn Racing. Yet another stop, brake-related stop for Rick Kelly and Garth Tander. A 
at least six or seven stops now for that car. Four or five laps down on the leaders. The Owen Kelly Cobra coloured car, number five, the second team machine from Ford Performance Racing uh, pitting and uh, going back into the race there. That would be Owen Kelly in the car for the run for the flag, now taking over from uh, New Zealand's Matt Halliday, the uh, A1 team uh, driver of a season or two ago for Team New Zealand. Kelly won the championship last year under the most controversial of circumstances with a last round clash. And uh, pumping the pedal, they've put quite a lot of brake fluid in it now, quite a bit of it spilt as well. And I understand that there may have even been contact with the medical car, car one, such was their brake drama. I heard a bit of chat on the radio about that. Look at the oil beneath it. Also going to see a uh, rear roll centre adjustment on uh, the number four Dave Bernard, James Courtney car. They're going to lift that most likely. Lights are out on the WPS Chrysler safety car. We'll go racing when they come onto the front straight again this time. One stop to run for basically everybody in the field. When it happens is the interesting question for the cars that are at the front of the pack at the moment it's later than sooner we'll detail all that in a moment we're racing once again let them sort themselves out before we run through the scenarios for you richards and wind cup took about 20 seconds or less to get the battle back on behind them is will davison up over the rise jason richards he's got the lights on Stephen making sure that he holds track position here from Jamie Wincup up at turn two. Will Davison tucked in behind. So we'll expect to see these guys in in around about 10 laps for their final stop. And then there's a few others who are fueled to an awkward. Car 67 is going to get a uh, pit lane drive through. That was the reason for the pause there. So Paul Morris will uh, do another tour through the pit lane. People like uh, Mark Scaife, Todd Kelly, Jason Bagwana, Max Wilson, Jason Bright, Adam Macro, Paul Radisich, Craig Baird, Owen Kelly, Matt Halliday. They're fueled. Their fuel closes off in the mid 150s at the moment. So like everybody else, they have to take a stop. Their windows a little later. So it's one stop to run for everybody. This is a battle for position. And expect to see them in in about 10 laps. It was an onboard ride with Wing Cup. And it'll be the fifth stop for Ford Performance Racing. And it'll be the fourth stop. Oh, that does not look good. Started off in the dirt. He managed to save it, though, Nathan Pretty. So just to finish that remark, it'll be the fourth stop for Lowndes and Wincup and the fifth stop for Richards and Wiederbottom. And it's on at the front. The gap is a tenth of a second. And just like the restart, Wincup yeah, pulls you know up. What to do now, mate. Can't do behind you. Alongside He's Richards. Got He's got to run. He'll have him up the inside here. Richo's trying to ease across. He's narrowed down the gap. There's nothing in it. He's going to run with him, though, Jamie. He'll keep the argument going. Crisscrosses now. There's some traffic in, mi in the mix, too. Gart Tander is the traffic up ahead. Who gets out of the way? Because he can't afford to be black flagged. There may be a possibility of slip one for some points at the end of the day. Pretty slim, though. 
that was just wild. It was interesting to see the eyes of Stephen Richards when we had a chat to him under safety car conditions. Normally they'll be nice and relaxed. But this is money time. Yeah, I didn't want to keep the chat going. I could tell that uh, it was the last thing on his mind chatting to us. We need to let him get back to the race at the moment. He's got his hands full. He really had the race face on because he was thinking about what was ahead and probably knowing that this kind of challenge was going to be thrown down. And there's more coming. Because Will Davison and Jason Richards not too far away either. It's going to be a critical pit stop for both these teams, this next one, a real test of everybody involved in both groups and how efficient they are, how quickly the drivers get in and get out of the pit lane, what their in and out laps are like. Across the top section of the circuit and down this part, Richards has managed to pull away a little bit. Just clear himself of the pressure from behind. Jason Richards, the Tasman Motorsport Car 51, sandwiched in between Will, Davis, Will Davison and Luke Yulden. interesting thing to consider. I've just been looking at the number of laps that drivers have done. Triple Eight had the benefit of being able to leave Craig Lowndes in the car and in the case of Ford Performance Racing they'll need to put Mark Winterbottom back in because he hasn't done enough laps to meet the minimum requirement. And uh, not that there's any difference in speed between either combination and either car but it just means you've got to do it and uh, that can often give rise to the possibility of a little stumble. David Bernard still piloting car four. Richard Lyons, car double eight. Ninth on the road behind them is Mark Scaife. Matty, it was an interesting stop for FPR. Car five came in the Halliday Kelly car. Basically, they just gave it a tickle of fuel. Matt Halliday had to hop out. It was an unplanned stop. He's not feeling all that well from fumes in the car. Stephen Richards, Jamie Wincup, Will Davis, Jason Richards, Luke Hewitt, Andrew Thompson, David Bernard, Richard Lyons, Mark Scape, Nathan Pretty. Top 10 at the moment. And Stephen Richards has just done the fastest split of the race to the second sector. So it took a little while for him to get temperatures and pressures back to recovery on the Castrol Ford Performance Racing Ford. That was probably why he was a little vulnerable, so his tyres pressured down a little bit. They may be running a slightly different tyre pressure strategy than the 888 car. Oh. That lap counter on your screen, you're looking around 132, 133 for the guys that we've been mentioning. Richards, Windcup, Davison, etc. That's when their fuel window will close. They will have to get in by then. Russell, top five, but you've made more pit stops than you'd like to have today. Oh, mate, we've been up and down like a yo -yo, you know, you had a tyre that uh, we got cut a bit earlier, had a bit of a flat spot on it and just tore itself off, so we're very lucky to get away with that one because it actually blew on me going down Comrod, so luckily I could dive back in the pits, that was one stop. Uh, we had to queue up behind James when we both ran out of fuel right at the same time. You know, that was 22 seconds down the drain. So we've had a bit of a shocker, and all of a sudden we're back up in fifth. I just can't believe it. What have you got left when you step in? Have you got any pace to fight with these guys? Uh, look, we, we've got a little bit of an engine problem. We're, we're quite a bit down on power down the chute. The thing's good across the top, and that's where we're making all the time back up again. So, mate, uh, I, I think we'll be all right. We're going to throw some pads in it. Um, we've got one more stop. I'll jump back in, mate. Might as well have a go, eh? Go bang the lid on and put the eyes on. Well, nothing to lose. So uh, there's a few of the guys in front of us that got plenty of to lose. So if I get on their bar, mate, they'll know I'm there. The enforcer returns to the mountain. You got it. The horns are coming out. New lap record on that last lap for Stephen Richards, who responds to the Jamie Wind Cup pressure. A two minute 8.5952. And four tenths of a second faster than Wind Cup. A great lap from Stephen Richards when it was required.
one that jumps into the record books, eclipsing the number that was held only by a tiny whisker by Mark Scaife. Look at that. It's serious business for Stephen Richards. Two-time winner on the mountain. Back to back in 98 and 99. He's done it in a Ford and a Holden and now he's piloting the FPR car number six and pushing the limits. Matty, I don't want to mention the R word, but I'm going to rain. Radar sweep suggests there might be some. Triple Eight have just asked me if we get any feedback from the chopper, so there's some teams worrying. Wouldn't be a day without it. Wouldn't be a race without it. Forwards, one, two, three in the great race. Steve Richards. Jamie Wincup, Will Davison, get the impression that uh, number 17 car, Will Davison and Steve Johnson in third position, just waiting to pounce if these two cars on screen now happen to get together because both drivers, Richards and Wincup, look very racy. Over Skyline now, beautiful shot, popping into view through the S's there. Record a 126.8 to the end of the second sector. Can he keep the lap going to lower his own lap record? Not quite, but still able to punch out an impressive lap time there, 208.6. So just one tenth of a second off his own lap record as he tries to stay in front of Car Triple Eight, Jamie Wincup, the reigning champion. between crews begin for the fastest pit stop. Sixteen cars now on the lead lap, so uh, the regular, if short, safety car periods has uh, kept a number of vehicles in contention. So the final makeup of the top 15 places where the points are handed out won't be determined until the very last. Again, Steve Richards posts, posts the fastest time to the end of that second sector, which is the beginning of Conrad Strait where they are now. So again, let's just watch to see if he can break his own race record. He did a 208.55 and lowered his own time. Wincup responded with a 208.465. That is the new lap record, and that's the situation from the Bureau. There's, well, there's stuff hanging around, but it's really sort of just out of our range at the moment. But, gee, the speed of these two cars in the front, car six and car triple eight, 
over the course of the last three or four laps has been extraordinary. Awesome pace from both these guys. They're really applying the pressure to each other, trading lap records. Will Davison is also joining this party because he's done the fastest split of the race to the end of the first sector on this lap. And just to go back to the point I made a little bit earlier, both these guys have to stop and they need to do it shortly. We've already heard radio communication that car 51 will be in in the next two and a half laps. Jason Richards at the wheel of that. And Triple Eight, from a strategic viewpoint, had the option of either leaving Jamie Wincup in the car or putting Craig Lowndes in the car if they so choose, and he's dressed and ready in case. However, in the case of Ford Performance Racing, they do have to put Mark Winterbottom in the car because he has not completed the driver minimum. No driver is allowed to do more than 107 laps, and the other driver, therefore, has to do 54 as a minimum. And so, uh, for Mark Winterbottom, He's only done 47 laps so far in this race, so he must do the last stint. Neil Triple Eight getting ready now. Word is that they will bring that car in in the next lap or two. They are getting set to bring Jamie Wincup in. Well, look how close this margin is now, and the two of them are literally running out of racetrack here. On that particular lap, Stephen Richards a 2 minute 8.68, Jamie Wincup a 2 minute 8.55, Will Davison a 2 minute 8.66. He's not very far behind this group, you know, it's only a very small margin. A couple of seconds back, then Jason Richards. It's really hotting up. Will's 4.6 seconds off the leader, Jason Richards is 7 seconds off the leader. You can see that J.B. Wincup is only fractionally behind. And this will put mega pressure on both crews. They cannot afford a fault. The inlaps have got to be perfect. The drivers have got to pull up on the spot. Their outlaps have got to be perfect on cold tyres. That's not easy when you're under pressure with someone right on your tail. We need to go change the nut. Jam nut. One of the wheels cross-threaded. Valuable time being burnt there for car 88. Bella, once the car drops, you're free to go. Front left is the problem. OK, where you going? Watch your bit speed. That hurt. Let's get our equipment. Come on, let's get our equipment up. Alex Hunter now in that car, and now they've got to reset. Think about Jamie Wincup coming in. Big oversteer across the left hand of uh, Stephen Richards' light fuel tyre condition is now down. The track's rubbing up the ideal conditions above with a cloud cover, but Richo is at the maximum with that car, brings up the dust on the exit of the final turn. A 2 minute 8.68 for Stephen, a 2 minute 8.63 for Jamie. Nothing in it, four tenths of a second. A lot of chatter on the radios now as we get closer to that mark of these guys having to come in. Driver changes on the way. The last four laps have gone in favour of Jamie Wincup on the time. But he hasn't got past Stephen Richards. And it is getting darker outside, as Daniel reported before. Car number 22, I think that's Glenn Seaton getting back in that car, glimpsed the helmet. They're just making sure that floor's clean that we spoke to him about as we monitor that margin between the leaders. Seto on board, and away he goes. And they would have made that rear roll centre change on the number four car too. 
keep an eye on the times down here at Holden Racing Team. And Nathan Pretty's pace in car 22 was on par with Mark Scaife at car 2. But the question is for Scaife, he does have to pit a game, but the question is, when are they going to bring him in? There's been a bit of chat here. They leave him out. He's got some fuel to run with here. These guys that are setting the pace up front have to pit very, very soon. He's got more fuel on board, which can take him further. Maybe that can take advantage of a safety car here. But they've got the tyres out. Robbie Starr is ready and waiting. So it doesn't look like they're going to play that. They're going to pit now and run it through to the end and hope for a safety car to push them back through. Yeah, they can go to 154 on the current load, but it'll depend on track position and... Uh... This is the focus at the moment. And D uh, James Courtney has climbed into car number four, just to confirm. This is a beauty of a battle. Jamie again, wing cup, put out another two tenths of a second. He is right on the rear of Stephen Richards. Remember we saw the back of Stephen's car having a little slide before he did a two minute 8.96 on that lap. Two minute 8.77 for Jamie. The official margin at the finish line Two tenths of a second. Will Davison's in in car 17 as Richo goes defensive at turn two. So car number 17 has peeled out of this group. Neil, the adjustment on James's car was a roll centre adjustment up two turns. It's four mil. And that's what we predicted uh, from the radio conversation. David Bernard said the back of the car was rolling around too much. So they took that stop. There was a turn of roll centre with, with the Scaife car. Stephen Johnson steps back on board car 17. But Scaife has left out in front of the pits. Car 51, the Tasman machine, trailing behind them now in the pit lane. Russell Ingle stepping back into car 9 for the run for the chequered flag. Car 17 rejoins of Stephen Johnson. Behind car two. Stick bar mountain cam tracks. Now expect these blokes in any tick. They were fueled to a maximum of 133. They're on the 132nd lap. And we will watch both of these crews like hawks. The most important pit stop of the year. Richards goes through, wing cup shadows. The gap last time around was two tenths of a second. So this will come down to the cruise. Off goes Richards. Wing cup waits. Richard will arrive at the maximum. Winterbottom to get in. He must do that. He hasn't uh, achieved the minimum required laps. That's been a brilliant effort by Stephen Richards. Always consistent but super quick as well. Great stint from Stephen. Now winter bottoms in. Checking the radiator intake, cleaning the screen. There's a switch flicked in the car, I noticed as well. Go, 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 go! Oh, slow. 88 litres. Right off, right off, and uh, reset fuel, reset fuel. So it was a timed balance, stop. Balance, but it's okay, it's Probably put it in based on weight. Know the flow rates, but weight's the accurate way of doing it. But uh, we know there was something in the order of about 80 to 90 litres. These laps will be so important for Mark Winterbottom. He's been sitting out. This is a vital outlap for Mark Winterbottom on cold tyres. He's got to push like a demon. going on here that uh, must have a problem it's back Your work for the Holden Racing team of Scaife and Kelly and this will be a deciding moment for Jamie Winkup 
In he comes. Oh, he's had a moment. He's in the gravel. No! A massive moment there. A race-changing moment for Jamie Wincup. Somehow he managed to pull it okay, back. Jamie, I've got you. Watch it for speed, 10% throttle. Just getting your drink hose, and your helmet hose. Release your belt, radio out. He was flawless until the entry into the pits. Now he comes in. Hold. 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 Everyone clear the car, please. The difference was two Hold. tenths of a second. Hold. Mark Hold. Winterbottom's now coming along the Hold. main straight. He's Hold. represented by the blue dot. Restart, watch your speed, watch your speed. Wind Cup will come out behind him. There goes okay, Winterbottom okay, in okay, car okay. six. We have cold tyres. The uh, wires and bars have not been changed, so you need to set them, please. A big, big net gain for the Ford Performance Racing crew. And a simple error from Jamie Winkup now puts Craig Lowndes in the position to have to fight like never before. 28 laps to go. An unbelievable moment. Jamie Wincup, that is incredible. What happened? Uh, just, uh, it was a race in the pits, really. We had to uh, have a quick inlet and get in the pits quick and change over for us to take the lead and uh, just push the limit a little bit too far, run off the track. Looks like we're still second, of course, so uh, not good, but uh, relatively happy with my skin apart from that. Thanks, mate. Thanks. Well, it was a slow pit stop for Mark Scaife and the Holden Racing Team, you might have noticed there. Scaife brushed the wall uh, up around the top of the mountain and the team just wanted to take the time to make sure that everything was OK for the next 30 or so laps. How on earth did Jamie Wincup salvage this situation? Because it goes bad here, it gets awful about here. Almost now he's back on the track and he manages to pull it together with the aid of a bit of grass, flicks it right and gets back in under control. Probably on the downshift and certainly had a huge amount of pace going there. May not have got round there anyway, but very lucky not to be buried in the gravel. If Jason there's another Bright. safety car, it could all change again. In this year's super cheap auto, Bathurst 1000, Jamie Wincup just overcooking it coming into the pits there. However, anything could happen. And since the introduction of the safety car here at Bathurst, uh, it's a very rare occurrence indeed that we don't have a safety car period, an incident in the last 30 laps of the race. So all is not lost for car 888. Craig Lowndes now behind the wheel. Here is car eight, so the single digit there. Max Wilson and Jason Barguana. They are still very much in the battle for the top 10. leader is Jason Bright. He is yet to pit. However, once uh, the pit stops are completed for the likes of Bright, indeed uh, Bright and Owen Kelly are the last two cars yet to pit. Once they pit, the leaderboard will show Mark Winterbottom at the top of the, at the, top of the table. Sixteen cars remain on the lead lap. The last of those, the number sixteen, Cole Mobile of uh, Craig Baird. Twenty-seven months remaining. D one. So Jason Bright goes past, goes past the pit entry. He'll do at least one more lap before he pits. Heads up the mountain again. Headlights ablaze.
saw car eight pit a uh, minute or so ago. That was Jason Bargwana in the pits to hand over to Max Wilson, a regular driver of car eight for the run to the flag. Jason Bright from Owen Kelly there, the last two cars get to pit to complete their final pit stop. Then it's Mark Winterbottom currently in third, our effective race leader there. Then Craig Lowndes, Stephen Johnson. So effectively forwards one, two, three in the race once pit stops are complete. And Stephen Owen, Greg Murphy, Russell Lingle, James Courtney, Alex Davison, and the veteran Glenn Seaton now in 11th position. Glenn Seaton making becoming the most capped driver of uh, the current batch of steerers at Bathurst. He made his debut way back in 1983 here at Bathurst. Corrected the pit smart order will show the car six though of Mark Winterbottom in control. Jason Bright has one more stop to do, but the tantalizing thing here, he's got enough fuel at the moment to get him to about lap 156. So if anything else happens in this race, there's no compelling reason at the moment why Jason needs to stop. So you press on, look to the west, there's a bit of weather. And uh, he may well strategically play a card here that gets him right back in the game. So at the moment, he's still got a stop to do. When that happens, that'll basically not put him out of business, but it's going to hurt him. However, if he can play it along, not very far from 156 to 161, if there's another safety car or whether intervenes, this guy's going to be right in the game. Safely in the FPR garage at the moment is Stephen Richards after a very long, hard and incredibly fast stint. Stephen, congratulations on that stint. It was uh, certainly one to watch. Is that one of the most important stints you've ever done? Yeah, absolutely, no doubt. You know, we've, uh, I suppose you, you, you pace yourself a little bit with, in terms of during your stints to make sure you've got something to race with. I was, I was pretty aware that there could be a safety car and I wanted to have something to, to go out with um, towards the end of the stint there. So that, that worked perfectly. The car is just fantastic. Um, the guys are doing a great job. and. You know, we're still a long way from home, but it's a good position to be in. Yeah, and also, when we last spoke to you, mate, was just under that safety car conditions, and you were really in the zone, because I guess you knew what was about to come, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I knew I knew where the guys were, and I knew that that, that, um, that stint was going to... That little stint there was going to be all important. So, um, you know, thankfully, we've got a great FPR Falcon that we can press on and, and do a good job, and Frosty will do a great job out there now. Richo, it looked like it took a couple of laps for those tyres to just come back up and uh, you're a little bit vulnerable for just a moment. When they normalised, it was good and you start to punch out lap record pace. Yeah, that's right, Cromley. The, um, the car was a little bit... Uh, I probably didn't pay enough attention to the to the, um, to the the safety car laps to the tyres. So um, it's been a little bit like that all day long, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we've made a little change to the tyre pressures then, so we should be right. It's an amazingly intense motor race and we saw it reflected in what happened to Jamie at the pit lane entry. And even just looking at these images of Frosty at the moment, he's picking up the dirt as you're smiling as us. I mean, everyone's on it. They're absolutely wrung out. Mate, I've never come in, into pit lane so so half out of control, mate, as I did just then. I, I, I probably wasn't too far away from doing a Jamie myself. <laughs> well, it's been an amazing spectacle. It's all going beautifully for you at the moment. So fingers crossed. Good luck for the balance. Fingers crossed, mate. We're so, so far, so good. Cheers. Thanks. Stephen Richards will spend the rest of this afternoon nervously pacing around the FPR garage, watching the screens. Matt Willing on his teammate, Mark Winterbottom. Thanks, Matty. Big news for Rick Kelly fans and Garth Tander fans and Toll HSV fans. Car one is out of the Bathurst 1000. That is disappointing for the championship. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit sad. In the morning warm-up today, we had a fantastic car. On full tanks, we did a low uh, 208. So if we had a, had the brake package to be out there, I'm pretty sure we'd be up the front. So a little sad, but uh, we're just going to have to fight really hard for the rest of the championship and try and get back. Trish, go and grab a word. Garth Tanner's just over here. We'll move over. Garth, that's a disappointing end of the race. 
Hard, and, and a very, very difficult car to drive. Oh, yeah, look, you know, we're, we're, we're risking the car, really, rather than, you know, touring around out there. So, uh, you know, we've just got to put this one behind us and make sure we get the cars, um, keep the cars straight so we can go to Indy and uh, fight back in the championship. There was always a risk putting Rick and I together, but as it turned out, both the cars suffered the same thing. So, um, you know, it won't happen again. We batted up to it some, some new rotors. Did that help for a while? No, no, something's happening. It's boiling the fluid in in the uh, in the rear brake line somewhere on both cars. So we, you know, you're only getting five or six laps with a real pedal, then it goes to the floor, and it's it's not worth it around here. Get it back in Indy. Good luck, thanks. Yeah, thanks, mate. Yeah, the championship picture is a little bit complex. Rick Kelly and Garth Tander will leave this round without any points. It'll make a difference though if they win Cup and Lounds, get up to second. We'll finish it on first. The championship will change. Mathis is known for its drama, also known for the toll that takes. Bad pun there on uh, the toll that this racetrack often takes on the championship, but leading cars and the favourites heading into the event. The unique nature of this circuit uh, and the high braking forces required to uh, often test those components to the max. And uh, as we heard from Garth Tander there, that's what's happened with the championship leader. Big hit will be for Toll HSV deal team in the team's championship. So it's not only a driver's championship like we have in Formula One with the constructor's championship. We have a team's battle and uh, Toll HSV was leading that. And uh, by the end of this race, they may Long, may no longer be in that position, particularly as their greatest rivals, the two uh, team Vodafone cars, are still well in the running up the front of the field. Jamie Wincup, Craig Lowndes car on screen now with Craig Lowndes uh, behind the wheel. Jamie Wincup uh, was perfect last year in the race. Made the pivotal move overtaking uh, Todd Kelly in his second stint, giving Craig Lowndes a perfect car to run to the flag. And he got to within the pit lane of putting together two perfect Bathurst drives in a row, but unfortunately it wasn't to be just a minor error. As we heard, uh, he just had to push to get into the pits there, very much like uh, a Formula One race in that uh, the final pit stops, the in-lap and the out-lap proving critical to the result. Rounds now winding up, rounding up rather, the Team Surimay car car that we expected to figure in the top ten. And uh, within moments of car number one, the lead toll HSV vehicle being retired. We have the very sorry sight of Craig Baird uh, climbing out of car 16. That's Garth Tander's uh, regular championship running car. And uh, both toll cars now officially out of the race. <laughs> That's been the problem. There's nothing. Every time they went for the brakes, they got nothing. Nothing. That's what I thought. You said nothing. I thought, should he get... Must not nothing. That car must be okay. And then the next lap. And the Tasman Motorsport entry car number three, Mark Noski. I think he's needed a bit of a helping hand to get up there too. And to give that car a bit of a push.
remember that uh, key guys in this race, Winterbottom in six lounds in Triple Eight, they're fueled to the end. The other car that we spoke about before, car number 25, Jason Bright, who leads the race, got a 28.9 second margin. He's got to do another stop. That's assuming things run as they are and there's no safety car intervention or weather intervention. But even if he does stop, somewhere between now and lap 156 and we're on the 141st, because of the margin, normally when you stop, you've got to pull in, put 120 litres of fuel in to get into the pits, fuel and get out of the pits. It'll take you about 64 seconds. But Jason doesn't need to fuel for that long. He just needs a splash to get him to the end of the race. So Pit Smart suggests at the moment that Jason Bright's on target for podium anyway, a third. They've snuck under the radar, Neil. What they did in that last safety car, they stopped three times. The first time they stopped for fuel and pads, but they left Adam Macro in the car because they were still doing the calculations on whether he'd done enough laps. So they brought him in again. Jason Bright jumped in. They topped it up with fuel again. And before the green flag flew again, they topped it up with fuel once more. It's not quite enough to get them to the end. They're watching the radar screens down here. Jeff Slater, the engineer for this car. Watching on, the rain's moving in a little bit on the radar screen, but it's going to be enough. So the way it's looking at the moment, when he eventually has to come in for his pit stop, he should fan out in about fourth spot and be a chance for a podium. Yeah, clever bit of strategy play on their part. And Adam Macro's got 56 laps against his name, which gets him above the minimum 54. And uh, here's the race tracker that shows you precisely the scenario at the moment. Green dot, Jason Bright in turn two. Second is the blue dot at the start-finish line, Mark Winterbottom. And uh, Craig Lowndes coming onto the start-finish line there, a little red dot. And that shows you where they are around this racetrack. So for Jason Bright and the Fujitsu crew, they will be watching that lap counter edge towards lap 156. That's as far as we understand he can go on the current fuel. Well, Dick Johnson, we spoke earlier this morning and I asked you how you go about winning this thing. You said you get to about 30 laps to go and you want to be in the top three or four and then you go. Well, that's basically the plan. You know, the rest of the day is about positioning yourself with strategy and things like that. But uh, the scary thing at the moment, I think, is bright. We just don't know um, how, when he's about to stop. I know he's got to stop, but it all depends how much fuel he's got to take on. It's only 30 seconds through pit lane. And, you know, that sort of really can throw a cat among the pigeons. Dick, how's Steve travelling at the moment for fuel and brakes? No, they'll go right through the end, not a problem at all. Good news, you're feeling OK? Well, fingers crossed, mate. I've got everything crossed, I can tell you. <laughs> all right, good luck, Dick. Thanks, Thanks, buddy. I can partially answer that question. Currently fueled to get him to 156. He only needs 20 litres of fuel. It goes in at the rate of about four litres a second. Half a dozen cars now out of the super cheap auto Bathurst 1000. So that's both Jack Daniels Racing, Commodores, the Black Mobiles, the Toll HSV, dealer team cars. Both of those are out of the race. The number three Gary, number 33 Gary Rogers Motorsport uh, Commodore of Dean Canto and uh, Holdsworth, the number 50 McConville Reynolds super cheap auto Commodore. So uh, there's a pattern there. Plenty of uh, Commodores out of the race as we see uh, James Courtney now getting around the Steve Owen number 55 Commodore. So that is a battle for seventh position. Stone Brothers racing now in seventh and ninth. As uh, seventh and eighth now that we see Steve Owen peel into the pits for his final pit stop. Continuing down the list of cars uh, out of the race uh, is Team BOC's number 12 mobile of Andy Jones and Simon Wills, and uh, quite recently the number three Tasman Motorsport car, Jay Verdnick and Mark Noski. Looking at the smallest team in the V8 supercar paddock. Small but highly effective with uh, Good communication there, getting Steve Owen back into the race. He will drop out of the top 10, but he has 19 laps to uh, get back in it. That team scored seventh place finish last year with Owen and uh, veteran Tony Longhurst. Longhurst now retired from uh, great race competition. 
and the Fujitsu series uh, series leader Tony Dalberto doing a double shift in this car joining Steve Owen. Actually the only team that uh, we are aware of of doing a double shift is the car on screen now. Stone Brothers Racing traditionally uh, double shifters given that uh, they split their lead drivers across their two cars but today they alternated David Bernard with James Courtney in car number four. They also alternated Luke Yulden with Russell Ingall. So both their co-drivers, Bernard and Yulden, doing a sensational job here, doing everything asked for them in the super cheap auto Bathurst 1000. This is the battle for fourth position between Owen Kelly in the Orcon car and Stephen Johnson, car 17. We heard from team principal, team owner, as Steve Johnson now climbs down the inside of car number five at Big Pond Corner, the final corner of this 6.2 kilometre track. And Steve Johnson now up into fourth position. Going past him right now is Greg Murphy. Stephen Johnson has also got through. It's spinning up there, Matty. And, uh, car number five, the Orcon Ford Performance Racing entry is on basically the same strategy as Jason Bright. Problem for Owen at the moment is that, unlike Brighty, he's 45 seconds down to the leader. And so even though he does have to make this other stop, when he inserts back into the traffic, he's not ideally positioned and he just lost two spots in the last six kilometres. Probably because it's a bit nervous over the top of the hill with a sprinkle of rain here and there. Adam Macro, you've got everything crossed here and you're doing the rain dance. Yeah, mate, uh, yeah, we, we really need some rain. We've got to stop again um, just for a splash, but uh, we're also going to put a set of tyres on, um, some nice fresh tyres to, for Brody to finish off with. But, uh, you know, team have done a really 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 great strategy today and um, it could have come off but um, unfortunately um, we had a wheel jam in one of the stops so uh, that sort of you know it just messed it up just that little bit and uh, we're going to miss out by about eight laps when he gets back out there what sort of a toys he got to play with he should fan out just off the podium somewhere there somewhere there close yeah hopefully you know we're looking pretty good for top five but uh, mate, bring on the rain because if it rains then we can get our tyres and our fuel and we can stay with our lead we've got. Go get those dancing shoes on. <laughs> Please, look at Brighty's going to come in in the not too distant future about uh, lap 153 or thereabouts. It's a little bit earlier than we were predicting because I've intervened on one of their radio chats and uh, he'll need about 30 litres of fuel. Let's talk about rain quite a bit of it up there at the moment and to get that sort of fuel load on he needs seven seconds stationary to grab the fuel and they're going to you heard uh, Adam say they're going to put tires on it but of course if it rains man does it come alive for these guys because everybody's raining. got to come back in I think it's coming down already it's right in front of us on the windscreen of there you go Brighty's asking what are the chances of rain, but well, he's, he's best positioned to answer it because he's the one that sees what it looks like at the top of the mountain and often when you're driving up there you end up radioing back when you make the run up here to the top to the cutting and you give everybody a real good weather Thanks, update. Very careful across this object. Wow, this changes the game folks, this changes the game. Jason Bright's got 28.8 seconds margin, rain is coming down and if it rains enough They've all got to come back in for wets, and he's the one that all he needs to do is grab a little bit of fuel, chuck tyres on, and bolt back out there. 
They've told him to be super careful up here. It's definitely hitting our lenses. The question is, how much is falling at the top of the mountain? It's knocked a second out of their pace. Bright did a 10-9 that lap. Winterbottom a 10-2, Lowndes a 10-7, Stevie Johnson a 10-3, Greg Murphy a 10-3. The Brollies are out. This is where it hits first, obviously. Bright will get a good view of it and a good understanding. And boy, will this make a big difference. Oh, 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 oh. Bright couldn't pull it up then through the right hander before you get to the dipper and front left just pinched the grips reducing up there he has a 28 second lead over mark winterbottom and more problems for car 67 it, at the cutting that's paul morris in a very dangerous position hard to turn the car around there you'll have to have faith in the marshals race director tim shank and steve priest to his right and there is a safety car They've called it safety car conditions, full course yellow. Now, what do they do? Do they bring him in? He still hasn't made the call. They've asked the question. What's he doing? He's in. Jason Bright in. He's got a... Now, what tyres do you put on it? What a gamble. They've got slicks laid up. I wouldn't put cold slicks on, I'd leave warm tyres on it. They're putting them they're on. Putting, they're putting cold tyres on it. Hey, 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 Did I see that right? Did they put cold tyres on that car on it? Cold, slick tyres on a track that's starting to get wet. Confirm for you now, they were slick tyres, cold slick tyres thrown on, they made a change, they weren't ready, they were starting to get ready for the stop, the boys had jumped out into the lane to get ready and then Jason appeared, so they had to jump around, so it was a little bit of a slower stop, the wets were here on standby, they wheeled these out about 20 laps ago, but they've gone for slicks. So Winterbottom's already gone by, Craig Lowndes has already gone by, and now Jason Bright pops out in third position. But on good condition tyres, it depends which way the track goes here. Stone cold tyres though, others have got residual heat. <laughs> this is what happened to Paul Morris, right at the cutting, from side to side. Such is the slippery condition at the top that it trapped Paul Morris on the run up to the cutting. Couldn't pull it up. Lock the rears and whack into the wall here. Team Siramay cars have had their troubles. That was the celebration in the Fujitsu camp when they knew that they could get their boss in, Jason Bright. Now Panorama never fails to deliver a twist in the tail and the twist has come in the form of a shower. Always seems to, uh, weather always seems to be a factor here at some stage. There is the car that whacked the wall in the cutting, Paul Morris, Stephen Ellery has been able to get back to the pits or will soon under its own steam. Although uh, tearing up the tarmac quite literally at the moment with that uh, shattered front left wheel. This is the sixth safety car period of the race in 146 laps. So uh, the way the race is going will be a whisker under the average number of safety cars for the Bathurst 1000. So one, two, three, four. So at least the first four cars behind the safety car are one, two, three, four in the race. So that's Winterbottom, Craig Lowndes, Stephen Johnson, and Greg Murphy. Actually, uh, revise that. So Mark Winterbottom, Craig Lowndes, Jason Bright, and Stephen Johnson. So four forwards. It's been a horrible day so far for Holden at Mount Panorama. And uh, very unlikely now 
that uh, Holden can get up and win. So we're looking at second victory in a row after a big barren period of nine years for Ford with four Fords, four Falcons there at the front of the field. to go. I reckon Jason Bright's gamble here was to put new tyres on. He probably doesn't quite have the car pace of the lead cars, so he's trying to cover it up with tyre grip. Brand new tyres will be his hope if the track condition can handle it. This is how it stands. Mark Winterbottom is first. Craig Lowndes is second. Jason Bright third. In fourth, Stephen Johnson. Fifth, Greg Murphy. Behind him is James Courtney. Then we've got Russell Ingle, Alex Davison, Glenn Seaton, Paul Dumbrell. That makes up your top ten. And they're all in the game, folks. They're all on the lead lap. They're all nose to tail. The debris flag was being shown there. It's slippery. They're tippy-toeing to the top of the hill. They're on slick tyres. The track's wet and slippery. Brighty's sliding all the way through Reed Park on cold tyres. He's really got his hands full. And Junior's all over the back of him. He's trying to defend his position, Jason Bright, but they know. They know he's on cold tyres. Look at Stephen Johnson. Oh, wheel spin on McPhillamy, and this is a recipe for disaster. Johnson, Murphy, Courtney and Ingle. It's tippy-toe off the top. Winterbottom, Lowndes, Bright, Johnson, Murphy, Courtney, Ingle, Davison, Seaton, Dumbrell, the top ten. Jason Bright couldn't make it out. He's going to be passed here. He's wide. It was a slow exit. Junior's got warmth in the tyres. That's going to help him. Up on the inside, side by side. The Jim Beam car is ideally positioned, but Bright runs with him. He's got track position for the right-hander at the chase. Amazingly gutsy. Johnson goes deep, really deep into the chase. He gets that spot off Jason Bright. Oh, something's oh, gone off and now race leader. Problem. Race leader, Winterbottom off the road, drops a spot. That puts Craig Lowndes in the race lead. They all go firing past Mark Winterbottom. And the Dick Johnson Racing Team were winners out of that as well. Stephen Johnson now comes around and muscles Bright out of the way for second place. Murphy wants a piece of it. Courtney's in the battle as well. What a fascinating finish to this race. 13 laps to go. Our leader, car triple eight, the defending champion, Craig Lowndes. Lowndes has often got super skill in these conditions. We've seen it before. Wets are there if they need them. But Brighty really suffering on those cold tyres. Lowndes, Stephen Johnson, Greg Murphy. Look at this pack. That was the gap as they head up the mountain. Johnson had this car in the wall before the shootout. The DJR crew have pieced it all back together and they've fought their way back into spot and now Winterbottom still sliding around. Contact with James Courtney. He's down in 12th and he's got huge traffic problems to deal with but Scaife was massively quicker than everybody on that lap. And he's in the train. Waited and waited and waited for this race to explode. And now it has. It's all opened up and right into the wall big time. That was a huge impact. He's managed to bounce back, but his day's done. He is out of the picture. So is Russell Ingle. And one of the HRT cars there. Ingle off at McPhillamy. I think that could have been Mark Scaife in two. I'll confirm it for you. It's diabolical up there. You've got to pay marks for having a go, but cold tyres have crueled the day for this bloke and his teammate, Adam Macro. They were so, so close. OK, mate, there's a safety car out. We, we need to get you into pit lane as soon as possible. So close. They came in and took a gamble and it didn't work. It was a big impact. And Scaife is the other car involved. 
but separate incidents. I just saw him shoot off to the left of our screen and went wham into the side of the wall. Watch the leader, huge, huge, huge moment through the chase. 300 kilometres an hour, surfs out the other side, oh. almost rolls the Castrol forward, gathers it up, drops a bunch of spots. The race has gone off. And not for the first time, Craig Lowndes had to take evasive action at the end of the chase. This was his view of it. Look at Winterbottom goes off. By now, he is soaring through the air and somehow staying on the ground at the end of it. He'll come into picture again. Wham! That is out of control. How's your heart rate? A little bit lower, though, I reckon, than Mark Winterbottom's. That was the race lead going down. He caught the edge there. Oh, man, that's scary. That is really scary, and so is this. Second time that Lowndes has been involved in something like that today. This will unfold for car 25 up the top here. You'll see it. Oh, That's they both went hit. in. So That's they have something hit. on the track there. And then Scaife as well. They all go in at exactly the same spot. Sparks fly. See the wheel light up against the concrete. The impact was already taken care of there by uh, the Fujitsu car. Ingle, Scaife and Bright, massive experience and knowledge there and all caught by the conditions. Watch this, you lose it here, slam. Another car's already gone off in front of him into the wall. I should think I reckon that, that might be Winterbottom. Or maybe Owen Kelly in the kitchen. No, he's not. I reckon it was Johnson. Then. I think it was the Jim Beam car. <laughs> so Mark Scaife's day is over. They're going to pit. They're talking about bringing people in. They're talking about going to wet tyres. People are going to run the gamble here. And I think FPR are going to go wet. Russell, have you got much steering there at all? Oh, a hell of a lot. No brakes either. To the garage. No brakes either. So no one's standing in front of it, all right? OK. I intercepted messages that people are laying out for wet tyres at the moment. Cars in between. When you go past next, uh, we will update. Yeah, you've got uh, Stephen John, Stephen and Merv. Here's another angle. That impact. One, two, three. Okay. Four of them find the wall there. Perhaps it was Mark Winterbottom who'd already. Got a touch up along the side as well in front of Jason Bright. Now who's in? Team Kiwi have come in as well. Shane Van Gisbergen at the wheel. Debut at Mount Panorama in a V8 supercar. Okay, there's the wets that I wanted to see. So FPR. They've got wets laid up for car six, Mark Winterbottom, currently showing fifth on the computer. Flashing. And Murphy's going to stay with Slicks. So they're all playing meteorologist at the moment. And the wind's picked up, looking at the flags on pit straight. Wipers ablaze at the top of the hill, gusty, blustery down here from the west. What's the western horizon look like? Grand Actually, that's wet. Ten back in nineteenth. That is wet. Slick tyres on that stuff up there. Not nice on this racetrack. So that's how it stands. Craig Lowndes first in line behind the WPS safety car. Stephen Johnson second in they, line. They got a problem. They, they got damage. He did hit the wall. He did hit the wall, yeah. So uh, that may stop them for longer, depending on what damage has been done. If it's just a rim, they're OK. And they've got wet tyres laid up. It is lap 150. I think they've actually just rolled slicks out into the lane. So they're gambling. Wow. There'll be a burst of activity here. Can you believe it? All the work done by both these drivers today. 
on target for victory. And it all goes wrong at the end of the day with yet another weather shift at Mount Panorama. Winterbottom put that car on pole. Richards did a brilliant job at the start. They both performed so well. But time and time again, this race, the intensity of this race continues to lift. So car six peels off. He'll have to dive it into the pits. Steering's not great. How much does this cost? 12 laps to go. Someone will take the punt on wits, you'd think. Because it could pay huge dividends. If you're down the order, you'd almost flip the coin. Hard if you're up in the front of the queue. Too much to lose. Either. Yep, go good. Is that a cold tie? Good. That's the pit crew we can hear. We've got it mic'd up. Well, if that's a cold tie, then that's going to be a real handful too. It is indeed a cold tie, Neil. I guess they have no choice in the damage, but uh, that's going to make that real hard yards. Be inclined to have rotated them and put a cold one on the back, diagonaled them. That sinking feeling for Mark Winterbottom at the moment. Now Jason Bright, like you said, full marks for having a crack. It was an almighty effort. And it all came unstuck at the top of the mountain. Cruel, cruel twist of fate there for at least five cars. Five drivers, in fact, ten drivers in those cars, slaving away for over six hours. Then it comes down to a weather shift. Let's take stock of the five cars that were most affected, uh, negatively affected by what we saw just two minutes ago when that shower took hold and the restart under safety car conditions. So the big losers were Brightex, Jason Bright and Fujitsu Car, Holden Racing Team's Mark Scape. Those two cars ended up right, 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 in right, right. the sand one, two, two, at the top two, two, two. of the mountain one, at McPhillamy Park. Five. Also involved in that incident one, two, was one, two, Stone one, two. Brothers Racing, Russell one, two, three, Eagle, five. car number nine in the Caltex yeah, car one, two, that he shares with Hello, Luke one, two, Gilder. Three, four, five. But at least one, that two, car one, two. back in the pits for them to make some repairs. Yeah, uh, they are a chance of getting back into the race and scoring a point or two. Team Kiwi, Shane Van Gisbergen, car 021, as we have a look now at the tractor. Doing its best to clear that log jam at the top of the mountain in the narrow gap between the wall there to get rid of uh, car 25, Jason Bright, and Adam Macro's Ford, and the HR number two, HRT number two, Holden Racing Team number two, Todd Kelly, and Mark Scaife. Of course, the fifth car, massively affected the car that's led the majority of laps today number six mark winterbottom behind the wheel of the car he's sharing with stephen richards for ford performance racing must have led uh, over half race distance there's jill johnson wife of team owner dick johnson so she's seen her share of dramas over 30 years or more of watching her husband race at the at the great race and uh, also her son now, the son, Stephen Johnson, in uh, second position on the track there. So there's our new race leader, Craig Lowndes, behind the safety car. We're back underway uh, within a lap or two. So the order behind the safety car, race leader there, car triple eight, Craig Lowndes. Then it's Stephen Johnson, number 17, as we go to the chopper shot of the cars going down Conrod Strait doubt that there will be a restart this time around. So at least one more lap. We are now on lap 
152. Craig Lowndes is our race leader. Stephen Johnson second. That's Greg Murphy in third. James Courtney, Alan Simonson, Alex Davison, Glenn Seaton, Jason Barguana, Steve Owen, and Paul Dumbrell are the top 10. I had a glimpse at the Western Horizon and car number 26 in strife, Alan Gurr at the wheel here on the start finish straight. And it doesn't look too bad, but it's still gonna be slippery out there. And the tires have cooled out yet again. Remember, everybody's in the game again. Barguana in car eight. Reporting rain at Reed Park, just where they're approaching now. So this first lap, outside of safety car conditions, will be a very tentative one. In their minds, possibly in their cars. <laughs> you watch them go if the track just dries up enough and it'll grip up like you can't believe and they'll punch numbers at the end on the 152nd lap of 161. But it still looks pretty slippery right there, doesn't it? It's very slow. Can't begin to tell you how awkward it is on a slick tyre on a wet or semi-wet surface. And you squeeze the throttle down tiny increments and it just lights up with engine power and torque and wheel spin. And you drive right off the end of your fingertips as delicately as you dare, but you race other people at the same time. Radio reports are for more rain. Greg Murphy, the lone Holden, in the top six. He's in the game here too, he's right there. Has a change of rhythm for what we used to earlier in the day. Watch Murphy. Johnson does so. Good touch. Will burst the wheel spin just as it brings on the 600 netties. That lap took two minutes and 28 seconds to complete. James Courtney, he wants a look as well. Murphy's on the outside of that, a little bit of contact between car four and 51. So here they come, Lance, up towards turn two. Bill Johnson's seen this too many times, it's nerve-wracking. She's watching her son try and hold onto a podium position, if not, try and claim this race. The Peter Brock Trophy up for grabs. Lowndes leads him up through the cutting. Johnson Murphy, caught. Simonson in the driver's seat. The other DJR car has Alex Davison in control. Who's done the fastest split in the first sector of the top six cars. In fact, Glenn Seaton, faster than all of them, down in eighth. Remember those images back in 87? Seto on slicks and the Nissan out of control and scary. 20 years ago and he hasn't lost a thing. This is a very slow train. And it's led by Lowndes. What about the performance seventh of Steve Owen? The Autobahn racer, you see him there hovering over the back of Davison. This is torture, isn't it? They want to cut loose. The engineers commanding drivers to alter brake bias to change to the conditions. Look at this. Here comes Stephen in 17. Opened the batting beautifully on Thursday with the fastest time around here. Set the marker and set the tone for the weekend to slip up when they had the crunch mid-weekend. But I tell you, he's got some pace at the moment. He's sweating on Lowndes. He's not afraid to go deep on Lowndes either. He's on Lowndes' right. The final turn. Someone's whacking into Glenn Seaton. And uh, Junior's got to run, he'll get up the inside. This will be a pass for the lead. A 
long pit straight we go. A big lock up for Craig Lowndes. That will put Stephen Johnson in the race lead. Jill can't watch, but the rest of them have gone berserk. But it's now Lowndes comes back up and fights it again. Side by side up Mountain Straight. This is so gutsy. James Courtney has gone into third. So he's got past Murphy. What happened to Greg? Eight laps left. Courtney's coming. He's in this too. What a nail biter. Hard to know where to look next. There's Simonson, there's Davison. Johnson leads the race. Looking down the top 10, Greg Ritter. 10th at the moment and the fastest of everybody out there by quite a margin. But can he climb through them? That's the margin, first to second at the top of the hill. Stephen Johnson, Craig Lowndes, James Courtney, Greg Murphy. Forward, forward, forward. This is the moment on replay at turn one. Uh, Murph ended up wide. Got up on the ripple strip then after he was side by side with Courtney who elbowed him up a bit high and he lost position as a result of getting on the paint. You have to go back to 1994. There's a scary moment. moment. 94 was the last time we had a Johnson win this event. That's right at the gear change point there for Stephen at Arc Up. When he put it in the next gear, he comes Craig. No room there. Safety first. Into the chase, but there's nothing, nothing in it. Can Johnson hold on to this here? He slides it out a bit wide. They are nose to tail. What a contest. James Courtney is sitting patiently. He's got speed as well, and he wants a crack. This will make it seven laps to go. Softening off the anti-roll bar controls. Lowndes looks up the inside. It's getting wetter and wetter, oh. Neil, and Lowndes goes past. And there will be contact. Stephen runs wide. He couldn't pull it up. Natalie watching. Craig to the lead. But Here comes James Courtney. Watch out for James Courtney. He got the cleanest run through turn one. He got the maximum speed up the mountain straight. But Lowndes pulls away. What a race. This is amazing. Johnson goes from first to third. Courtney moves up into second and Lowndes gets the race lead back. They can't find Dick Johnson at the moment. He's not in the pit. I don't think he can cope. It's been a very, very tough year. A couple of years, really, for Dick Johnson racing. They need success. And Stephen is doing an awesome job at the moment trying to deliver it. All it took was a little moment coming out of Forest Elbow for Craig Lowndes to know that he could have a crack further down the track at Stephen Johnson. He took the opportunity. But this man's the danger man, I reckon, car number four. It's a Stone Brothers engine in the lead car. Oh, Lowndes up on the curve. Stone Brothers car second. The car third has got the running gear in it from Triple Eight, the team that lead the race. A bit of cross-pollination with all these teams. Greg Murphy, the leading Holden. He's in fourth. Stegbar Mountain Camp. It'll be a slow ride across the top of the hill this time. Forest Elbow. Now they apply the power down. And look at the slide. The rear starts to go away from James Courtney. He pulls it back. It's starting to go too for Stephen Johnson. He pulls it back. Straight line speed belongs to Craig Lowndes on this occasion. Steve Owens moved up a spot. He's now sixth, passing Alex Davison. Oh, someone's right on the edge of the road there, tippy-toeing. I reckon that was Bargwana in the WOW entry in eighth. Yes, and in a bit of strife. Greg Ritter takes that position off him. Alex Davison, the other DJR car. This will ah. make it six laps to go. Greg Ritter, the reason for the pace for Ritter is he's on wets. 
He's on Wentz. He can charge through these blokes at the moment. He's doing it. You'll see him come into shot. Lowndes, Courtney, Johnson, Murphy, Simonson, Owen. There he is, Greg Ritter on Wentz. I figured that somebody had to take a punt, nothing to lose. What sort of lap time's he done? He did a two minute 29 and he was a second faster than Craig Lowndes. He's got a lot of experience here, Ritter. This is his ninth start. And he's been as high as fourth. This will show us how Craig Lowndes got that lead back of Stephen Johnson. You want to know how wet it is? Look, they're both absolutely at the limit of their braking and that adhesion at the end there. Little bump and grind slide up onto the curb. Craig glimpses the mirrors to see what's going on left, right, where are they? Eyes like dishpans. Adrian Burgess, team manager. Will Davison having heart failure there at the moment. He's not the only one, Cromley. This is an extraordinary motor race. Who are you betting on at home? Are you willing to take a gamble? So you keep asking me to tip. How can you tip this? It is unbelievable. It is so close. The level of skill being exhibited here is extraordinary. James Courtney has fishtailed it through this section of the mountain twice around. He was third here last oh. year with Glenn Seaton. A big slide for Lowndes at the exit of Forest Elbow. Jamie Winkup, I don't reckon he can watch. <laughs> Have a good lie down, Jamie. Ritter still the quickest to the second sector, but only just. The Wets are not giving that much advantage. Five laps to go at the end of this one. An incredible test of skill. Changing conditions. Strategies all over the place. Restarts everywhere. Intensity off the scale. Got a two-time champion leading the race from a hungry pack. The youngster in James Courtney. 2.25-2 for Lowndes, 25-2 for Courtney, 25-3 for Johnson, 25-6 Murphy, 5-7 Simonson, and a 24-8 for Greg Ritter, who's now sixth. Getting word that the radar is showing us. The rain is clearing, so maybe Greg Ritter's gamble won't go any further, but he's certainly in the picture. They all are. There's Murphy, there's Simonson, there's Greg Ritter, car 34. Steve Owen, Alex Davison, car eight, Jason Barguana, right behind him is Glenn Seaton. Make the point that Mark Winterbottom is 12th at the moment because our focus was with them for a large portion of the day. Let's not forget the great performance, but how heartbreaking to be out of this key battle. There's a dry line appearing up the top of the mountain. And I reckon the fans up there hold their breath every time they go past. Because absolutely anything could happen. Four and a half laps to ja go. James was in trouble then. He was having having trouble turning the thing over the top of the hill. Lounge skating as well. Concrete on either side. Elevation drop is a killer. Trying to control this car, these cars, takes everything you've got. You're doing a great job, Craig. Great job. Watch out for those painted lines, mate. Mark Dutton on the radio. Engineered for the Triple Eight car. Same message being given to Alan Simonson, fifth at the moment. He's got Greg Ritter coming. There's Greg Murphy, a four time winner. He's keeping himself in the hunt. Nothing outlandish. There's only four laps to go. A little bit of push and shove between Barguana and Alex Davison. Position eight and nine. 21-1 for Lowndes, a 21-8 for Courtney, 21-9 for Johnson, 22 even Murphy, 21-6 Simonson, and a 22-4 for Ritter. It's the first time the tables have gone the other way. So 
so the go. wets are beginning to hurt. The track is certainly drying out. The battle scars are all over these cars. The wets in these conditions begin to reel. The tread face starts to walk around. The tyre flops from side to side. It's a bit of an uncomfortable feeling. Now they're starting to stretch out a bit. with a margin of 1.1 seconds last time through. Just easing the pressure a little. But no time to relax. Our last back-to-back -back winners, Greg Murphy and Rick Kelly in 03-04. Lowndes and Wind Cup, of course. Uh oh Lowndes was right up on the curb then and slid all the way to the exit of the McMillamy Park ripple strip. Ross and Jim Stone watch their young charge. James Courtney, keep control. Can you imagine being in the cockpit, wanting to let loose? Knowing that you have to hold back in these conditions and knowing that every second goes by, time is ticking away. At the end of this, there'll be three laps left. Dick Johnson has seen everything on this mountain and then a bit more today. Here he goes. Our race leader, Craig Lowndes. The gap last time around was 1.1 second. What will it be this time? Not too much different, you'd have to think. 1.3. Three laps remaining. Three laps remaining. It has all come down to control. Wipers are back on furiously. And we've got a car in the wall. Shame and that is in a very bad situation because that's right at the end of the last turn. Will they deploy safety car? Shane Van Gisbergen rotates it here. He went off there earlier in the weekend as well. 20th position when he went off the road. What does the race director do? Well, they're certainly not howling down there. I reckon he'll leave it there. Tim doesn't, Tim Schenken doesn't like to deploy the safety car late in the race. The cars are not at full tilt in any case. And we heard a report that there may be some kind of a fuel issue for Courtney. When did he last stop? It was lap 131. should make 30 laps in these conditions without any drama unless they've got something else going on. Who was that? Could have been Lowndes. He went through first. Murphy's tagging up to the back of Stephen Johnson. One, two, three and four. Look at the gap between third and fourth. That's the difference coming past us now. Possible podium position. They're being warned about car 021. Off the track. Be careful. Still big time speed through the chase. Still a bit of rain on the screen here. That might be good news for Ritter. Still sixth. But still level pegging with those on slicks. Maybe a tenth or two slower. Just. You'll see the black Team Kiwi racer parked to their right. They'll be focused only on the road ahead. And for Courtney, for Johnson, for Murphy, for Simonson and Ritter, they're focused on those in front of them. Johnson gets right up now behind Courtney. Murphy goes with him. Two full laps remaining. Every amazing bump. 
every curb. We fritted our teeth through the chase. We banked off the walls, up the cutting. I'm flying across the top of the mountain. And it's all come down to this. Clearly, Greg Murphy has something in the tank left to have a shot at Stephen Johnson. He keeps crawling up the back of car 17 probably. Well, it's a seesaw, you know. Oh! Who was that? Was that Courtney? That was has Courtney. a big tank slapper in front of me. That was Courtney, and you watch Johnson pounce on that. It's just enough to bring him back. That gap was starting to pull away and pull away. The dry line right on the right-hand side of that circuit through the dipper. The problem at the moment, Matty, is that if you do have a crack at someone, you're going to have to come out of that groove on the track that's beginning to appear. So when you do that, there'll be no grip at all. And Stephen has to run defensive into Forrest's elbow. Big, big spin from Greg Murphy. Big, big wheel spin. It's all or nothing now. You'd be prepared to risk it and bin it if you had to. Just gas it up and see what you get. Third, fourth. Murph won't mind. If it can bolt him up the order, he'll take the punt. The front of this train, we've got a two-time winner. From the back of it there in fourth position, we've got a four-time winner. In between, two young guys who really want to get that tough spot on the podium. They're fourth and fourth the whole way. This will be the final lap. Last lap, James. Last lap, mate. One lap to go in the Super Jeep Auto Bathurst 1000. Can you believe what has transpired? Nice and smooth, buddy. Especially in the last 30 minutes. Turn two, Courtney, second. We're looking out of James's car onto Stephen Johnson. Ford have one, two, and three. Ritter. And Greg Murphy break that chain. Ritter actually lost the spot. Owens climbed up over him, but look at this. The lights are ablaze for Greg Murphy. He's all over the back of Stephen Johnson at the top of the hill. Two thirds of a lap to run for these guys. Lowndes has kicked clear, then James Courtney, then Stephen Johnson, and Greg Murphy trying to hold up the whole flag. When they came here 12 months ago, Craig Lowndes had tears in his eyes. A lot of emotion in this car and around this track. They return in 2007 with a brand new Team Vodafone Falcon. Their strategy has oh, paid dividends. He goes a oh, little wide and for a elbow. That was a massive understeer moment for Lowndes, followed by the corresponding slide in the rear as he gathered it back up. They're just Mark Dutton really trying to calm things down, saying, come on, mate, here's your margin. No need to push it. A few corners to run now for Craig Lowndes. It looks like he might be able to do it again. What a finish. Through the chase he goes. Courtney still holding on to second. Johnson still holding on to third. They won it at Sandown. And in 2007, Craig Lowndes and Jamie Winkup. They have done the double. Second, Johnson third, Greg Murphy in fourth. Unbelievable. Fantastic driving from all four of these men. In incredibly difficult conditions. Jamie Wincup. Jamie Wincup. Here he is, Jamie. That is unbelievable. Congratulations. Thanks, mate. Um, Craig brought it home nicely. It's, it's amazing. Unbelievable. When you came in and that, uh, that pit stop was crucial and you dumped it into the sand there, I know you were sitting there thinking, I've cost him. I've cost him. You got the safety car and your name goes back in the history books today. Yeah, it is, it's amazing. Uh, this one's probably a little more special because I, I know how big it is, you know. And 
We did a back to back. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Mate, you go in the record books not only because it was back to back Bathurst and not many people get to do it, but you've also done the Sandown Bathurst double in the same year. Yeah, mate, everyone said we, we couldn't do it, but uh, it's only probability, isn't it? So we, uh, great car, great team. Well, I just got to go celebrate with them. <laughs> go, Jamie. Jamie Winkup, now a two time Bathurst champion. Craig Lowndes, now a three time weekend, doesn't it? Yeah. victor at Mount Panorama. <laughs> team boss. Roland Dane just there in picture before. Lounds still composed. He's brought it home strong. Will Davison, what a belter of a race you're on the podium. You had a sniff there, but still smiles all round. Mate, I'm 25 and I seriously uh, I don't think I've come so close to cardiac arrest <laughs> in my whole life. That was a unbelievable race. You know, we, we were in there all day, in with a shout, and uh, for it to finish in that manner, those last 12 laps, oh man, that was crazy. But listen, a podium for Jim Beam Racing, for Dick Johnson Racing, is a fantastic result. We haven't been up there for a while, and uh, just a true kick for all the boys. And uh, geez, I thought we were even going to get across the line for a win there before. But um, listen, this is a big pont uh, confidence boost. Um, the team really deserve it. I'm really proud of them. We've been working hard this year, and. Uh, this is, uh, this is pretty exciting for the guys. A few quite JBs tonight, I'm sure. Well, I'd be rude not to, wouldn't it? Hey? <laughs> well done. Yes, thank you. Thanks. Roland, Roland Dane, that is sensational. Roland. Trifactor. Roland, congratulations. Thank you. Thanks very much. A brilliant day. Yeah. A stressful day. Yeah, very stressful, very dramatic. Very uh, tough last few laps, but boys did a great job. Run us through your thoughts when you came in for that final stop and Jamie was in the sand. Yeah, these things happen, but luckily we got away with it. Well done. Thank you. Unbelievable. They stand tall once again. Lounds and Wing Cup. And Team Vodafone. And not only that, Jamie Wing Cup also has the championship lead. Craig Lounds has now moved into second. Rick Kelly and Garth Tander have dropped to third and fourth. Here's your results from the Super Cheap Auto Bathurst 1000. The podium of Lowndes, Wing Cup, Courtney and Bernard, Johnson and Davison. Greg Murphy, the leading Holden. A good performance from the other 888 car of Lyons and Simonson. A fantastic top 10 effort from Steve Owen as well. The points finish at 15th, and that's where we find Grant Denyer and Michael Caruso. Congratulations. And there's a whole host, as you'd expect of DNFs all the way down to Cameron McConville and David Reynolds who had their engine failure right before the race start. Over the years, Mount Panorama has produced a mountain of memories. The 45th anniversary of the Super Cheap Auto Bathurst 1000 has produced a beauty this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, to make the presentation to our three place getters, would you please welcome the Chief Operating Officer for Super Chief Auto, David Ajala. The Super Chief Auto, Bathurst 1000, in third place for Jim Beam Racing. Would you please congratulate Stephen Johnson and Will Davison. Steve, congratulations. We know it's been a long, hard year, but all of a sudden it seems a lot better. Yeah, it was, Mark. Uh, you know, huge day. Massive day for DJR, for Jim Beam. You know, my partner in crime here, Will, he just drove awesome all weekend. And, uh, you know, all forward podium, go forward. <laughs> now, Steve, I've got to ask you, just towards the end of the race, we just lost your dad there in the last few laps. He ducked off to a quiet corner somewhere. Dick is okay, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, the old man's all right. He, uh, he came and tapped me on the shoulder just before, but, uh, you know, that was a mad end to, uh, to a mad race. And, uh, you know, all credit to Triple Eight. You know, they drove, uh, they had an awesome car. Uh, same with, uh, you know, James. They had an awesome car as well, but, um, you know, what an end, what an end to an awesome race. Can't, what, don't know what to say. Will Davis, and you, you had to watch the final stages from the pits. 
How was your heart rate during those final few laps? Oh, mate, that was, uh, that was incredible. I'm glad I was sitting in the garage for that last din. I'm proud of Stevie. He did an unbelievable job in some tricky conditions. I thought we were going to get the 17 over the line there. Um, but listen, this is the first time for uh, DJR to be on the podium in a long time. Steve's first podium at Bathurst. Just proud of our guys at DJR, Jim Beam and the Fords. Yee-hoo! Well, you had your ups and downs over the course of the weekend, but it just, it just seemed to come right at the right times. Yeah, well, that's right. I mean, we were in the hunt all day, and uh, who could have thought what was going to happen with 12 laps to go there? That was uh, some unbelievable racing. You all got your money's worth today, and we could have been first, could have been in the wall, but uh, three Fords on the podium. DJR, Jim Beam, we're back. Steve Johnson, Will Davison, congratulations, third spot. Ladies and gentlemen, in second spot for Geldwen Motorsport, James Courtney and David Bernard. <laughs> James, congratulations. That is a fantastic result for Stone Brothers. Well done. Yeah, it's a, great, it's a great job by the boys. They've worked really hard all week and we've been saying we had a good race car and it just, it just shows that. The guys put in crazy hours. So thanks, boys. Thanks, Geldwin. Thanks, Ford. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Dave. James, you, you knew you were around about the pace, but, but that is a fantastic result. Congratulations again. Thanks. It's, um, I was a bit happy when it started to spit. It was, uh, it was like a blessing to us. So uh, we really come through good there. And Dave did a great job again. Dave Bernard, congratulations. You two share a tremendous history together from your go-karting days, and now you share something else very special. Well done. Yeah, thanks. I've always wanted to stand up here, but to, to stand up here with James is awesome. And I've got to thank Stone Brothers and all the boys down there for having faith in me and... Having faith and um, letting me drive my car, but I've got to thank this bloke. He got us on the podium today, and I've been wanting to do it for a long time. Thanks, buddy. Uh, David, just finally, you mentored him when he was starting out in go-karts. Did you ever think that you would stand on the Bathurst podium with him? I would, I would never have dreamt of it, but here we are. Well done. Congratulations, guys. Well done. And James can dance, too. Ladies and gentlemen, the super cheap auto. Bathurst 1000 champions, back to back, for Team Vodafone, Craig Lowndes and Jamie Wincup. Congratulations, a huge weekend for you. You took the gamble coming into this weekend, you went with the new car and it all paid off. Well it did, the car ran great last week when we uh, debuted at, uh, at Willow Bank, but uh, look, thank you very much guys, it was a great day to all the Ford fans, to Tom Gorman and everyone back at Broad Meadows. thank you very much. Jamie, as I said last year, was a whiz kid and I think he's done it again. We didn't have the fastest car, but uh, we had a great team down here with Triple Eight and Team Vodafone, thank you guys. To little Patrick, happy birthday, and to Levi and Chili at home. Hello. Jamie, congratulations. Back to back. I know that's got to feel pretty special to you. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Thank you to uh, everyone at Team Vodafone and at Ford. Unbelievable to, to do sand out and now Bathurst is uh, it's pretty special. I, this one's a little more special for me because I know exactly what it means. Now, Jamie, I do have some more good news for you. You are now the V8 Supercar Championship leader at this point. Congratulations. It doesn't get any better, does it? Just to all the Ford fans out there, thank you very much. Lounsey, just, Lounsey, just one quick one before you do climb on the top. I, just, I know that this trophy is just so special to you and, and today is going to be a very special time for you to remember. Well, it will be. It's uh, last year I stood up here and cried because we all were here for uh, respect to Peter Brock and uh, it's no different this year, really. He's a, he's a master of the mountain and uh, look, look, now uh, 
conquered what I've wanted to conquer and as I said, it's uh, the guys down here that did a fantastic job. So everyone out there, doesn't matter whether you're forward or holding, you know, this is Brocky's Mountain and uh, we've done it again. Gentlemen, take your position. Craig Lowndes, Jamie Wing Cup, Team Vodafone, Super Team Auto, Bathurst 1000 Champions 2007. Some different feelings this time around for both Craig Lowndes and Jamie Wincup. When you're standing up there, you know that you're in very good company in the history books of Australian motorsport. Terrific effort from James Courtney and David Bernard. James goes one better than his third place last year. And a stellar performance too from Stephen Johnson and Will Davison. Stephen goes one better than he's ever gone. He's been fourth here, can you believe it, three times. But now, he knows what it's like to stand up there. And you have to go back to 1988 to remember the last Ford clean sweep at the mountain. That year, a bloke by the name of Dick Johnson had pole, and Tony Longhurst and Thomas Mazira won it in a Ford Sierra. And this time around, in 2007, it's a blue wash at Bathurst. And quite interesting to see just how different the emotions are for these two guys. Lowndes was all pent up last year with very good reason. Jamie Winkup showing much more emotion now because he knows what it means. And I'll tell you what it means to these guys, everything. <laughs>